Okay, at this time, sergeants, can we please start the recordings? Computer recording started. Cloud recording up. Sergeant Martinez, you're opening. Good morning, rather good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Health, jointly with the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruptions, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following address. Testimony at council dot nyc dot gov once again that is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov thank you for your cooperation we are ready to begin thank you so much sergeant and welcome good afternoon everybody i'm mark levine chair of the city council's health committee i am so excited to be co-chairing today's hearing with the brand new chair of the Committee on Mental Health, which is Council Member Farrah Lewis, uh, who's gonna be an outstanding leader for this committee and really excited to be working with her today. We're gonna be hearing uh, shortly from the leadership of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as the leadership of the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And I'm actually gonna offer brief opening remarks uh, specifically related to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in a moment. Uh, so first, uh, I'll address our hearing on the budget for the city's Office of Health and Mental Hygiene, which has a $1.68 billion fiscal 2022 proposed operating budget. Uh, specifically, I'll be focusing on the approximately $953 million in that agency's the budget, a budget allocated for public health. And we'll also be addressing health-related performance indicators from the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report and the department's fiscal 2022 preliminary capital commitment plan, which includes 1.1 billion in fiscal 2021 through 2025 for the department. I first wanna just briefly offer my thanks to the staff and leadership of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for what they have done over the past year. I've had the opportunity to work very closely with many, many, many people in the city's health department. And I am just absolutely inspired by the intensity, by the focus that uh, these staff members and leaders have brought to this task over the past year working what I know to be in some cases, 100 hour weeks, and just being absolutely committed to putting public health science first and foremost. And I'm really grateful for that effort. And I continue to believe that we have the best big city health department in the world. And that, that has, that's something that we should all be grateful for uh, after this difficult pandemic year. Today, we're talking about the budget for the department in the coming fiscal year, which begins in July. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is probably going to be one of the highest stakes year for public health in New York City ever. As we, we have a multi-front task at hand here, we have to continue to push forward on beating back the pandemic. We're making great progress on that, and we're gonna feel that progress even more as we enter the next fiscal year in July, but the fight against the pandemic will not be over by July 1st. And it won't be over uh, in all likelihood at any point in the coming fiscal year. Now we're gonna make progress. We're gonna push it back to a point that it doesn't dominate our life as it has over the past year. But there's no doubt that the agency is going to need the resources to continue to win this battle against this pandemic. We're gonna to have to deal with the significant trauma that COVID has left in its wake. Both people who are uh, dealing with long-term physical health implications, 
uh, which we know are all too real, but also the social, emotional, and mental health trauma that this pandemic leaves in its wake. And I know that Chair Lewis will be addressing that. We're gonna have to directly confront the profound inequality that this past year has both revealed and exacerbated racial inequality in particular. We're gonna have to invest in unprecedented ways in closing the racial equity gap in health in this city. And that's going to require resources, which we're gonna to want to see in this budget. We're gonna to have to revitalize primary care after a year in which many New Yorkers were blocked from primary care at difficult points, particularly in the spring, and many New Yorkers have not yet returned to accessing primary care for a variety of reasons. And particularly, we're gonna to need to focus on marginalized population, care for people, for example, who are struggling with addiction, people who are struggling uh, with conditions like HIV or viral hepatitis, because there has been tremendous disruption to their care over the past year. And we are behind now on making up that lost ground. And we have lost ground in those fights, uh, which is particularly frustrating after the progress that we've been seeing over recent years, pre-pandemic. And finally, we're gonna have to prepare for what we should assume may be the next pandemic. It would be extremely naive to think that we won't confront this kind of disaster again. And so this fiscal year is gonna require us beginning to prepare for that, to try and prevent it and be ready if and when it happens. And I do think that all of that is online in the next budget of FY 2022. Uh, this pandemic has made it glaringly obvious that there are racial disparity and inequality that are systemic in healthcare in this city. And New York City needs to take a stand now to ensure that we do have greater equity and that DOHMH needs to work directly with providers in this community, community members who are trusted, that can help build up the infrastructure to ensure that the resources are present to care for the communities that have been most impacted by this pandemic. We can't ignore the facts which have been laid bare. Black and brown New Yorkers deserve equitable care. They deserve to be listened to by medical providers and all professionals in the healthcare system. We, it should be extremely rare that someone would die in childbirth in New York City, but it is particularly egregious that black people still die at least at eight times the rate of white people in childbirth in New York City. And this should be the year that we put an end to that inequality. Inequality also is persistent in rates of asthma and diabetes, HIV, early cancer detection and treatment and other health outcomes. COVID health outcomes as well, unfortunately respect, uh, reflect these disparities. Uh, black Latinx and lower income and older New Yorkers are all disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 hospitalization and death. And those living within these communities have known for quite some time that systemic racism, social determinants of health and lack of access to culturally appropriate healthcare have caused persistent disparities for generations. And COVID-19 has simply been the latest painful example of this. So today we ask, how are we going to build a more equitable future for New Yorkers, particularly those who are low income and people of color? How are we going to use our resources to truly meet people where they are and close the health equity gap? New York City is fortunate that we have allies now in the White House, in Congress, but it will still be an uphill battle to restore to pre-pandemic levels economically. The new relief bill that was passed on March 10th by Congress gives hope to New York as, as well as to the health department directly. We're hopeful that the stimulus will, pre will prevent New York State from going through with painful, shameful, unfair cuts to healthcare. And uh, we will be fighting for a just budget between now and April 1st in Albany. Uh, we will not let them resent, continue to hold back 20% uh, from healthcare providers and other so social service providers. Um, and we're gonna fight against the Medicaid pharmacy carve out that would have a disproportionate impact on FQHCs that provide HIV AIDS services 
sexual and reproductive health services, among other important services. Um, and we're gonna make sure that we have uh, reimbursement to fund uh, those critical frontline providers. Um, we also are going to work against proposed 20% cut in the nurse family partnership, which would reduce the number of families that can be served by this critical program. So this is a lot to do and a lot for us to focus on in this hearing, um, but I'm looking very much forward to hearing testimony from our partners in the administration uh, in the best interest of our city. I wanna thank the staff of this committee, including policy analyst, Ann Balkin, committee councils, Harbani Ahuja and Sara Liss, and a particular thank you to our finance analyst, Lauren Hunt, who has worked extremely hard to prepare for today's hearing. And now I would like to pass it over to my partner and colleague in today's hearing, Chair Farrah Lewis. Thank you so much, Chair Levine, and I'm happy to be joining you today to have this conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Farrah Lewis, Chair of City Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. Happy to be with you all today. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's 1.6 billion fiscal 2022 operating budget, specifically the uh, approximately the 593 million allocated for mental health. Of this, 94 million is budgeted for Thrive NYC in fiscal 2022. We will also address the department's fiscal 2022 primary capital commitment plan, which includes 1.1 billion in fiscal 2021 to 2025 for the department. Nothing could have prepared New Yorkers for the devastation we've all experienced over the last 12 months. We were faced with isolation, unexpected loss, fear for our lives, for our families and finances. The lasting traumas of the pandemic are just beginning to show now. More and more New Yorkers have reported symptoms of depression, anxiety, substance use, and disorders than ever before. As we begin to reopen, the direct impacts will become crystal clear. We are standing at the principle of major, major mental health crisis in New York City. Our healthcare workers witnessed an insurmountable amount of death and need support to process what they experience. Our students were faced with isolation and loneliness without the social aspects of school. Our students with disabilities struggled to be provided basic services. Our seniors went weeks and months without seeing another person and many faced cognitive decline related to isolation and disruption of care. So how do we move forward and how do we begin to heal? We need to ensure that every New Yorker has access to culturally competent, affordable, and comprehensive behavioral health services. We need to ensure that our communities that were the hardest hit by COVID-19, Black and Brown communities specifically, have services in their communities, and that these are services that we can trust. When a person reaches out for help, we need a system and a protocol that can ensure that they receive the services requested and not just a basic referral. We need metrics of, of success that provide and prove that the funding is being utilized to its fullest capacity. What we can't have is for the trauma experience to fester and to lead to an escalation of problems in the future. The isolation and the fear that was experienced had a direct impact on men the mental health of all New Yorkers, and we need to make sure we're monitoring those consequences. How are we addressing the continuation of the opioid epidemic? This question often comes up. How can we reach people in their homes and keep them safe? The next steps are vitally important. New York State is threatening to cut programs for people with disabilities by 20%. People with disabilities are always underserved. Cutting the funding to the few existing programs that serve individuals with disabilities will cause undue harm to our most vulnerable. Hopefully with the relief bill passed on March 10th, these cuts will not go into effect. 
but I hope that we will fight for reimbursement for these groups and for what they've already lost. I'm looking forward to hearing about what DOHMH has planned to address these particular and important issues. And I thank you all for all the work you've done over time. I would like to thank the committee staff for your support during this hearing and preparing. Policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, committee counsel, Sarah Liz, and financial analyst, Lauren Hunt. I now turn to committee counsel, Sarah Liz, to go over some procedural matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, chairs. And I will actually briefly turn back to Chair Levine to acknowledge the council members that are present here today. Thank you so much for that. We are joined by council members Levin, Cabrera, Holden, Perkins, Riley, Ayala, Powers, Van Bramer, and Amprey Samuel. And I don't know if there's been any arrivals in the last minute or two that I missed. Uh, if so, we'll come back to you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Chair Levine and Chair Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sara Liss, and I am the counsel to the committees on health and mental health disabilities and addiction for the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanna briefly go over a few procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. You will then receive a prompt from the host to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called. And for everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. The structure of today's hearing will be a little different than usual hearings. The first panel will be the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, followed by council member questions, followed by a five minute break, and we will then continue with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, then council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will now begin with our first administration panel, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. This panel will include the following, and please bear with me because this list is long. Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of Health. Dr. Torian Easterling, First Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer. Sammy Jura, Deputy Commissioner for Finance. Dr. Myla Harrison, Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner, Mental Health. Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner, Environmental Health. Dr. Daniel Stevens, Deputy Commissioner, Family and Child Health. Beth Malden, Deputy Commissioner, Emergency Preparedness and Response. Julie Friesen, Deputy Commissioner, Administration. Maura Canelli, Deputy Commissioner, External Affairs. Emiko Okubo, Chief Operating Chief. Officer, Executive Deputy Commissioner. Darren Taylor, Acting Deputy Commissioner, Disease Control. Dr. Charon Gwynn, Deputy Commissioner, Epidemiology. Dr. Michelle Morse, Deputy Commissioner, Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness, Chief Medical Officer. Scott Liu, Acting Deputy Commissioner, Chief Information Officer. Lisa Landau, General Counsel, and Nellie Afshar, Chief of Staff. I will now read the oath, and after I will call on each of those panelists that I just listed from the administration to respond. So please listen for your name and the host will unmute you at that time. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Choksi. Yes, I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Easterling. Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Jura. Yes, I do. Thank you. Executive Deputy Commissioner Harrison. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Schiff. Yes. Deputy Commissioner Stevens. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Malden. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Friesan. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Canelli. Yes, I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Otsubo. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Taylor. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Gwynn. Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Morse. Yes, I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Liu. Yes, I do. General Counsel Landau. Yes, I do. And Chief of Staff Afshar. Yes, I do. Great, thank you all so much for your patience. Uh, and Commissioner, you can begin when you're ready. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, Chair Levine, Chair Lewis, and members of the Committees on Health and Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, as you heard, I'm joined today by Dr. Torian Easterling, First Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer, and Sammy Girat, Deputy Commissioner for Finance, along with my other colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022. First and foremost, allow me to take a few moments to acknowledge the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on New York City. To date, over 770,000 New Yorkers have had COVID-19, and sadly, we have lost over 30,000 New Yorkers to this devastating virus. Beyond the numbers, the pandemic has had a profound impact on every facet of our lives, and our city has faced immeasurable loss, both of life as well as livelihood. But the burden of COVID-19 has not been felt equally across the city. We have seen disparate outcomes in both illness and mortality in Black and Latino New Yorkers when compared to rates experienced by white New Yorkers. These inequities are, as, are a result of longstanding structural racism and underinvestment in Black, Latino, immigrant, and low-income communities, and mirror the disparities we see in other health outcomes across these communities as well. The Health Department has centered an equity lens in all of our work for many years, but this public health emergency has demonstrated that we have significantly more work to do in order to undo decades of racism, bias, and discriminatory policies that led to these inequities and to prevent the propagation of these unacceptable outcomes in the future. Before I dive into the work we've done in the past year, uh, my leadership team is here with me today and collectively, we have uh, the great honor of representing the approximately 6,000 health department employees who have been working on this response for over a year. I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the whole staff for everything they have done in service of their fellow New Yorkers this year. It has been an extraordinarily challenging time to work in public health, and their work often goes unrecognized. Thank you all. It is a true privilege to get to serve with you. I'm incredibly proud of the health department's response to the challenges of the pandemic over the past year, and I'm honored to have joined this institution as commissioner last August. The department's workforce is made up of world-renowned public health experts, flexible and tireless policy operations and communications professionals, and all around passionate and empathetic public servants. Over 4,500 of our staff have deployed since our incident command structure was activated on January 30th, 2020, and they have worked around the clock ever since. Thus far, over 2 million staff hours have been spent on COVID-19. Allow me to repeat, over 2 million staff hours. This has included the work of our disease surveillance systems, uh, the public health laboratory, originally the only lab in the city running COVID-19 tests, our data experts who have been at the heart of our commitment to transparency, 
and the external affairs team working indefatigably to communicate the ever-changing information about COVID-19 to over 8 million New Yorkers. From our finance, legal, and policy teams to provider and community liaisons, this response has been a true all-hands-on-deck effort. I'm further grateful for the partnership the health department has maintained with our sister agencies throughout this response, but in particular want to acknowledge our work with New York City Health and Hospitals as they created the NYC Test and Trace Corps, or T2, the country's largest public testing and tracing operation. Our staff has brought their expertise in both testing and contact tracing to T2 and continue to work in lockstep with them in the Department of Education Situation Room through investigations of cases and clusters in congregate settings, and in our community outreach work, including the funding of 41 community-based organizations who have done incredible outreach on both testing and COVID-19 vaccines, among, among many other uh, efforts every day. Quickly, I wanna to touch on data. From the early days of the pandemic, the department realized the value of accurate and comprehensive data on the virus and its impact on New York City. We have developed the most rigorous and transparent COVID-19 public reporting system of any city in the country to make sure that New Yorkers have the most up-to-date information and have used this to guide the city's response. We are committed to this same transparency for vaccination data and are now reporting rates by race, ethnicity, age, and zip code on our website. Turning to vaccination, the city's COVID-19 vaccine for all effort is now well underway, and over 2.8 million doses have been administered in New York City. The vaccines are safe, effective, and life-saving, and we encourage all eligible New Yorkers to get vaccinated, whether it be with the Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, or Pfizer vaccines. The health department has taken an active role in the city's vaccine command center, or VCC, led by Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Melanie Hartzog, where our team offers expertise to the VCC on distribution plans, outreach and communications, and strategy for increasing both access to and confidence in the vaccine. In order to do this, we need additional supply from the federal government and more flexibility from the state within eligibility categories, and in order to meet communities where they are. The city will continue disseminating information about the vaccines and how to access them, including through vaccinefinder.nyc.gov and the call center at 877-VAX4NYC. As always, our focus is on equity, and we are working hand in hand with the city's task force on racial inclusion and equity and our sister agencies to address the disparities we see in vaccine uptake thus far. To address these disparities, the mayor announced an equity strategy that includes locating city vaccine sites in communities that need it most, with a focus on the 33 task force neighborhoods. And we are working with CBOs, senior centers, faith-based organizations, and others to set aside appointments for residents of these neighborhoods at our vaccine hubs. We're also working in those communities to address vaccine confidence offering what we call community conversations, training community leaders to be vaccine navigators and getting information out through town halls and boots on the ground outreach in multiple languages. While the department has redirected significant resources and staff time to pandemic response, much of our critical public health work continues and in many ways is more important than ever. We have continued to conduct early intervention services, issue permits, and offer technical assistance for childcare providers and food service establishments, distribute health bucks for nutritious food, address ele elevated blood lead levels in children, operate our sexual health clinics, and issue birth and death certificates. We have dramatically changed how we do our work, prioritizing the health and safety of both our staff and the New Yorkers we serve has meant transitioning to di digital platforms and reimagining how to conduct analog in-person operations. One area I do want to highlight is the serious toll the pandemic has taken on New Yorkers' mental health. Many of us have faced immense grief, 
trauma, and stress throughout this time. Similar to physical health disparities, the mental health disparities of COVID-19 are driven by underlying health and social inequities, including those caused by structural racism. Recognizing this, the health department has implemented strategies over the past year to support both the immediate and long-term behavioral health needs of New Yorkers, and we continue to prioritize the most burdened communities. Much of this work has been done in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC and our sister agencies throughout city government. To reach neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19 and address the pandemic's impact on mental health, we have prioritized community education, reaching over 14,000 New Yorkers with virtual presentations that address COVID-19's impact on mental health, health disparities, and the effects of trauma, grief, and anxiety. We also created and adjusted our substance use support programs. <clears throat> we launched a new methadone delivery system to make medication available to patients who are isolating or in quarantine, making over 4,000 deliveries thus far, and made naloxone available for free at 15 pharmacies in neighborhoods with a high burden of fatal overdose and in many congregate care settings. With funding we received just prior to the onset of the pandemic, we also expanded key programs that provide or connect New Yorkers to treatment and support. This included health engagement assessment teams known as HEAP, which strive to promote equity and eliminate the overrepresentation of people experiencing behavioral health challenges in the criminal justice system. During the pandemic, HEAT conducted outreach to people in communities who may be experiencing homelessness or behavioral health needs to distribute PPE, naloxone, and sexual health kits, and to provide light counseling and connections to treatment and services. In partnership with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, we also added four intensive mobile treatment or IMT teams increasing our capacity to provide mental health and substance misuse treatment and supports to an additional 108 people with serious behavioral health concerns and complex life situations. And serving New Yorkers 24 seven, NYC Well has met unprecedented demand for crisis counseling and emotional support, information and referrals to ongoing mental health and substance use services since the onset of the pandemic. I will now discuss the preliminary budget. The city of New York is facing extraordinarily difficult financial circumstances, but continues to invest in life-saving public health work. The department currently has approximately 6,000 employees and an operating budget of $1.68 billion for fiscal year 2022, of which $836 million is city tax levy. The remainder is federal, state, and private dollars. In the preliminary budget, the department received $10.7 million in city tax levy for new activities in FY22 and took $33.7 million in savings for FY21 and FY22. Regarding new funding for fiscal year 2022, we received $7.8 million in city tax levy to allow the department to meet the growing demand over the last several years for naloxone kits. This funding will also support additional syringe litter pickup and outreach services, enhance buprenorphine outreach to the homeless, and naloxone vending machines. Additionally, $2.9 million in funding was added to hire nurses for new community schools, which will fund 30 new nurses. The health department also saw $29.7 million of savings in this budget for FY21 and $4 million in FY22. I wanna assure you that regardless of the current budget situation, our work continues and the administration is supporting us in this mission. Turning to the state budget, I will start by expressing deep concern with the governor's proposed FY22 budget, as it will lead to significant funding reductions for the health department that will jeopardize multiple areas of our vital work. The governor's budget proposes approximately $50 million in annual cuts to critical public health funding for New York City. Let me be clear now, in the middle of a deadly pandemic, 
is the worst time to cut public health funding. This is a once in a lifetime moment and reducing resources for public health will worsen the health disparities that led to devastating COVID-19 illness and death rates in black and Latino communities. The most significant of these cuts is the proposed reduction to the Article 6 reimbursement rate, which alone would result in a cut of $35 million for essential public health programs at the health department. Article 6 provides partial reimbursement for city tax levy funding to support local public health activities and services. The governor is proposing to cut this reimbursement rate from 20% to 10%. <clears throat> this is on top of a $59 million cut to the same funding source two years ago and is only applied to New York City. If this cut is enacted in the state budget, we will see devastating impacts to early intervention, the nurse family partnership, our sexual health clinics, tuberculosis detection and treatment, and other vital public health programs. I'd like to thank the state Senate and assembly for rejecting this devastating cut to public health in their budget proposals. The state has an obligation to support public health in New York City and the governor's proposed cut must not be enacted. In addition to article six, the governor has proposed a 5% cut impacting mental health, substance use and intellectual slash developmental disability providers. This will result in fewer licensed treatment, housing, and supportive services for publicly insured, uninsured, and underinsured populations, including those experiencing serious mental health or substance use disorders. It would also lead to financial instability for the programs that provide these vital services, further impacting all of the people that they serve. This potential lack of resources for these programs would then increase the burden on the hospital system, shelter system, and federally qualified health centers. New York State has a responsibility to the health of New York City residents. And if we didn't realize it before COVID-19, the pandemic has shown us how our health is interconnected. Now is the time for massive investment in public health, not a time to cut basic funding. Let me state clearly and unequivocally, our economic recovery hinges on public health. Therefore, we continue to advocate for the restoration of this funding and appreciate the council's support in this effort. On the federal level, we are grateful to President Biden and his administration for their engagement with New York City on the COVID-19 response thus far, as well as improved vaccination strategies, particularly increasing vaccine supply. The executive order signed by the president over his first few weeks in office in response to the pandemic are aligned with our public health values and priorities. And we look forward to working with this new administration as we continue to respond to and then recover from this public health crisis. We are pleased to see the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which will infuse billions of dollars of relief into New York City. However, we do remain concerned with the overall level of public health funding from the federal government, which has been systematically cut over the last decade. We are asking for additional funding for the Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Hospital Preparedness Program Cooperative Agreements, which respectively help health departments strengthen their ability to respond to disease threats and build healthcare system preparedness and response. As with all federal funding, it is essential that resources are appropriated and allocated directly to local health departments. Furthermore, we need funding flexibility as localities across the country have vastly different public health needs and we, not the state government, are in the best position to determine how to deploy resources in New York City. This has been an incredibly painful year for all of us and has been an unprecedented time to work in public health, especially here in New York City. <clears throat> you all have heard me say this before, but I will reiterate, I am fiercely committed to science, equity, and compassion in all that we do at the health department. To that end, I'd like to once again acknowledge the department's leadership team and all of our health department employees who are similarly committed to these core values and who continue to serve New Yorkers day in and out. I would also like to thank the council and the chairs for your ongoing partnership and support throughout the past year 
and beyond. Uh, thank you for listening patiently. Thank you for your attention, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner Chakshi. And I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by our colleague, Councilmember Borelli. And I also want to acknowledge um, your leadership team, which has done excellent work in this crisis. And, and so many have been great partners uh, to me in my office. Uh, particularly want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Easterling who's doing a wonderful job as your first deputy commissioner and uh, deputy commissioner, Maura Kennelly who has been uh, such a great partner for so many elected officials and uh, particularly grateful for her data team, which as you acknowledged has put forth um, more transparent public reporting, I think than any other health department in the country. And I'm not sure if she's with us, but also uh, a great thanks to Dr. Jen Rakeman and the team over at the Public Health Lab, which is uh, like so many in the department, uh, just been working uh, on overdrive uh, throughout this crisis now, now more than ever. Um, I, th I think, Commissioner, you'll agree that uh, public health has to be transformed now in the wake of this crisis for the reasons that I was speaking about in my opening statement, uh, the need to address the profounding inequality that has been revealed and exacerbated by this crisis uh, the need to uh, address the trauma that is going to be inflicted on so many in this city for months and years to come, um, physical trauma and, and mental health trauma, uh, to help get our, our primary care systems back at full force because it's been such a blow to them over the year, um, and to prepare for what we have to acknowledge uh, will be another pandemic at some point. And so I, I don't think we can return to public health as it existed prior to a year ago, a year ago, and therefore we can't return to the same Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that we had a year ago. Um, and I, I wonder what your vision is and how we can transform public health and transform the department for the fiscal year ahead to meet these new challenges. Uh, well, thank you so much, Chair Levine. And, um, you know, the way that you've articulated uh, what our challenges are uh, going forward, um, I think hits the nail on the head uh, with respect to what our task is um, going forward. We, we have to look at this as an opportunity to have a step change uh, for public health um, and to make it so that uh, the wake of COVID-19 is not seen as let's go back to things as they were, um, but let's leverage uh, this uh, really once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to center public health and particularly the focus on equity as a part of public health um, in the ways that you've described. Uh, and allow me to just say um, thank you for your leadership and advocacy in this vein. You know, it has really uh, made a difference, not just to our city, um, but in so many ways, you know, positioning us at the vanguard for how uh, the public health uh, community across the country um, has to be thinking about this. So briefly, you know, what I'll share about my vision is that um, it is rooted in those core values that I described, science, equity, and compassion. And that is what uh, has um, has propelled uh, our work for several years, uh, including before I had the privilege as, uh, of joining as commissioner, um, but which really have to be um, taken to the next level in the coming months and years. Um, so much of this uh, arcs back to our public health workforce, um, investing in uh, our workforce, uh, investing in ensuring that we are grounded in the needs of neighborhoods and communities um, and working uh, much more broadly uh, than perhaps public health has been used to working in the past. Uh, we've seen how the all hands on deck efforts were needed as part of COVID-19 response between public health and healthcare delivery, um, but also with all sectors of government um, and really all sectors of society um, to, to take on the challenges that we will face. 
the last thing that I will say is that we have a unique and remarkable opportunity to do uh, another thing that, that you described and what I know um, Chair Lewis is passionate about as well, which is to ensure that mental health uh, is, is not, um, uh, you know, the, the younger sibling. Um, it is the, uh, the very core of what we consider our responsibility in public health uh, as well. Um, to elevate mental health um, to the same place as physical health, but really to work on integrated models that allow us to have a more seamless approach to both. Thank you. Uh, one important strategy for advancing equity is on the ground, an on the ground presence for the health department that you've been able to make happen in three neighborhoods over the years through neighborhood health action centers, uh, in East Harlem, uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn, and the Central Bronx. Those centers have had to be turned over to pandemic response functions. Understandably, they're now, um, I believe all three, certainly the one in East Harlem are being used as vaccination sites. Again, that, that's important at this juncture. But to overcome the kinds of inequality that we've been talking about, we need them and, and uh, assets like them reactivated on the ground in communities which are being marginalized. And I would go further to say, not only do we need to see them return to their normal work in outreach in these communities, but we need a lot more centers like them. Um, you know, everyone loves to cite Mayor LaGuardia as their favorite mayor in the history of the city. Uh, mayor LaGuardia opened uh, dozens of these, uh, what I think he called district public health offices all over. Um, and I would like to see a return to that scale of neighborhood presence. Can you talk about the plan first for restoring um, the normal work at the neighborhood health action centers and um, the possibility of expanding them to more parts of the city that need them? Yes, thank you for this very important question, Chair Levine. Um, allow me to start and I'll turn it uh, to Dr. Easterling to elaborate as well. Um, you know, my starting point is, uh, as you said, um, our neighborhood health action centers um, are rooted in the idea that we must be responsive to and accountable to um, the needs of uh, community members um, in the areas that each center serves. Uh, and so in that way, I'm so proud to, um, you know, to, to be able to relate what they have done over the last few months in contributing to pandemic response, uh, not just um, uh, augmenting our testing capacity at a time when it was sorely needed, but as you observed, also contributing to our historic vaccination campaign. Um, but you were also right to point out that, um, you know, those uh, services that they're delivering must be linked up with a deeper uh, commitment to um, taking on uh, the deeper sources of historic uh, injustice uh, that create the inequities um, that have played out during COVID-19, but which unfortunately uh, continue and which we have to uh, take on uh, as part of the next chapter of the Action Center's work. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Easterling to say a little bit more in this vein. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Councilmember Levine, uh, Chair, I just wanted to thank you uh, for uh, your commitment and your support uh, for the Neighborhood Health Action Centers and certainly some of your colleagues, such as Councilmember Ayala, who has continued to support the East Harlem Action Center in a number of different ways, Councilman Gibson, as we continue to uh, co-plan around the Jerome Avenue Public Health Task Force. Uh, and certainly in my role uh, previously as Assistant Commissioner working directly with Councilmember uh, Alika Samuels, as well as Councilman McCornicky. Um, it has been uh, certainly important to have your partnership. Um, you know, through this pandemic, we have continued a lot of our efforts um, in all three of our action centers. And we've had to move virtually, uh, as you know, particularly with our family wellness suite. I think this is the way that we continue to sort of look at the interrelated uh, inter or the intersection of a lot of the systems and structures that we know uh, residents are facing in action center neighborhoods. Uh, and certainly a continuing to look at ways that we can expand as we engage 
uh, many of our COADS or our organizations are really responding to emergencies in neighborhoods, as well as the connection with the many of the community-based organizations who are responding to COVID-19 and supporting our vaccine work. And certainly to the future, we look at additional ways that we can think about um, how we uh, continue to double down on those efforts in our actions in the neighborhoods, but also to your point, uh, really thinking about how are we getting to more neighborhoods? What do those structures look like? And so we certainly look forward to working with you and your colleagues and sort of thinking about that. Thank you. Um, uh, both of you have referenced uh, the equity challenges in vaccination and how critical it is that, that as a city, we do better to tackle that for moral reasons, but also because you can't get to herd immunity in a city if you leave whole sectors behind, if you leave whole segments of the population behind. So it's in everyone's interest that um, all of us get vaccinated. And there's no doubt that we need uh, direct outreach to marginalized communities to help promote trust in the vaccine, trust in vaccination. And that is gonna become glaringly apparent the moment that we have greater supply than we have demand for vaccination, which is coming uh, soon, uh, maybe as soon as April, certainly no later than May. And I wonder uh, if you could talk about the resources that the city is devoting to that. I hold as a benchmark, the outreach efforts that the city invested in for census particip participation, when hundreds of millions of dollars uh, excuse me, hundreds, hundreds of community organizations were contracted by the city for outreach to promote the census. Uh, the city's budget for that work was, I believe, 40 million, but uh, that doesn't count uh, state outlies, outlays and even more considerable resources that came from the Federal Census Bureau itself for direct on the ground outreach in New York City. Uh, can you talk about the scale of resources being devoted now to outreach? to promote vaccination in marginalized communities, um, how many nonprofits have been contracted and, and other measures, please. Yes, again, thank you for um, calling attention to uh, what is a, a fundamental issue um, for vaccination. Um, what uh, you may have heard me say before is that at the individual level, we want vaccination to be safe, free and easy. And for a campaign as a whole, our goal is to have it be safe, swift, and equitable. Um, and so with respect to what we have um, done around our uh, around the equity pillar in vaccination, um, I'll start with the outcomes, you know, with respect to all of the work that is happening each day um, to get the word out, uh, both to help people access vaccination and to build confidence in the vaccines that are authorized. Um, we have uh, hundreds of canvassers who are out every day going door to door, um, spreading the information that New Yorkers need. Um, by this point, we have already knocked on thousands of doors uh, across New York City, um, distributing that information. Uh, we have sent out hundreds of thousands of direct mailers, you know, leaflets and pamphlets with a particular focus on um, getting the information to uh, senior New Yorkers. Uh, and we've done uh, millions of phone calls, uh, both robocalls as well as live calls uh, across the city uh, to get the information out as well. On the whole, um, our budget for you know, the, the vaccination campaign is uh, on the order of $400 million. Um, that does include about $11 million in uh, our media um, spending, which uh, is yet another channel, you know, for us to get this important information out. Um, but as you pointed out, one of the most important ways that we have to do this is to rely on the trusted messengers, the trusted institutions, you know, within neighborhoods and communities. Um, and we've been working with a set of 41 community-based organizations, uh, you know, to be able um, to do that. And for that, I'll turn it to Dr. Easterling to say a little bit more. Thank you again, Commissioner. Um, so as the Commissioner has mentioned, um, we continue to work with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations in a number of different ways. Uh, but specifically to our partnership with uh, New York City Health and Hospitals through Test and Trace, 
uh, we've already funded and invested in um, partnership with organizations um, in the tune of about $24 million. Um, back in um, early uh, in la last year, around July, uh, we started off working with 41 community-based organizations. We're about a seven, over $7 million was uh, put towards supporting organizations to do outreach specifically around testing and tracing. Um, and then that award has been expanded um, all the way up until the end of this fiscal year to over $15 million to continue to support that work. And we've included uh, language for those organizations to continue to support with vaccine related work. Uh, and so certainly um, we can we uh, understand the, the need to expand and build on it. Um, in addition to that investment, we're also, as we heard from the commissioner, continue to work with organizations to host pop-up sites. And so a number of our organizations who are funded and unfunded are continuing to find ways that they're doing outreach and engagement in, even in their own networks. And I think um, that has also been really important as, as part of the total universe uh, of the work that we need to do to continue to get the word out around vaccine distribution. As you also heard from the commissioner, our work with health and, ho health and hospitals to have canvases on the ground has certainly contributed to how we've been matching uh, appointments as well. Thank you. When it comes to data on equity and vaccination in New York City, there's a glaring hole, which is data from the state on two mega vaccination sites at Javits Center and Aqueduct. What we do know is that a huge number of the people being vaccinated there do not live in New York City. Um, the last data that we've heard is that 42% of the people vaccinated at Javits are not residents of the five boroughs and the number is 75% at Aqueduct, which is a problem because we get a fixed allocation in the city based on the city's population. And we don't get compensated for that when folks come from other parts of the state and region to get vaccinated here. But as far as I know, we have no information on the demographics of the people vaccinated there in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, although I think we can assume based on the fact that so many come from outside of the city that it doesn't reflect the diversity of the city. And I'll say for sure that anecdotal reports from both sites indicate that uh, it doesn't reflect the diversity of the city. Um, so can you tell us whether we're getting any information on demographics in vaccination in those sites as of today? Well, first, um, Chair Levine, I, I want to really thank you for spotlighting this issue um, because it's a very important one for New York City. Um, let me just dissect out a couple of elements of it, but I'll start by, by directly answering your question, which is um, we are working with our state counterparts to get uh, as much data as possible about who is getting vaccinated at those sites. Um, and that has uh, started um, to flow to us, um, but we still need to get additional information on the details of precisely who is getting vaccinated at those sites. So um, we are getting some numbers, but we need to continue working with our state colleagues to, um, to get additional detail. Just two other points, if I may add on this. Um, the first is that it really highlights um, how much we, uh, we need to understand that supply remains our limiting factor for vaccination in New York City. Because we have um, such a vast uh, populace, of course, but also so many people who are coming from outside of the city who work in the city, we already need more than uh, the per capita allocation that is being given to us by the federal government. Added on top of that, um, you know, the fact that some of the allocation is going to these state sites where there are non-New York City residents who are getting vaccinated, that means we need even more supply beyond that. Um, so that's very important for us to continue advocating both at the state and federal level so that we can get our fair share of supply because it will um, quite frankly save lives for our fellow New Yorkers. And then the second point to just highlight briefly, I'm, I'm very proud of our data team's efforts on uh, ensuring that we have the most robust race and ethnicity reporting in our data um, of just about anywhere in the country. When we first started uh, collecting data on race and ethnicity, about 40% of records um, showed an unknown race or ethnicity. 
In our most recent weeks, that has dropped to less than 19% unknown. And that's through very concerted efforts with our fellow clinical colleagues um, and a lot of hard work by, by our data teams. That's just the beginning, of course. We have to then look at the inequities that are laid bare from that data and actually act upon them. Thank you so much, and that's good news on, on getting better data. I wanna thank you, Commissioner, for mentioning in your opening statement some cuts to critical health programming that we are facing in the state budget, the reduction in the Article Six reimbursement from 20 to 10%, and the Medicaid pharmacy carve-out, 340B. I wanna state unequivocally that to put these cuts forward now would be absolute insanity. This is absolutely indefensible at any time, but in the midst of a pandemic to put forth cuts to critical public health programs is just utter, utter insanity. And we must fight this with everything we have. These cuts will undermine nonprofit health providers, which exist because the mainstream healthcare institutions are not adequately serving marginalized populations. These nonprofit providers have grown up through blood, sweat, and tears over the decades to provide critical life-saving care to many people who are marginalized, whether it's struggling with HIV AIDS, with addiction, or a variety of other challenges. And particularly the uh, 340B carve out, if this goes forward, uh, it will mean the closure of critical components of these nonprofits that will have direct negative impact on people in the city who are suffering. And this would be a terrible idea at any time, but to do this in the midst of a pandemic is just an absolutely spectacularly spectacularly terrible idea and we have to fight it. And I thank you for speaking up on this. I also want to say that while we fight aggressively against this action in Albany, that we need to consider the possibility that the city is going to have to come in with some rescue here if the worst happens. And so I wonder if you could speak to that. Uh, I know that you're with us in the fight to block these terrible cuts. But um, can you talk about um, what the city could be prepared to do uh, to help make uh, keep these services whole if the worst does indeed come to pass? Um, yes, well, you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, we wouldn't turn off um, the water uh, in a fire truck um, while we're trying to fight a raging inferno. Uh, and that's exactly, you know, what this boils down to with respect to um, cutting public health in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, so certainly we will be shoulder to shoulder with you in calling attention to um, the deleterious effects of, you know, these types of cuts. And when we're talking about numbers um, or you know, funding, it can seem very abstract, but what I have etched in my mind are the very tangible real world effects. It means less naloxone kits that we can distribute to save lives from overdoses. It means less funding for our sexual health clinics, um, which would cause uh, infections that, um, you know, that uh, cause uh, havoc for families. Uh, it means less funding for uh, early intervention, which supports uh, so many uh, families, you know, for, for children who uh, are struggling with um, developmental issues in the earliest years of their lives. So these are things that we take um, extremely seriously with respect to highlighting, you know, what those harmful effects would be. Uh, unfortunately, we have been in this position in the past where the state, you know, has cut uh, Article 6 uh, funding before. Um, and so we're already at a disadvantage with respect to those levels of funding for New York City. Uh, in the past, um, you know, the city uh, has been able to backfill uh, some of that funding, but we are in a much, much different financial situation uh, right now, given the devastation of the pandemic. Uh, and so uh, I think our charge is to take on with urgency uh, this fight to ensure that the cuts do not come to pass. 
Well, we're just going to do everything we can in our power to make sure that the people who depend on these services for their health are not negatively impacted at this, this moment of crisis. Uh, finally, Commissioner, uh, in, in, the, in the half dozen or so times that we've had hearings uh, in the health committee over the past year, uh, I have to say this is the first time where I'm allowing myself to feel a real uh, great sense of optimism about uh, the months ahead. I really am um, feeling incredibly optimistic about what the late spring and summer will be like for our city and a chance to return to a life with which, if not quite normal, will be a lot more like normal than the summer of 2020 was. Um, uh, I, I am still uh, worried, however, about the coming weeks ahead. In uh, a moment when there's still extraordinary amount of new uh, infections we're seeing every day, you know, almost 4,000 on many days, and uh, this in any other context would be considered to be itself uh, a historic crisis. It's only because of our numbness and exhaustion from the past year um, that, that we are perhaps not alarmed as we should be about uh, a pandemic leading to 4,000 new infections every day. And I, I wonder if you could speak about your concern about the current uh, level of spread in the city, the extent to which you believe it is caused by variants and how likely you think it is that the city could face another wave before um, the great advancement in vaccination overwhelms the virus and we get to a better place uh, uh, just a few months from now. Um, thank you again for the thoughtful question. And I'll start by saying I am also feeling hopeful and optimistic. Uh, and I think particularly as we take stock of uh, the one year anniversary of, you know, the beginning of so much um, suffering and tragedy. Uh, New York City, you know, has certainly earned uh, some reason for, uh, for hope, you know, in the months ahead. Uh, but we've also learned a lot about the virus uh, over the last few months. And, um, and, you know, what I see in the numbers, uh, it does continue to concern me. Um, I would much rather, you know, as a city's doctor, be seeing cases plunging rather than plateauing uh, and particularly hospitalizations, uh, you know, severe illness, um, the too many deaths of our fellow New Yorkers um, for those to to be dropping precipitously, um, you know, in the in the weeks ahead. I do think that the new variants are contributing to some of the levels that we're seeing right now. Um, particularly because the, the two most prevalent um, variants that we've detected thus far, that's the B117, uh, also known as the UK variant, and the B1526 variant, which was first discovered here in New York City. Both of them um, do have uh, scientific evidence that indicates that um, they are more transmissible. You know, it means that the virus is able to spread more easily. And so I do think that that is a contributing factor to um, the levels that we're seeing right now. With all of that said, we know what works. Um, it's you know what I've what I've called the safe six: masking, distancing, hand washing, staying home if you're feeling ill, getting tested, um, and getting vaccinated when it's your turn. And particularly having the vaccine as a, a much stronger tool in our arsenal. Um, I am confident that if we keep our foot on the gas with all of those other public health precautions uh, and we uh, give the vaccine a chance to, um, to do its work, uh, we will see things improve in the coming weeks and months. And what is your best guess for why cases, while dropping significantly in other parts of the country, have plateaued in New York City? What's different here? Yes, it's an important question. Um, again, I do think the variants are contributing uh, to some element of it. Um, there are also some things that are just unknown with respect to, you know, the contributions of seasonality in different parts of the country, um, you know, the ways in which uh, we are seeing, um, you know, some of the 
uh, some of the effects of reopening play out differently in different parts of the country. Um, but you know what I'll say that is the most actionable is we know uh, the activities that confer the greatest risk of spread, and that's um, spending more time indoors than outdoors. Uh, that's any time that people are gathering, you know, unmasked or wearing a mask inconsistently. Um, and then that's and then there's uh, people who are gathering, you know, in larger groups rather than smaller groups. So if we guard against those things, um, then I do think that we'll see uh, continued improvement over the next few weeks. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to your team and um, for speaking with us today. And now I'm going to pass it off to my co-chair, Councilmember Farrah Lewis. Thank you so much, Chair Levine, and thank you, Commissioner Shosky, for uh, answering all these questions and for the thorough testimony, and I'm grateful to have your whole team with us today. Um, so I just want to start off with having a quick conversation about redirecting funds to, to COVID. Um, I, I think we can all agree that communities of color had suffered tremendously uh, regarding loss, loss of friends, community, loved ones during COVID. And many of these people in these communities are battling emotional and mental health issues from so many losses. I wanted to know, um, there were several programs that run under the Department of Health that weren't able to fully utilize those funds because of the pandemic. I wanted to know how can we redirect those funds to neighborhoods mostly impacted by COVID-19. Um, well, thank you so much, Chair Lewis. And um, I really appreciated your uh, your words and your heartfelt um, remarks uh, on what we um, think of as the parallel pandemics uh, to COVID-19. You know, all of the other ways in which uh, it's not a direct effect of the virus, but no less um, tragic and devastating with respect to uh, you know, some of the, the indirect or reverberating effects. So, um, so thank you for your work and your leadership in that vein. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, to your question, can, perhaps you could tell me a, a little bit more. Are there specific um, programs that you have in mind with respect to the, the redirection of funding? Well, there's several programs, but what we're trying to figure out and see, and we're trying to grapple around this for the last um, couple of weeks, we're trying to see if there's any way, um, and we can have this at a later date, but if there, if there's any ways funding could be redirected to programs and services designed to help marginalized black and brown communities with coping due to loss from uh, COVID-19. Um, okay, I understand your question better. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, and in so many ways, you know, that has been done over over the past year. Um, I, you know, I'll just point out uh, a few examples that come to mind. Uh, first, you know, racial equity uh, has been central to all of our work even before the pandemic. So when we think about um, what our uh, responsibilities are in any of our programs and the direct services that we offer, um, you know, centering people who are most marginalized and particularly taking uh, a racial equity lens uh, has been part and parcel of how we think about um, doing that, particularly in the division of mental hygiene, you know, whether it's uh, ensuring that um, our mobile treatment options uh, have uh, a footprint in communities of color or um, ensuring that the outreach teams for substance use, including the heat teams that I mentioned in my testimony, um, are working in communities of color. So, you know, that has been a sort of a core principle of ours even before uh, COVID-19. Um, but then more broadly, you're right to point out that um, the ways in which COVID-19 has caused, uh, you know, those very same communities to bear even more of the brunt of the suffering over the last few months means that we must redouble our efforts in this vein. Um, and so, you know, a few ways in which we've done that is by um, ensuring, for example, that our uh, early intervention um, programs for, you know, for children um, 
uh, are still engaging with uh, families despite you know, the interruption that could be caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also you know, ensuring that so much of what we're doing around uh, family and child health um, is also oriented around uh, communities of color as well. So this is an area where I would welcome you know, further collaboration with you. Um, and if there are other examples that come to mind, we are certainly willing to partner with you on it. I appreciate that. Um, and, and as you speak, I think about when, when you said, you know, we need a safe, free and easy way to provide services for vaccine. I believe that we need to do it the same way for mental health services. But you quickly touched upon the mobile treatment, um, the, the IMT. So I want to discuss that a little bit during the oversight hearing the, the mental health emergency response that that took place February 22nd, the director of the mayor's office of Thrive testified uh, regarding the expansion of the intensive mobile treatment for four new teams. The preliminary fiscal 2022 budget still only includes 7.7 .7 for IMTs. Um, when will the additional teams be included for DOHMH and Thrive's budget? Um, thank you for the question. I, I'll just start by, um, by saying a little bit about um, IMTs and our commitment to them, and then I'll ask Dr. Harrison uh, to get into some of the specifics of your question. Um, we, we care deeply about uh, expanding services through the intensive mobile treatment model, in part because it is such a um, successful model of deep engagement um, with the people that we're serving uh, that has been shown, uh, and again, you know, I appreciated your testimony and its focus on outcomes with respect to addressing mental health. You know, it's not just about delivering services, it's about holding ourselves accountable to those outcomes. Uh, and so, as you've pointed out, you know, we have, um, uh, we have had the chance to expand uh, our IMT teams, uh, and that means, you know, it's an additional 108 people that we're able to serve through that model. But with respect to the funding, let me see if Dr. Harrison has more that she can share on that point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question, Chair. Um, I want to echo what the commissioner said and about how valuable the intensive mobile treatment programs are. As you picked up on, when we started intensive mobile treatment programs, we started with three teams. We're now up to 11 teams. These are teams that are able to serve individuals who our system has failed to this point in time. So folks who may be homeless, may have mental illness, may have substance use disorders, we're really able to engage these folks and spend the time it takes uh, to meet them where they are and offer them the kinds of services and supports that they need. So we're really um, hopeful about these teams. And the, new, the four new teams are operating at full capacity at this point. And I think, um, you know, I can't speak to the funding, but we'd be happy to get back to you on that. Thank you. And I know just, just to add in um, that it's 7.7 .7 for the IMT team. So if we're at 11, we need to increase the budget to the 12.1 um, that it costs for seven plus uh, team members. So thank you for that, Dr. Heron said. Um, Gonna jump into uh, questions about um, inequity oh. mental health services. Oh, yes. Oh, you had a question. Okay. Um, are there any specific programs that your agency seeks to increase uh, the access for mental health services for underserved communities? Are there specific programs that you're thinking about? Yes. Um, so yeah, the, the question is around. Uh, how we're addressing inequities in mental health services through the programs we're delivering, correct? Yes, this is a cross-cutting commitment, you know, across uh, all of our programs, whether it be mental health programs or the substance use services that you've heard us um, say a little bit more about. Um, we do this uh, using a range of different strategies. Um, first is again, having the humility and the reflex to um, partner. Uh, whether it's with local clinicians, you know, local service providers who often know uh, the communities that they're serving um, in greater depth and detail than we may be able to. 
and working hand in hand with them, whether it's on our outreach services um, or uh, engagement, you know, in more intensive treatment models. Um, the second way that we do it is uh, by ensuring that, um, you know, we have uh, a focus on racial equity in uh, our conversations with fellow clinicians. So I'm very proud of some of the work that the Division of Mental Hygiene uh, has done, um, particularly in the last half of 2020, um, to essentially, you know, kick off a much needed conversation around uh, a more explicitly race conscious approach in uh, the work um, that all of us are doing in mental health. Uh, and so we used our convening power as a health department, you know, to be able to, um, to, to do that with clinical colleagues across the city. Um, and then the final thing that I will say is that um, when we look at our data, both our data, you know, to understand uh, whether we are serving the people that we aim to serve and having the outcomes that we wish to have, um, we have taken a much more granular approach to ensuring that we understand um, the race, the race and ethnicity breakdown, you know, with respect to those services and those outcomes that are being delivered. Uh, and by doing that, you know, we have shown uh, where in many cases, um, you know, we need to augment our, our outreach or the intensity of services. Um, uh, and that's again true across both mental health and substance use programs. So those are a few examples that come to mind. I hope that answers your question. It does. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I would like to, to hear more about the recruitment effort to better diversify um, mental health specialists and support access for technology for telehealth services. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for asking this. I'll start briefly and then again turn to, um, to Dr. Harrison for this one. Uh, this is another area where there's been, you know, quite a bit of concerted focus. Um, and for recruitment, uh, you know, and ensuring that, um, that, you know, to put it plainly, uh, we um, reflect the communities that we aim to serve. Um, that has to happen across all different levels of the organization. It's particularly important, as you point out, for um, you know, more direct patient-facing uh, service providers, um, but it's no less important at the leadership level as well. Um, and so you know, Dr. Easterling and many others have been uh, ensuring that we're turning the spotlight inward with respect to um, to uh, racial and ethnic diversity in our recruitment efforts. Um, but I'll turn it to Dr. Harrison to say a little bit more about what that looks like, uh, specifically in the Division of Mental Hygiene. Great, thank you so much as well for, for highlighting and spotlighting issues that are of great concern to us as well. I think you asked a couple of questions uh, in your question and I, I wanna focus on the telehealth aspect of what you asked uh, because what we have found in the context of this pandemic, as you are all aware of, providers had to pivot and they had to pivot really quickly to figuring out how to offer care for individuals who they could not see in person. In the behavioral health world, providers were able to offer telehealth, telemental health virtually through devices like smartphones, but as well as on the telephone, the old fashioned way of just talking to people. And we have been hearing from providers how amazing that has been and how they've actually been able to serve more people because they don't have people not showing up for visits in the office. So it's been uh, a successful way to continue to serve people where we have to consider the safety of the, the patients as well as the staff uh, at this point in time. So as we speak about telehealth, I hope we could jump into a question real quick about NYC Well, if that's okay with you. Um, in FY22's budget, NYC Well's budget increases to 22.5 million. Um, how will that increase funding be utilized? I'm not sure if you would have the answer to that, one of your colleagues. Um, yes, well, for NYC Well, uh, again, I'll start with, um, with my knowledge of it and turn to Dr. Harrison. Um, well, first, I, I just want to acknowledge um, how important NYC Well has been for our city. 
uh, over the last few months. Um, you know, the ability to uh, respond 24 seven in a time where so many are experiencing the grief and stress and trauma um, that too many families have uh, have unfortunately had to experience. Um, it's something that uh, that is really unparalleled, you know, with respect to um, the services that many other cities are are able to offer. Um, I also just want to acknowledge a little bit of the staff who are fielding those calls, you know, who uh, who absorb uh, the um, you know the the things that their fellow New Yorkers are experiencing, and and um, you know, in many cases, are able to guide them. Uh, to um, sources for for help in a moment of great duress, uh, and so I'm grateful that we have um, had the resources to be able to um, you know continue expanding those services, uh, and that continues into um, FY22 uh, based on the preliminary budget and the administration's you know commitment and leadership to um, NYC Well as one of the most important portals. Uh, for all New Yorkers to be able to access mental health services. Dr. Harrison, do you want to say a little bit more? Yeah, I think I would just add um, that you asked exactly what the funding would be going towards. The the way the service operates is essentially they hire crisis counselors and peers, people with lived experience, to answer the calls, texts, and chats that come in. And we have seen um, extremely high, unprecedented volume to NYC Well for people accessing uh, information, referrals, who may be in crisis themselves. It is also a suicide crisis line. Um, and it's a, another way for people to get care if they need access to mobile crisis services. So we imagine more will be needed and again, the past year has seen highest, highest levels of answered volume. And we just think that that's a really necessary service for all of New York City. And Chair Lewis, if, if I may just add one other point on NYC Well, because it's so important and I wanna make sure that all of the council members know it. Um, it is free to all New Yorkers. It is uh, completely confidential and it's available in, um, in over 200 languages. So, uh, you know, true access to mental health starts with those elements. And, uh, and so that's been a commitment for NYC Well. Thank you for that, Commissioner. I just wanted uh, to know if you and Dr. Harrison can highlight quickly, how many more staff will be added with the 22.5 million increase? And what are the licenses and credentials of the NYC well call takers? Um, I heard Dr. Harrison mention peers um, and also counselors. So I j we just wanted to know like how many of them, how many more staff will be added and will they be licensed prof professionals with credentials? Um, those are important questions. I, I don't have the answers at hand. I don't know, Dr. Harrison, if you do. I don't have the answers at hand either, but we'd be happy to get back to you with that information. Okay, uh, last question regarding NYC Well. Is there a plan to expand NYC Well to include on the ground responses? <clears throat> I know at the moment it's over the phone, but when, when we speak to folks in our districts, um, we hear that folks are looking for opportunity to have that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and being that we are where we are right now um, and we are getting vaccinated and we're in a recovery phase, there's an opportunity here for an on the ground response. So I wanted to know if there was um, any plans to expand or to offer a virtual component with the increased funding that's being asked. Thank you. These are, um, these are very important questions. And uh, you know I think they highlight that um, Another thing during the COVID-19 pandemic has been to evolve our models of care, you know, be, because we've been forced to in many ways. Uh, and that's a positive thing with respect to being able to blend um, technology with uh, some things that will always require, you know, in-person interaction to be able to deliver services well. Um, I know this from my own clinical experience, uh, you know, as a primary care doctor where um, telehealth works for so many things, um, you know, but, uh, but often needs to be connected with uh, an in-person care model as well. 
Um, I'll start by saying that NYC Well does do that, you know, in some ways um, by ensuring that there are linkages to, um, to clinical services on the ground, particularly for someone who needs, um, uh, you know, counseling or an evaluation by a medical professional like a psychiatrist. So there are, you know, those, um, those types of warm handoffs that are able to occur through the initial interaction uh, with NYC Well. You were um, right to point out that there may be other ways for us to explore more uh, seamless, you know, integration of the different types of services that are offered. Um, so, Dr. Harrison, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thank you. Again, uh, you know, great points that you're bringing up, uh, Chair Lewis. I would add that we have a couple of other programs where we are out in the community. So, you may have heard earlier the mention of a program called 3C Community Conversations Around COVID, which has a focus on mental health, um, mental health awareness, stress awareness, and resiliency building. Those conversations are happening out in the communities. They're happening in a virtual way at this point, but we have reached um, all of the communities that we've had the greatest concerns about, the 33 neighborhoods of greatest concern. Um, and that those conversations, which are short conversations, are being expanded um, into about four hour sessions and that's phasing out um, very soon. And we also have a service through Project Hope, which is a New York State um, <laughs> program that we have here in New York City, specifically around crisis counseling in the context of this pandemic. And that's accessible through uh, the HOPE line, which is a, a line that we can get you the, the contact information for as well to reach people in the community where they are and offer them resiliency, uh, building and coping strategies uh, on the ground. Thank you for that. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about um, students. Because um, as you mentioned, there are still services being provided virtually, but we know that students are transitioning back into in-person learning. Um, and it will be imperative to monitor the mental health status of students. The mayor announced that there would be an increase in mental health screenings in schools. Uh, will that be in every school or just communities hardest hit by COVID? Um, yes, th thank you for this important question as well. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, is, um, is another one of the, the reverberating effects of COVID-19, you know, that we've been paying particular attention to um, the intersection of mental health effects with uh, young people, you know, including um, adolescents uh, is something that is of national concern, but also something that we've been following closely um, in New York City as well. I do know that the um, that the plan is for uh, this mental health screening uh, to be um, done uh, broadly and ultimately, you know, as as universally as possible. Um, but with respect to the the plan for that, um, I I will ask Dr. Stevens to um, to chime in on that question. Thank you. Um, hopefully, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. um, So, um, Chair Lewis, thank you so much for that question. It is something um, we, uh, we hold very, very uh, near and dear. Um, one of our greatest concerns is what, what our youth and our children have been through, um, in addition to the, the pandemic, but as you, as you mentioned, the transition to learning from home, the virtual environment, um, and the uncertainty around the transitions as well. Um, to the commissioner's great point, we are partnering very, very closely with our colleagues at the Department of Education um, in the Division of School Climate and Wellness, um, and have been working with them since you know last summer about the universal screeners. Um, so to the commissioner's point, they are planned to be as universal as possible. Um, and as you know, then to also continue to partner because with the screening, then you know to continue to provide services and push in to provide um, to meet the needs of students wherever they are, given some of the transition and some of the changes that we're seeing this year. 
Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Commissioner Shosky uh, referenced earlier nurses being implemented in schools. I wanted to know if maybe you or one of your colleagues could further elaborate on this process. And also, will teachers be trained on how to spot signs of mental health issues in students for this new program? Thank you again, Chair Lewis. I'll, I'll start briefly and then turn it to Dr. Stevens again. Um, you know, with respect to the, the new nurses um, who are being uh, added um, for the FY22 um, preliminary budget, uh, it's approximately 30 nurses um, who would be placed in community schools. This is, um, I, I want to be just very explicit, this is in addition to, you know, the hundreds of school nurses who are already delivering services, um, you know, across Department of Education schools. Um, but this is, you know, a new uh, initiative that's that's specifically for um, for community schools as well. Uh, and, you know, I do know that there is um, a fair amount of ongoing work that's occurring with our, our Department of Education colleagues to ensure that it's not just um, nurses, but many other school staff who have uh, training, whether it's mental health first aid or, you know, more specific um, training to identify uh, mental health issues. Um, so I do know that that's been a focus, but Dr. Stevens uh, can elaborate on those points. Yes, thank you. Um, this is this is um, this is a rare chance where I get to brag and lean into our partnership. So I I, I acknowledge uh, the commissioner's point around making sure that it's it is our nurses and it is our consummate professionals that we are always um, you know present in schools, providing support, providing guidance, being um, some, you know, folks who folks can talk to. But we recognize in partnership with our, our partners at DOE that this year is different, that the needs are, are expanded. And so I know that over 20,000 staff so far have been trained in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is you know, through efforts at the Department of Health um, in collaboration with us on kind of trauma-informed care. And that is not just teachers, that is not just nurses, but that is counselors, receptionists, any, anyone who comes in contact with students. So um, I think that's a really important point. And I thank the commissioner for raising that up because it's gonna take all of us and all of our efforts to identify, support, and, and continue to um, help our young people at this, at this point. I thank you, Dr. Stevens, for that response um, and happy to see that we're moving in the right direction. I do want to share that mental health first aid is not a submission, is not a, a, a significant and cannot suffice what's going to be needed for our young people in our schools. Um, while it is a great effort to train everyone, mental health first aid is just like on the surface training. Um, and we need a little bit more. So I wanted to know, maybe you or the commissioner, or one of your colleagues, I wanted to know like how many schools are staffed with DOHMH social workers? Um, Dr. Stevens, I'll turn it to you. Sure, sure. Um, uh, well, I, I don't have that set number in front of me. Um, I, I do know that we have um, a variety of different programs with different mental health professionals. Um, and so you have the social workers that are part of the school community, the school guidance counselors. You have the consultant um, now specialist program. Um, and so we're doing our best to really make sure that we are pushing in in a tiered approach to your point. There are things that apply universally. We want some things to be done more selectively to folks who are at higher risk. And we wanna make sure that there are those highest tier services for folks who really need them. Um, and so we're really doing our best to, to partner with DOE to make sure what we have, we can expand. And when we have a full picture of that, we are providing for um, certainly focusing on the 33 neighborhoods that are most affected, but also taking an account, into account um, the longstanding inequities that we've seen, not only in our health outcomes, but you know, very, very similar approaches are happening on, along kind of education and opportunity outcomes with it. With, in, in context with our partners at DOE. And are those programs supportive of families and not just the students? Is it like a whole family approach? So yes, I, 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 yes. Um, there, there, there are different programs. I can, I can speak a bit about um, 
you know, the, the DOH and our specialist program is an entire family and school community approach. While there are, um, there are um, components to it to build capacity amongst teachers, staff, work with families, provide trainings to, to parents, and this year also pushing in to provide targeted kind of groups support for students. So a mixture to not just to your point, you know, I'm a pediatrician, so we, we get this, you know, it's, it's more than just the child in front of you, it's the entire environment around. And so um, that capacity building, um, answering those questions, that, that's a key part of, of our program. And do you know if DOHMH has any involvement with the substance abuse prevention and intervention specialist program, the SAPIS programs in the schools? Go ahead, Dr. Stevens. So, so we, we, we are not directly um, responsible for that, that program, uh, but we do work in partnership with our DOE colleagues to make sure that we provide as much expertise and support as we can. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, quick question regarding the EMS and mental health response teams. Um, how will cure violence programs be connected to the new EMS mental health response team pilot in the FY22 budget? Um, thank you for, um, for this important question as well. Uh, this is one that I believe Dr. Um, Harrison will be best positioned to speak to. Great. Again, thank you very much. Uh, I, I love your questions. <laughs> they're, they're getting at the heart, the heart of the, the challenge that we all have to deal with. Um, I don't have an answer for you in terms of connecting the new pilot to the Cure Violence programs, but I am happy to take that question uh, back to the steering committee who's you know, working on the program and the development of that program. And I I look forward that, to that, Dr. Harrison. We really need to know what role DOHMH will play in the pilot program. It's, it's more than essential. It's uh, a priority right now. So um, I do appreciate a response to that. Um, I'm going to turn it back to uh, our committee council, just in case we have any colleagues on that want to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Chair Lewis. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Rosenthal and Barron at this time. Um, so we will now turn to Council Members in the order that they have raised their hands. And I just want to remind Council Members that you can use the Zoom raise hand function, and then I'll call on you. Uh, we'll be limiting Council Member questions to five minutes, and the Sergeant of Arms will keep a timer to let you know when your time is up. So. Right now, the order of questions will be Council Member Ayala, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. And Council Member Ayala, you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you can hear me correctly because this computer is a little bit off. I might sound a lot muffled. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So I have a couple of questions really quickly. I only have five minutes, so I want to, three minutes or five, I'm not sure. I can't see anymore. Um, but I want to, so I'll ask the questions and then maybe you can just respond. Um, so there's, can you list, because in, in, in Commissioner Tosca, you mentioned that there are organizations that uh, Department of Health is working on for districts in terms of the vaccination um, distribution efforts. And so I wonder how many uh, organizations there are per district, who selects those organizations um, because I haven't quite frankly received any notification from anyone um, from DOHMH letting me know that this is an option for my constituents. And so that concerns me because I wonder how would an individual that is not connected to one of those organizations know that those vaccines exist in their community. So I, I don't want it to be something that is supposed to be a good thing to turn into another hindrance uh, because while I understand that, um, and we've had conversations about this, that over 20% of my constituency has been vaccinated, my concern is that they have had to go elsewhere to get vaccinated. And that is a problem because, as you mentioned, on the list of 25, 26 zip codes that were the most affected, all of my zip codes are listed on that list. 
and I haven't seen any real benefit that comes from being on the list. Uh, two, um, regarding the telehealth, uh, for behavioral health, I loved it. I thought that, you know, um, they were very well received. However, it was pretty evident that there were people that were disconnected as a part, you know, as a result of clinics having closed down. And so I wonder if there is any data that could tell us what the number of participants were that were left out, um, that didn't really have access, right, to inpatient and by virtue of not having access, had no access to clean needles or naloxone. Um, and did that lead to an increase in overdose, hepatitis, or HIV cases? And then lastly, sorry, I know it's a lot, but I only have a few minutes. What is the existing strategy for assisting with syringe litter in communities like mine, where we've seen a significant increase, but haven't heard from anyone in the city uh, regarding a plan to address? Um, thank you, Councilmember Ayala, for, for three um, extremely important questions. Uh, let me start um, briefly, uh, and then um, some of my colleagues, particularly Dr. Easterling and Dr. Harrison, may want to chime in as well. Um, so your first question, and yes, you know, I very much appreciated your questions uh, and your perspective on vaccine access. Um, I will uh, highlight, um, you know, for any New Yorker, uh, using 877-VAX4NYC and vaccinefinder.nyc.gov um, does help to, to navigate um, the various uh, locations that are available for um, vaccine appointments. Um, and with respect to community-based organizations, uh, we can certainly you know, provide um, the list that we've been working with. It's about 40 community-based organizations across um, across New York City, uh, and Dr. Easterling may have more to say about that. Um, just briefly, again, uh, on your questions around um, telehealth, uh, particularly as it relates to, um, to opioid use disorder, uh, as well as syringe litter, um, both of these uh, have been uh, major areas of focus um, for the health department particularly as we have seen in New York City, as has been seen across the entire country, um, that there are uh, an increasing number of um, overdoses uh, that are occurring, um, you know, for the most part um, due to increases in fentanyl uh, in the, the opioid, you know, drug supply. Uh, and so these are areas where um, we've done a range of different things, particularly, you know, with respect to what you were saying about um, outreach and behavioral health services. We've had uh, a very significant increase in outreach, for example, through the HEAP teams that I mentioned uh, in my testimony, increasing uh, the hours and the neighborhoods um, you know, where uh, HEAP teams are present, including in, in your district, as, as you are likely aware, um, and also working with syringe service providers um, across New York City uh, to um, ensure that um, that people who are uh, using drugs um, have access to, uh, to to clean syringes and all of the supportive services um, that that are also uh, useful. I do remember a few months ago we went Time has on, expired. We went on a walkthrough in your district um, and uh, and and you voiced you know some of your concerns about syringe litter as well. Um, and there has been a concerted effort across multiple agencies, including the health department, to match up the care and the treatment that I've described with, um, with ensuring that parks uh, is involved in cleanup and our colleagues in sanitation are as well. So I hope that answers some of your questions. Uh, well, yes and no, because I just wanna, I wanna point out that first in regards to the vaccinations, that while well-intentioned, and I understand the complexities and the lack of vaccines, you know, being made available to the city to, uh, in order to support the demand that, you know, I, I've personally, like every single day, go on all of these websites and I, I have been very diligent. It has become a job in trying to secure a vaccination site for myself, and I'm not asking you to, if I wanted to, I just wanna be clear, if I wanted to get vaccinated today, I could probably find somewhere else in Queens and Staten Island, but that is exactly my point. 
is that I should not, because especially because my community was hit so hard, because so many of my constituents are elderly, are frail, are disabled, are unemployed, to continue to put to add barriers to accessing, you know, vaccinations on any other services is, is a disservice to them. And that is my point, is that I have different spots where you can probably get three vaccines here, two vaccines there, but it's not enough to meet the demand. And I have organizations, actually, there's one organization on the list that you and I described the other day that has been given um, an allotted amount of slots at the, the, the Health Action Center here in East Harlem, and they have, rep they have made several uh, weekly uh, appointments that have continuously been canceled. And so now the people that they have been trying to get appointments for no longer want appointments with them because they don't trust that they're going to be able to come through with the vaccine. And so that to me is a problem. And this is something that I've been hearing from my constituents. So I don't want to say that there isn't any effort being made. I don't want to say that because that is, you know, that is not 100% accurate. But, am I, but is the city doing everything that it can to ensure that communities that were the most impacted that continue to be on the same list that you guys continue to highlight and post and share and you know speak you know uh, speak on every single day that you're also honest about the fact that the people in those communities are not getting vaccines in their own communities that they're being vaccinated elsewhere because the vaccines just don't exist there and that's a reality that's true and I need you to be honest about that because you know that's the experience that I'm having and I and nobody's no one's going to convince me otherwise because I, this is what I'm seeing and this is what I'm hearing you know in in the community so it would have been nice to know that there were organizations that were selected I didn't even know that until I, I had a conversation with you the other day no one called me no one told me this and yet people were coming to me asking me well what's happening and I don't know I really don't know and in regards to the syringe litter um I will add that you know, I, what, I, what I'm referring to are resources, additional resources. It is not okay to just rely on sanitation and on the parks department to come and pick up syringe litter. There has to be money. There has to be a plan to address that because in some communities, and I will show you, and I almost feel like I'm doing a show, you know, um, I've become one of those, those the students, teacher things. I'm like, show and tell. This is my syringe litter box that was given to me by one of my providers because I have had to go onto my street to pick up syringe on a multiple of occasions. So I have syringes here, I have in my car, I bring them in, they pick them up, they take them, but that is not my job. That is not my job, right? There should, if we know that there are some communities that are impacted in this way where I have syringes in front of my community centers where children go for recreational and educational opportunities, that there's no reason why if everybody knows, and at this point, everybody knows where those places are because I have been very vocal about them, that we still have you know, needles in front of those same community centers, in front of those schools, in front of those places of worship. I was lucky enough through that when I was the former chair of this committee to be able to allocate a little bit of money to one of my organizations here in East Harlem to do that work. It's one organization with a very limited budget doing the entire community. That shouldn't be their responsibility either. The city should know and have a plan to address these concerns. It's serious. These are improperly disposed of needles, many of them, not one, not to, if you go to 110th Street and Lexington Avenue right now, you will probably run into at least a minimum of 30 needles improperly disposed of in front of the community center. Um, if you go to the South Bronx, 146th Street, between College and Third, you will find needles to the point that Con Edison can't even open the, 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 the underground uh, contraption anymore because th there's so many needles in there that every time they open it, they have to call a special team to come out and clean it so that they can do their work. So there's a problem. There's a problem, and that's what I what I mean. And I'm sorry that I took way too much of, of of the time today, but you know we don't always get an opportunity to really bring these things up, and they're really important because they're impacting my community really, really seriously. And you know I've been voicing my concerns for a really long time, and I really don't feel like I'm being heard. Um, or that people are really understanding where I'm coming from because I, I, I feel like I'm fighting way too hard for these things to be done um, unnecessarily. 
Well, I, I very much appreciate your feedback. I can assure you that you are being heard. Um, you know, you have been heard, uh, but we will continue to work um, with you, uh, with your office, uh, because these are critically important issues for the community. And um, I know you and I have had uh, this conversation before, but there, there is a lot of shared purpose and shared values with respect to taking on these issues for, um, for the people that we are serving together. Did, did, I, did we get a response for the number of, of, of overdose deaths and hepatitis C cases if there was an increase? Um, can you tell me uh, exactly what, what you're looking for in terms of an increase in what period? Well, during the pandemic, most of our programs were shut down. And those are the same programs that people rely on to access clean needles and naloxone kits. And they were not able to access those for months because those clinics were all shut down. And only, you know, the only people that were getting service were really people that were using the telehealth as an option. But not not everyone was doing that. So we ha we have had, you know, it was pretty obvious in the community that, you know, there were a lot of people who were displaced who were now sharing needles. And so I wonder, has there been any? Is there any data yet? I asked a few months ago. There still wasn't on whether or not this has, you know resulted in, in a higher number of overdose and test positive HIV and hepatitis cases. Uh, yes, I understand better now. Um, we do have uh, data on overdose deaths from um, the first quarter of 2020. So just as the pandemic was beginning um, and you know that did show uh, an increase compared to prior quarters. And I am very worried about this you know, through the rest of 2020 um, not just for the reasons that you've mentioned in terms of interruption in care and services, but also because uh, we know that it's a national phenomenon that fentanyl is increasing in the drug supply. And that makes um, one, uh, unfortunately, much more prone to a fatal overdose. Um, there are a number of things uh, that have been done to, um, to try to redress that increased risk, uh, including uh, making sure that um, you know, that we're delivering buprenorphine and methadone uh, using um, virtual models, using mobile treatment models for, um, you know, for both medicines as well, uh, and doing the things that we know work to, um, to engage people in services, you know, meeting people where they are, uh, including the HEAT teams that I mentioned, uh, as well as our flexible behavioral health um, intensive treatment models like the intensive mobile treatment teams and others that take on the overlapping issues of homelessness, um, mental illness, and substance use disorders. So those are um, some of the ways in which we have ramped up to try to address uh, the very unique you know, needs during the pandemic. Um, and we will continue to, to follow what the data shows to, um, to figure out what more we can do to address these important issues. I, I appreciate it and I appreciate the time. Um, I yield back to the chair. Thank you very much, Council Member Ayala. Uh, we'll now turn to Council Member Rosenthal for questions. Cousin, Council Member Rosenthal, you can begin when you're prompted. Great, thank time you so much. Now. And um, Commissioner, thanks for giving the committee so much time. You are doing an amazing job, doing an impossible job. So. Um, really appreciate you very much. I actually am calling, uh, asking about um, am I uh, the mental, sorry, the Maternal Health Quality Improvement Network funding. And this was something that uh, uh, the commissioner uh, or the OMB director last year assured us that the continued funding would be in baselined in the budget. So you're shaking your head. I know you know what I'm talking about. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, you're, and Council Member, you're referring specifically to the mat Maternity Hospital Quality Improvement Project. Is that the, the I, Maternal Mortality that, Initiative? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, well, this is, yes, this has been a, you know, a very important um, part of our overall work to address uh, maternal mortality um, because we know that it is an area where there are unacceptable racial inequities uh, in terms of outcomes uh, and some of the most um, tragic you know, inequities that, um, that are born. 
so I do know that um, you know that that uh, the quality improvement work uh, run through that network has evolved uh, over time. Um, and with respect to the funding and exactly what you know the next phase of that work will look like, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Stevens, who is the Deputy Commissioner for Family and Child Health. Thank you. Hi, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, thank you so much for your question about this supremely important work. Um, and while it is a uh, very difficult and tricky work, given the transitions that we are seeing, um, we, we very much are committed to continuing this work. Um, and, um, you know, we, we can say that, that, that funding for this project, we, we do have in the agency for the next year. There is, there is funding. Have it. I couldn't quite hear you. It's in the budget for one year or it's baselined or. We do, I, I do know that we have funding to continue this program. Uh, certainly in the next fiscal year, I can get back to you whether it's baseline for the, the out years after that. Is it city funds or private funds? There are, um, I know that the project in the past has been, you know, you know funded by um, uh, by both. Um, I know that the funding for the next year is certainly some city funds, but I can get back to you uh, with um, a more specific breakdown. So I really would appreciate that. I mean, so what did we get out of the first three years? We got an amazing toolkit that hospitals can now use but it's been made clear to me that it will not get implemented unless funding at the same level is added to the budget, right? Because we only hit three, not only, I mean, it's important to start somewhere, but we hit three hospitals. And, you know, a lot more to go. Um, So uh, look, if this, I, I was assured, Councilmember Gibson was assured that uh, with 12.3 million having been allocated for the past three years, it ends this fiscal year in a couple of months, that, you know, I don't know, divide that by three, $4 million a year and I guess what I would expect to see is $4 million baseline into the budget. And I was assured, as was Councilmember Gibson, that that would be the case. Um, we were assured as recently as our first budget hearing with the director. So it's important. I mean, is there a way to ask some budget person now while you're still here? To just, I mean, it's an easy thing to look up. It's just a U of A or something. Council member, you mean, you mean a colleague from OMB? Well, I mean, I would imagine your agency would have a budget person who knows the answer to this. Time question. has expired. Yes, well, here's what I can tell you, and I, I'll invite our, our Deputy Commissioner for, um, for Finance, Mr. Jara, uh, to chime in if, if he has anything to add. Um, the, the big picture is that we, and hopefully you already know this, but just to state it explicitly, we are, um, we are very committed uh, to this work because we believe in its importance um, with the same uh, depth and urgency um, that you do. Uh, that has to be met with um, with action and ultimately, you know, changes in outcomes as well. Uh, the way that that um, has uh, has been moved forward over the last uh, few years, as Dr. Stevens mentioned, there was a, a private grant um, that resulted in this toolkit uh, that you mentioned, uh, which was a very um, productive process. We actually worked with 14 hospitals, you know, through that quality improvement. Mm collaborative uh, and there, it's a it's a valuable roadmap you know for us to push forward into implementation 
Um, as Dr. Stevens alluded to, we do have um, you know, uh, funding uh, within the agency that allows us to continue this work through FY22. And there are also sources of, of federal funding um, you know, through the CDC, uh, which will support maternal mortality initiatives um, as a whole. So those are the sources that I'm sure. aware of. No, that's Mr. terrific and exciting to hear about. And I mean, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the deputy commissioner. Um, uh, but I want to be clear there. Uh, three hospitals have had intensive maternal mortality review work where each of them have come up with a specific change to how they do business in their hospital and were, you know, expecting that to have meaningful outcome and you'll be tracking that over time. Um, so I, I don't know about the 14, but let's, let's hear about what's in the budget. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, go ahead, uh, Sammy. Yeah, so uh, uh, Sammy Jarrah here. Thank you for the question. Um, I'd just like to confirm, yes, this is funded in the baseline. Um, so you have our assurance that this will continue into the new fiscal year. Um, and we are in close coordination with OMB on this and um, they have assured us of that as well. So this What's project will continue. That's great. What's the dollar amount of city funds? I don't have that at my fingertips, but we can follow up with that. Um, so great, um, you know, it would be terrific, you know, um, I've worked at OMB, usually <laughs> we're the last, uh, to know line by line what, what funding, what money is spent on, but, um, so maybe I should ask OMB when, when they come back? Or do you wanna, is there a way you can get back to us quick to the committee staff quickly? We, we understand the importance of it. Certainly if there is a way to get back while we're still in the hearing, we're, um, we will do that. Uh, if not, council member, we will get back to you. That's correct. We'll follow up uh, and make sure you have the correct dollar amount for what the ongoing funding is, but that it is included in the budget. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Lewis. I really appreciate the extra time and congratulations. This is your second hearing. You're amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, we'll now turn to Council Member Holden. Your time will begin now. Thank you, Chairs, for this important hearing and thank you for all your great work, uh, uh, Commissioner. Um, and I hope you're feeling much, much better. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, you, you've, had, you've done a lot of work and a lot of great work. Uh, I just have a question, quick question. On my, my district, much of my district was in the yellow zone. I brought this up at the last hearing. And I did not have one single site for testing. And I did not have one single site in the early days of the vaccine. Up until recently, I've gotten only vaccine sites that are pharmacists you know pharmacies have it but it's in short supply even at the pharmacy so in in polling my my constituents most of them had to go far and wide especially seniors to get the vaccine if they did get it at all so i'd like to know a criteria and and i still would like to know how this was decided if you look at the map on vaccine finder uh nyc.gov you'll see a giant hole which is my district in queens where there's, where there's very few vaccines, again, only smaller drug stores. So I'd like to know the criteria for setting up vaccine sites or testing sites for that matter, when you're in your yellow zone and you're not, it's not available for testing or vaccine. I'd like to know how that was decided upon, who, who decided the testing sites or, and the vaccine sites. 
Uh, well, thank you for raising this important issue. Um, you know, access is uh, is fundamentally important for our vaccination campaign. Uh, I am proud to say there are over 450 sites uh, across New York City that are now accessible to the general public, and that's been through um, quite a bit of, of effort, you know, in partnership uh, with many people um, to get those stood up from, uh, from less than 100 at the inception of the campaign. Um, you know, with respect to where city sites are placed, uh, a major focus of ours has been um, the 33 neighborhoods that are identified as the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity Neighborhoods. Um, and 77% of all city sites are located in one of those 33 neighborhoods. Um, the final thing that I'll say is that we are working day and night to continue expanding that, you know, for the next phase of our vaccination campaign. Um, so much of it will be in augmenting that capacity and those access points even further with a particular focus on uh, the places where people already seek their care. Um, you know, the pharmacies, as you mentioned, uh, additional community-based clinics, um, doctor's offices. Uh, and so you will see, you know, further additions on the vaccine finder page in the coming weeks as well. All right. But, you know, it's funny, though, that the city agencies like uh, Consumer Affairs descended upon my businesses in my district because we were in a yellow zone. So they descended on them, writing them thousand dollar tickets. Yet the constituents and many of my constituents are seniors. We have a very high senior population in my district, one of the highest um, in, in the state. Yet we weren't included, which I had to beg the mayor's office multiple times, even use my own office as a testing site. Uh, and you know, for two weeks, because I didn't have any testing sites and I was in a yellow zone. It didn't make any sense to just deny people who are most vulnerable seniors and who have are in a yellow zone. So if you're just gonna uh, base it on certain criteria and not on science actually that where the COVID is popping up, then we'll, let's just throw everything out the window. I mean, you have to, I'm sick of being a stepchild in my district for services and we don't get it. If you, again, look at the map, all you have to do is look at the, only maybe Staten Island with, with a, a less population has less sites than in my district. So, you know, this is something I've been, I had to call the mayor's office multiple times. Why did I don't have a testing site? Why don't I'm a yellow zone. You're, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're, you're killing our businesses here by, by finding them. And yet when it comes to services, my constituents are not getting it. And I'm, I'm really tired of it. And I hope that we get some testing sites close because I had people wait online at City Field. I had people have to go to across the city to get a, a vaccine and it shouldn't be and wait in line. It should not be. Um, I originally uh, tried multiple times, even with the vaccine finder, to get a location where I could tell my seniors to, to go. And I couldn't. I couldn't find anything. So now we're getting them, but we're getting, like I said, we're getting, there, there's got to be a better Time system has expired. that we could roll out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Council Member. I'll just say briefly, I, I do hear your concerns um, and I particularly appreciate your advocacy, you know, on behalf of seniors. It's an area where you and I, um, you know, share a common cause because I want to get our seniors vaccinated as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and that has to do with access and, and particularly, you know, accessibility uh, for older New Yorkers. So you have my commitment and we uh, you know, our office will be happy to work with yours um, if there are specific sites uh, in particular that you think would be good testing or vaccination sites. Thank you very much, Council Member Holden. Um, we'll now briefly turn back to Chair Lewis, who I believe has some follow up questions. Thank you so much. I just want to echo some of the concerns uh, Council Member Ayala brought up regarding um, just being oblivious to uh, CBOs that your agencies would be working with to provide a service. I have brought this up, it's going to be about a year now where I've had conversations with commissioners and the agencies and they'll say, oh, we have community-based organizations in your district or in Brooklyn or in the Bronx that provide these services and we're oblivious to it. 
Um, it's frustrating, it's disrespectful, and it has to change. The reason why Councilmember Ayala brings this up is because she's what we would consider a frontline worker. She's going out and collecting syringes off the street. Um, so had there been an organization that we were aware of, or if we're having a conversation from agency to agency and speaking to one another, you wouldn't hear about these frustrations. We can't be in a recovery stage with council members still frustrated. If council member Holden is bringing something up, council member Ayala is bringing something up, we have to change the narrative and we have to get together and work as a unified force. So, you know, I, I heard today and I thank you commission for bringing up the 40 CBOs in New York City uh, that are providing this service. So I just have a quick question regarding the majority um, of funding in DOH MH's uh, division on mental health for contracts. What is the DOH MH process for evaluating contracts um, and ongoing basis? Well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, first on on community based organizations, I I do understand. You know, I hear you, and um, I will just echo that we we consider ourselves members of the same team as all of you. Uh, you know, the the pandemic has just shown that if if there's any um, division or even miscommunication, uh, then you know that gives the virus an advantage over us and. Um, we'll do everything that we can, you know, to ensure that there is uh, more seamless communication around um, around all of the things where we just have a, a lot of um, shared aims with respect to addressing the needs of your constituents and the New Yorkers whom we are serving. Um, with respect to um, evaluating contracts, uh, you and you're asking specifically for the contracts through the Division of Mental Hygiene, is that correct? Correct. Yes. yes. Well, I'll start uh, briefly and then um, turn it over to Dr. Harrison to say a little bit more. This is particularly important, as you likely know, for the Division of Mental Hygiene, because so much of our uh, so many of our resources flow to um, the service providers who are actually taking care of patients and doing the work you know, of addressing uh, mental illness and substance use disorders. So this is an area where, um, you know, our job as uh, stewards of funding and contracts is important, not just from the financial perspective, but, um, but very much from the programmatic perspective as well. So I can tell you, you know, foremost in, in my charge to our team is to ensure that we're working with people who uh, respect the dignity of the people that, that uh, we aim to serve um, and who have a track record that demonstrates that they're actually able to uh, improve outcomes as well. So, um, you know, that's the broad framework that we bring, but, uh, but I'll ask Dr. Harrison to say a little bit more in response to your specific question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for the question. Uh, as, as you just heard from the commissioner, much of the work within the Division of Mental Hygiene is through contracts that we have essentially with community-based organizations, non-for-profits, um, not non non-profit organizations, uh, health and hospital connections as well to carry out the critical service work that we're engaging in. And when we have a contract, um, we first of all are required to follow city procurement rules to enter into a contract with anybody. So we follow the city's policy and procurement PPD rules for, for any time we're entering into um, a new contract with a provider. Once we have that contract, which involves a scope of services um, that we agree on, that has an element of data that usually gets shared back with us, we also are obligated to continue to uh, evaluate the work that goes on in the contracts. And we do that, and we have programmatic staff that are responsible for that. We have auditing staff that are responsible for that as well. As you can imagine, during this pandemic, we had to change how we do that because many of the evaluations had been in person at an agency where we would um, look at records and charts and meet with clients. And we had to pivot how we did that work as well. And we're doing that work virtually where we ask for charts and records and they will you know, sh either share medical records with us or share um, in a safe way 
to protect the privacy. So we continue to um, evaluate programmatically uh, how all of our contracts are doing. And most of our contracts, not all, but a good portion of our contracts are for supportive housing programs. And so that's a, a lot of the work that we have, but we have many, many other program types that we're responsible for as well. And, and I'd be happy to have follow-up conversations with you offline where we can talk about you know, our shared um, values and interests. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, I was gonna ask additional questions, but you just um, answered it, but I just wanted to share before we go to the next member that has a question. Um, I just wanna ensure that the evaluation process um, make sense moving forward, as well as the procurement process uh, being as inclusive as possible. But thank you so much uh, for answering the question. I will turn back to uh, committee council, Sarah Liz. Thank you very much, Chair. And we're gonna very, very briefly turn to council member Rosenthal who has one additional question and then we'll turn to the chairs for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, this is more of a yes, no, like there's no need to go into too much detail about this, but you know, we had the, during, during the pandemic, um, Department of Education set up a program for uh, kids for where they could go on days when they're not in school. It's called um, Bridges to Learning and Learning Leaders, something like that. But we discovered like four or five months ago that actually there were no programs for kids with disabilities. Um, and, you know, and then Department of Education has been working on that. Along that same line have, you know, for kids with disabilities, um, they usually have adaptive furniture that they use at school. Um, and I'm, for some kids with physical disabilities, and I'm wondering whether or not you've been able to make sure those kids have that same adaptive furniture or devices at home. Um, the reason they have them at school is because um, the city pays for them, but the city doesn't pay for them if, if they're at home. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that and I promise not to ask any follow-up questions. Um, well, thank you. I mean, it's such a tangible and important, you know, thing to be concerned about. Um, I will be honest, I, I don't know the answer um, to your question. We can check quickly to see if, if Dr. Stevens does. Um, if not, we can coordinate with our DOE colleagues uh, to get you the answer to that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, thanks, Councilmember Rosenthal. We've been in touch with uh, District 75 office. They, they, are, they are aware of the issue. And as you said, uh, working on it, we are partnering with them, but we don't have um, a set answer in terms of a plan and numbers um, moving forward. But we will, we will circle back and, and stay in touch with them and circle back with you. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. And we'll now turn back to Chair Levine for any closing remarks. Oh, Chair, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, there we go. Apologies. Uh, I want to thank you, Commissioner Chakshi, and your senior leadership team for spending uh, the last two and a half hours uh, with us and for your work throughout this crisis. You heard from a lot of our colleagues concerns about the communities that are falling through the cracks. Uh, this is part of a decades long pattern. It, it preceded this current uh, administration, but nonetheless, it's something that we must address. Uh, we must address it in vaccination. We need more engagement, uh, including informal contractual ways of community groups. We need more vaccination sites on the ground uh, in the communities where uh, vaccination is underrepresented. Uh, we need more outreach of all sorts. I, I know you agree with that, but uh, just wanna add my voice to those expressing urgency on that challenge. Uh, and, and thank you again uh, for the time you spent here and, and for your leadership of the department. 
Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner, and to all the team. Thank you, Chair Levine. And we'll now turn to Chair Lewis for any closing remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who joined us on this joint hearing today, um, with special thanks to the champion and health committee chair, uh, Levine, for joining me today and for having this hearing and all the committee councils and committee staff who worked tirelessly to organize today's hearing. Additionally, I want to thank you, Commissioner uh, Shosky and the DOHMH team for joining us, answering questions and offering an opportunity to partner and further engage with my colleagues and I. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Chair Lewis. And that concludes this panel. We'll now be taking a five minute break before we return for the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. So we'll put five minutes on the clock um, and we ask everyone to make sure they're on mute during that time and we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate the partnership and the leadership. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We'll begin in just a minute here. Thank you all for waiting. Uh, we'll now begin with our second panel, which will be the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And I'll turn briefly to Chair Levine to read some opening remarks. Uh, Chair, we can't hear you. How about now? Yes. Great, sorry about that. Welcome back everyone. Again, I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. I'm pleased that we're joined by the OCME leadership. It's great to see you, Dr. Sampson, and great to be here with my wonderful co-chair in today's hearing, uh, Chair Farrah Lewis. Uh, we are going to be conducting a hearing that will review the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner's $87 billion fiscal 2022 operating budget. We will also address the medical examiner related performance indicators from the fiscal 2021 preliminary mayor's management report. And I, I wanna start by thanking the entire OCME team for what you have done for this city over the past 12 months. I think your team is some of the unsung heroes of this pandemic, having gone through absolutely grueling, grueling work to ensure that our city has been able to deal with the unprecedented number of decedents uh, in a dignified and orderly way. I know this has been tough on your team, so I wanna say thank you. What we've gone through as a city was equivalent to 10 times what the city experienced in 9-11, which itself was considered an unprecedented event. And uh, we're now, we've now surpassed 30,000 people who've passed away in the city. And uh, that has put a tremendous strain on our system for handling our dead. And I, I hope that uh, what comes out of this is, is similar to what happened after 9-11, where we re-examine our systems for dealing with events on this scale, as painful as that is. Uh, there were many advances made post 9-11, OCME adapted in many ways, uh, thankfully, because we were better able to meet the challenge of the COVID pandemic. In a sense, um, our city, as incredible as it may sound, was fortunate that we confronted the worst of the crisis at a moment when, when the rest of the country was not yet at a full-blown crisis. And so that allowed us to absorb a lot of assets and staffing and resources to manage the people who were passing away here from other parts of the country. And if we had gotten hit by the worst at the same moment when the whole country was getting hit, that might not have been possible. And so it's just one more reason why we need to uh, begin to prepare for how we can uh, confront such crisis if and when it happens again. And I do see the fiscal year 2022 budget as the time to start that kind of thinking, uh, to continue to work to respond to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is not yet over, uh, as we still have, I think, about 50 people a day passing away, but uh, also to look forward to the next uh, pandemic and make sure that we learn the lessons of this one and, and have the resources in place to respond if, if heaven forbid, we have another catastrophe on this scale. So I, I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, from our chief medical examiner on the impact of this crisis on OCME, the lessons learned from the pandemic, um, and uh, the ways in which the city will have capacity in place to deal with another such event if it should come to pass. Um, and uh, I want to thank our committee staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing, including policy analyst in Balkan, committee counsels Harbani Ahuja, 
and Sara Liss and financial analyst, Lauren Hunt. And I think I'm passing it back to you, committee counsel, Sara Liss, is that correct? Yes. For the you. affirmation? Okay, great. Chair Levine, and for this panel, we'll be joined by Dr. Bar Dr. Barbara Sampson, Chief Medical Examiner, Dina Maniotis, Executive Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Jason Graham, First Deputy Me Medical Examiner, Robert Van Pelt, Assistant Commissioner of Administration, and Alyssa Gennati, Executive Director of Budget. I will first read the oath, and after I will call on each panelist from the administration to respond. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, nothing but the truth, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Chief Medical Examiner Samson. I do. Thank you. Executive Deputy Commissioner Maniotis. Yes, I do. Thank you. First Deputy Medical Examiner Graham. I do. Assistant Commissioner Van Pelt. Can you hear him? The time will begin. Um, okay. Executive Director Janati. They're not on. She's on. Okay. Uh, we need to come back if we have any questions. Um, okay. Dr. Sampson, you can begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levine, Chair Lewis, and the members of the Health Committee and the Committee on Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. We at the Office of Chief Medical Examiner value your leadership and thank the City Council for its support of our mission to serve the people of New York City during their times of profound need. I am Dr. Barbara Sampson, the Chief Medical Examiner for the City, and my duty is to protect the public health and to serve criminal justice through forensic science. Attending with me are Dina Maniotis, my executive, executive deputy commissioner and Dr. Jason Graham, the first deputy chief medical examiner. As I have said each year during these hearings, my personal mission is to build our medical examiner's office into the ideal forensic institution, independent, unbiased, immune from undue influence and as accurate as humanly possible. This year, more than ever, illustrates why this city needs a strong medical examiner's office, a fact that this city has long embraced. When disaster strikes, we are fully prepared to handle pretty much everything from 9-11, the largest homicide in American history, to the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna join Chair Levine and take this opportunity to publicly recognize every member of my OCME team our entire agency stepped up during this difficult time and poured their hearts into serving the people of New York City. They adapted quickly in real time, tirelessly doing new tasks, all while sustaining our core functions. I have been truly impressed, but not at all surprised by OCME's dedication, inventiveness, and perseverance. The COVID-19 pandemic tragically represents the largest ma mass fatality incident in modern New York City history. Drawing from expertise we developed post 9-11, New York City OCME led the city's response to an unprecedented number of deaths by conducting medical legal investigations as well as serving as the city's mortuary. As the pandemic continues, so does our mission to manage the dead with the respect and dignity they deserve and in the service of our fellow New Yorkers. The OCME was eminently prepared to respond to COVID-19 due to more than a decade of extensive pandemic planning and preparedness. Last March, as we were poised to become the epicenter of the COVID-19 infections and deaths, our agency surged all its forensic physicians, scientists, and technicians into full pandemic response operations to meet the demands of this unprecedented public health emergency. Immediately as the pandemic emergency was declared, the OCME rapidly rolled out four disaster morgues and seamlessly integrated approximately 700 
federal, state, and city interagency resources into our teams to effectively double the personnel of our agency and surge our response capability. By April 2020, at the direction of the mayor, we quickly just constructed a long-term storage disaster morgue to allow families the time they needed to grieve, to make final plans, and to engage funeral homes to affect their wishes for final disposition of their loved ones. We will operate this facility as the pandemic emergency response requires. We continue to support New York City hospitals to manage their deceased patient, patients and mortuary capacity issues by operating expedited and expanded medical examiner transport team retrievals, establishing body collection point operations, and an interagency task force to help run them. During the height of the pandemic in April and May, more than 130 so-called BCPs, body collection points, were de deployed to 55 hospitals and alternate care facilities like the USN Comfort and the Javits Center. To quickly recover, pe recover people who died at home, the OCME established more than 30 interagency recovery teams operating 24 seven to recover and transport decedents from residences and nursing homes. In response to the significant increase of fatalities, the funeral industry responded beyond our expectations. The OCME coordinated with all New York City funeral directors to provide timely information and gather feedback from them to appropriately adjust our operations to best serve the families of the decedents. Through these communications, we gauged funeral director needs and provided resources. The forensic medicine physicians serving as OCME medical examiners have maintained their vital function for New York City throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. In determining cause and manner of death across all sudden, unexpected or violent deaths occurring in New York City, importantly, including deaths at home, the OCME played an early and significant role in diagnosing COVID-19 and helping identify its epidemiologic characteristics as it evolved in our community, the hardest hit in the US, if not the world. As testing became more broadly available, medical examiners tested scores of individuals dying at home or otherwise outside hospital settings, adding confirmed diagnoses to the COVID-19 death toll. During the height of the pandemic, when the OCME was challenged with over 200 deaths, either at home or outside the hospital setting in a given day, that's an approximately eight-fold increase over our normal pre-pandemic conditions. Our medical examiners took the lead directing investigations teams 24-7 to help manage the crisis and assure that families endured the least hardship possible. This was in addition to performing autopsies every day. With the advent of the COVID-19 vaccines, the OCME also immediately began surveillance investigation examination and autopsies in deaths following the administration of the vaccine to help ascertain further information about the vaccine's safety. So far, all very reassuring. While our laboratories were temporarily suspended until June 2020, the laboratory teams were deployed to other roles to assist the pandemic response. Some were assigned to remote work, while many were detailed to various areas within the office to assist with the overwhelming number of decedents in the city. Scientists, technicians, and clerical staff were assigned to communications, disaster mortuary tasks, investigations, and medical legal investigations. When the Forensic Toxicology Laboratory, one of our five labs uh, uh, that suspended its work temporarily during the pandemic, when they reopened in June 2020, there were over 2,500 cases in process or backlog. It was a mammoth task to undertake with limited on-site staff. To date, our staff have made significant headway and completed 83% of all post-mortem cases submitted in 2020. And the lab is on track to close all the remaining cases from 2020 by the end of March, 2021. Additionally, 100% of road traffic and sexual assault cases from 2020 have been closed. 
In 2020, the lab also expanded their opioid testing methods and added a new cocaine testing method as well. During the calendar year 2020, the Forensic Biology Lab, another of our laboratories that was temporarily suspended during our pandemic response, uh, received 12,987 requests for case assignments. This compares to almost 16,000 case assignments in 2019, a decrease of 21%. This decrease is partly related to the citywide lockdown from the pandemic during the spring of 2020. During this period, the laboratory released 12,262 12, 12, reports compared with 16,841 reports in 2019. And in 2020, our molecular genetics lab tested hundreds of cases using an expanded 283 gene panel which targeted uh, various diseases underlying sudden unexpected natural deaths. That testing results, those testing results provided answers to causes of sudden deaths, particularly in young individuals. During the initial OCME pandemic response, the Molecular Genetics Lab suspended its testing operations. And those scientists worked primarily evening and night tours directly supporting medical examiners responding to the increase in home and hospital death investigations. Beyond our role in the pandemic response per se, various OCME physicians were honored to volunteer and help directly administer the COVID-19 vaccine to living patients, which serves to reiterate the fact that although the OCME deals routinely with death, everything we do is for the living. We exist to protect public health, serve criminal justice, and provide answers to families and the community in times of profound need. The need in this past year of the COVID-19 pandemic were never before experienced and we hope will never be experienced again. I wanna turn now to our preliminary budget. The OCME has approximately 759 employees and an operating budget of $87 million, of which $87 million is city tax levy. At this point, I am happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll actually begin with Chair Lewis uh, to ask some questions. Sorry about that. Thank you so much um, for that great testimony. And Chair Co-Chair Levine had to jump off for a few minutes, but I'm going to step in for him um, until he gets back. So uh, a few quick questions. Uh, the first one is in regards to capacity. The pandemic definitely forced New York to face an un expected dilemma where we had more deaths than capacity to store them. And luckily we were able to get support from FEMA and other states around the country. We could have easily not have been so lucky. So I just wanted to know from OCME, uh, what are some lessons you believe your agency learned through this experience? And does OCME feel New York City has the appropriate storage um, capacity? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I want to start by saying that New York City is without doubt the best prepared city in the United States for a mass fatality event. And this goes back to our history with 9-11 uh, even earlier than that, uh, where we learned the importance of planning. And in fact, we had been planning for a pandemic uh, for over a decade. And uh, most recently in 2016, those plans were uh, revised uh, in a number of ways, including accounting for handling of Ebola uh, deaths, which might have occurred uh, at that time uh, in New York City, fortunately uh, did not. Um, but what we learned is how important it is to plan. And while uh, when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic struck, we were prepared. Now, you mentioned our, the, the use of our federal uh, resources uh, and state resources like the National Guard, and indeed, I am forever grateful uh, to their help. 
Um, but we had planned for exactly this. And what brought them into the city was a lot of hard work. And I also want to stress not once they were here, integrating them into our operation uh, was a, a, a great challenge and was only accomplished because of the terrific leadership that I am fortunate to have in uh, mass fatality management, as well as all the areas that were impacted. Uh, in the pandemic. So integrating these resources, and as I mentioned in my testimony, effectively doubling the size of the agency uh, with 700 additional resources, many of which uh, had no previous experience doing the kind of work that we do. That was a monumental task, and it was because we were so well prepared and had planned and trained um, that we were able to do this. Planning and training was also key with our being able to work with hospitals I meant and, and funeral directors. We had actually exercised the pandemic response with them just in December of 2019. So when uh, it, it struck in the spring, um, we were ready with the plans for the body collection points. Uh, the hospitals uh, responded beautifully and knew what to uh, expect, as did the funeral directors. And as I mentioned, I'm simply, you know, um, uh, so pleased by the way that they were able to respond to this absolutely unprecedented situation. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. And it's good to hear that the planning and the training happened in advance of the pandemic because it definitely would have been worse uh, if your agency wasn't ready. So thank you for, for all you do. Just a, a, a quick question, just to follow up on what we're discussing. On a normal year, what percentage of OCME storage is utilized? And what is that total number of, what was the total number of deceased that can be stored all at one time? So uh, in our fixed facilities, uh, we have a, a storage for approximately uh, 1,000 decedents. In uh, pre-pandemic times, uh, the, uh, we ran about uh, at 80 uh, percent capacity. Uh, now, of course, with the pandemic, we uh, ramped up uh, dramatically, and we have sufficient capacity to handle uh, you know, whatever may occur. Is the, the storage facility at Brooklyn Waterfront, is this permanent? Uh, no, it is not permanent. Uh, we established it particularly for the pandemic emergency response, and we will continue operating it uh, during that response as it is needed. And how many uh, descendants are still stored at the waterfront? Uh, there are currently approximately 780 decedents there. And how many deceased are still unclaimed in all of OME's uh, mor mortuaries? So in a, uh, a regular year, uh, the OCME uh, cares for about 10,000 decedents. Uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, particularly the medical examiner cases uh, come in, they are initially unclaimed, but then as uh, our, uh, we make communication with uh, families and uh, loved ones, they quickly become um, uh, uh, identified and they are then ready for pickup by the funeral directors. So in a normal year, about 1,200 of those 10,000 decedents are uh, are uh, sent to a uh, city burial uh, at Hart Island. And of those 1,200, about 60% of them uh, go to city burial because that is the option that their family chose. Uh, and so in about 40% uh, of those cases, they are unclaimed. Uh, and so in a normal year, that's a little bit under 500 uh, unclaimed uh, people uh, per year. Uh, now, to specifically talking this year with regard uh, to the pandemic, uh, I mentioned uh, that in, uh, in long-term storage, we have about 780 people uh, with us currently, and approximately uh, 300 uh, of those uh, are likely to be unclaimed. Okay, and that's that's not the, the amount of folks that are buried at Heart Island for 2020, right? Correct. The number of people buried uh, at Heart Island since the beginning of the pandemic uh, is about 2,000. But remember, the majority of those, uh, we were in communication with families and they uh, wanted their loved one to go to city burial. 
Thank you for that. Um, just a few questions on staffing. Does OCME feel that they have the adequate number of staff for the current fiscal year and fiscal year 22? Uh, yes, we, we do. We are uh, still very busy. Uh, our uh, workload is probably two to three times normal, but we still have uh, sufficient staff. And anytime we do run into a need, we work closely with uh, OMB and we've you know, received everything that we have needed uh, for our pandemic response. And I'm very grateful for that. And are there any positions that OCME has difficulty retaining, recruiting or hiring? Um, the uh, overall, our attrition rate is quite good. Uh, one of the areas where it's, it is more difficult is with our medical legal investigators. These are highly trained people with you know, specific forensic expertise, hard to come by. And also it's a very difficult uh, job. Um, so uh, that is an area where uh, uh, we um, are uh, always looking for uh, uh, good investigators and we work closely with uh, OMB to fill those critical needs when they occur. All right, um, last question, just quickly on overdose as we were transitioning from the previous um, panel. What are the reasons and what are the reasons and the number of overdose deaths that cannot be documented in real time? Uh, so the number of overdose, overdose deaths in New York City has long been a, a very great concern to us with the opioid epidemic pre-pandemic. And we've done a lot of work uh, in this area to increase our ability to know about these cases in real time. Because I entirely agree with you, that is critically important to work with our partners, both in public health and in law enforcement uh, on these uh, important uh, issues. Uh, Dr. Jason Graham, the first deputy chief medical examiner has been leading these efforts for uh, over five years now, and I'd like him to speak to that. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that question. Uh, and following Dr. Sampson's uh, words, we've certainly, we certainly share the concern that was expressed by the health commissioner in the previous panel um, and recognize the importance of real time or as close to real time data around drug overdose fatalities as is possible. Um, in order to confirm that a death is a drug overdose death, that requires uh, toxicology testing, uh, forensic toxicology testing uh, from samples from someone who has died, generally a blood sample. That is complex testing that takes time uh, and must meet all the forensic standards that are required for those test results to stand up in court. Um, and that does take time. Um, the question as to whether or not real-time data is available um, is uh, largely dependent on our investigation of these deaths. And we recognize that uh, we have a lot of information based on investigation up front, and we have started reporting now for roughly five years to our public health and public safety partners around suspected overdose deaths. Um, these are not confirmed. Uh, these are preliminary data, and the health department uh, is the official keeper of the confirmed numbers of overdose fatalities citywide. But we recognize the importance of real-time, actionable data for our partners uh, in the midst of the opioid uh, epidemic that we were suffering from before COVID came along. Thank you, Dr. Graham, uh, for that response. I'm going to turn it back to Committee Council Sarah Liss. Thank you very much, Chair Lewis. And I see that Council Member Rosenthal has a question. So we can turn back to Council Member Rosenthal now. The time will begin. We're just working time. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much. I have a couple of questions um, about capital, but I, but I just want to quickly um, take care of one question, Dr. Sampson, and it's nice to see you and thank you for all your work during this horrible crisis. 
um, but it's about rape, rape kits and um, the issue of timing for how quickly they get back to the NYPD Special Victims Division. And there were a couple of cases recently where one uh, rape kit got back after three days and one was two weeks. Um, I, I could be exaggerating on the two, three weeks, three days. It was just that it like came back soon. And, but the two weeks was like too long um, for this case uh, because they wanted to pick up the perpetrator, which they eventually did. But um, I'm wondering if maybe, you know, this crisis, the pandemic, has affected OCME's ability to quickly turn around rape kits. And also, I'm wondering, is there a way for us to come up with a mechanism whereby we could track a rape kit um, from your office and then knowing that it shows up over at NYPD and the amount of time that elapses. So in other words, when you get a rape kit in, it's filed number one, two, three, four, five, six. And then NYPD would know when they get, you know, kit one, two, three, four, five, six. Do you know what I'm trying to get at? I, I think so. Um, well, let me first say that uh, during the time period that the labs were closed uh, because of the pandemic, we were still open and doing any kind of uh, uh, crime that was affected by uh, uh, that uh, the police told us would affect public safety. So we were not completely shut down. We were doing cases all that time. Uh, now, we are always in uh, communication with the police and the DA's office about uh, prioritizing certain cases. So I'm going to speculate that perhaps one of the, the case that was uh, done quicker might have been ca called into us as a higher priority case than another case. Well, the, uh, okay, I'm glad I would be happy to look into the specifics of those oh, no, two. And I don't really care. I mean, I, it's just, I hear what you're saying, but what, how can we come up with a tracking system? So, and really what I care about is the advocates who call me and say, NYPD is saying they never got a rape kit from OCME, or, you know, there's some of this, you know, let's blame the other person. Um, and same with the DA's office. So, well, certainly we very carefully monitor exactly the timing of when the kit arrives with us and when the testing is complete and when the report is written, which is to us the ultimate, you know, the closure of the case yeah. from the lab point of view, of course. Uh, and so that information is available. We can certainly look into uh, the tracking of the actual kits themselves if that's something that um, or would be a value. Uh, that's not something I think I've, I've considered before, but I'm happy to, to look into it with you. Oh, that'd be great. Sure. So we'll talk about that offline. Awesome. Thank you. And then I do have, thank you for that. I do have a couple of capital related questions that I just want to um, get on the record. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any significant capital projects in the fiscal 2022 preliminary plan that will help build up OCME's infrastructure to handle this similar high demand in the future? Right. The uh, one uh, part uh, that is in the plan has to do with the new uh, pathology center uh, for Manhattan. This is a project that we were actively working on before the uh, pandemic to identify. We we're very close to identifying a, a space for it, working with our deputy mayor. But of course, with the pandemic, our attention entirely shifted. And I look forward to working on that again uh, very soon. Uh, but in the plan for that uh, uh, building is increased storage uh, for uh, decedents. But that said, if we ever, God forbid, experience something like we experienced in the spring, we are going to have to uh, establish again um, a temporary um, uh, sites for, for storage. It's just not feasible. Right, um, right. And um, Chair, may I continue with the capital questions? 
Yes. Thank you. Um, on that line, um, Commissioner, I'm wondering if it would be worth purchasing our own fleet of registered refrigerated trucks. So uh, we actually uh, did purchase, I believe, uh, 62, something like that, trucks uh, during the course of the pandemic. And we will be retaining some of those um, for in the event of another uh, emergency uh, and relinquishing uh, the rest. OK, I um, you may have answered this question already, so forgive me if you just answered this, but what is the status of the new medical examiner facility and is there an updated timeline for completion? Right. As, as I just said, the uh, unfortunately, yeah, no, the uh, the um, we were uh, well into the process of identifying a site. Uh, for the new pathology center in Manhattan, uh, working it. closely with the deputy mayor, and then the pandemic hit, and obviously all our uh, resources turned to that. But I look forward to restarting that, yeah. you know, as soon as as possible. And you know, we will definitely, uh, you know, that's a high my one of my highest priorities after the pandemic. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you're still at an identifying a location? Yes, we Is have not yet. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything at the current location that um, is just too outdated that gets in the way of your successfully completing a task? So, so the building uh, at uh, 521st Avenue is uh, still functional. Uh, and so we there's nothing about it that precludes us from doing what we have to do. And in the event that something catastrophic did take place here, we have plans to be able to relocate to our other facilities temporarily uh, to, to accommodate uh, you know, any kind of emergency that might happen. Okay. And for the new um, facility, will it uh, impact the number of staff you'll need? Uh, no, the staff should be the same in the, in the new facility. The, it basically is going to be, uh, you know, a similar size um, with, like I said, a little bit more storage. Uh, but other than that, I don't think, I mean, we don't need additional personnel um, to accommodate that. Okay, great. I think that's it. And I'm going to take you up on that offer to talk offline. Appreciate Please. it. Of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, another quick question, uh, Dr. Sampson. Uh, what is OCME doing to inform families of descendants about federal and state funding programs, kind of like the FEMA program? Uh, so um, the uh, FEMA program, as I understand it, provides uh, reimbursement to families uh, for burial costs uh, related to those who died in the first wave. So we don't have any in ongoing insight into what is going on with those uh, families at this point. Um, perhaps HRA would uh, know more uh, about that. Uh, but as far as other resources, uh, for example, from the uh, city, uh, we refer any family that, uh, first of all, let me say, we spend a lot of time talking to families at many levels, uh, from the uh, our investigators who go to the scenes, to our medical examiners who explain their findings and answer questions uh, for uh, medical questions for um, uh, families, uh, and in addition with the uh, outreach and identification units to help people through the uh, process of, uh, of uh, working with a funeral director uh, to um, accomplish uh, a, a, final, uh, a final resting place for their loved one. Um, and in that process, if it comes up that uh, it looks like there's a financial issue with regard to burial, we will make that uh, referral to uh, HRA and they take it from to the family to go to HRA and they take it from there. And are there any other barriers to accessing burial services that you want to share with us today? The, uh, you know, certainly the uh, financial barriers are one, and I think that this program with HRA is very effectively um, uh, dealing with that. Um, 
Uh, other than that, you know, when, when we work very personally with every family, so depending on what their situation is, we might make a different type of referral. So, for example, if a person may be uh, a, uh, a, a foreign born, we would work with the consulate uh, or uh, other public uh, um, um, uh, you know, other uh, assistance programs that might be uh, community-based or faith-based, you know, as appropriate. And we have access to, you know, a lot of information about such programs that we share uh, with families. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Um, you mentioned discovery law, so I just want to touch on that yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um, in fiscal 2020, OCME was in the process of adding staff technology and protocols to access new speedy trail and trial and pre-trial uh, discovery reform. So just wanted you to share with us, what is the current status of the expansion to meet this new demand? Yeah. So we, uh, before the pandemic, we were working very hard on that and we uh, did, did uh, accomplish, went quite far in accomplishing, setting up what we are going to need. Uh, for the, to comply with all the discovery laws. Uh, however, during the pandemic, the courts have uh, slowed down significantly, if not, you know, been totally closed. Um, so we, that really hasn't impacted us yet. Uh, so, um, but we are, you know, ready to uh, resume when uh, the courts are resuming, which I think will be shortly. They, I think they will gradually ramp up over the next few months. Right. So, so does the current funding for staff and, tech and technology meet the increased demand? Uh, yes, the, 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 we were funded for new needs the previous year uh, and we've gotten a lot of that into place and we are sufficiently funded uh, at this time to meet what we anticipate will be the demands uh, shortly. Got it, thank you. Um, and Dr. Graham mentioned this earlier, but I, I wanna quickly ask again, OCME's uh, text, Textology and DNA labs were closed for three months. So due to the pandemic for three months. So what was the total number of cases when the lab reopened and where is OCME in the backlog of those cases? Yes, so for the uh, toxicology lab first, uh, the peak in the backlog was about 2,500 cases. Uh, that was last summer. Uh, and now 83% of the 2020 cases have been done totally. And by the end of March, they will entirely be done. So there will be no more, uh, all the 2020 cases will be finalized. That, uh, now I'm speaking about uh, toxicology from autopsies, uh, where the lab is also responsible for um, uh, toxicology testing from uh, road traffic accidents and sexual assaults cases, uh, and those cases have, uh, from 2020, have entirely been closed as well. So they did a tremendous job uh, catching up. Now turning to forensic biology, the backlog, uh, just speaking overall for all crime types, the uh, backlog uh, was approximately 2,000 cases at its peak. Uh, keep in mind, though, that 66% of that is property crimes. We always pri prioritize crimes against people over property. Uh, so uh, it's gonna take us probably a few more months to get back to our pre-pandemic levels and our pre-pandemic turnaround times. Uh, we work closely with uh, the DAs and the NYPD and they have not, uh, they, they are, we keep them informed of our turnaround times and uh, they haven't reported any problems related uh, to this. All right, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll kick it back to committee council, Sarah Lewis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Lewis. And Chair Levine, uh, we'll turn to you now for any questions. Well, thank you for uh, your outstanding uh, line of questioning, Chair Lewis. And it's, I think you have to leave shortly, but I, I'm just grateful to have had a chance to partner with you in this hearing and look forward to many, many more like this. Um, Dr. Simpson, I said in my opening remarks that I just want to reiterate um, my gratitude to you and your team and the agency uh, for what you've done for us over the past year. Uh, I don't know if the public fully appreciates just how difficult um, the jobs uh, that so many of you have done and, and how you've done it with such professionalism. Uh, I've had a chance to, to tour your facilities, to meet your team, to see your team in action. Uh, so I, I feel I can say this with 
with, with some authority. So thank you again for that. Um, I, 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 looking forward, uh, I, I'm wondering what lessons we have learned about the need to rapidly uh, expand capacity to manage uh, our deceased in events such as this and whether we should be expanding um, the amount of cold storage, uh, amount of staffing reserve or, or uh, equipment, trailers, vehicles, and other things that we have on hand so that we can ramp up tw quickly if heaven forbid we face a similar crisis again. Do you feel that um, this crisis has necessitates that kind of expansion in capacity on a permanent basis? I think what uh, this proved to us is how important our planning uh, has been uh, to create a successful uh, um, result that we got uh, from this uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and that planning uh, should definitely continue. The As far as particular resources, uh, we acquired a number of resources during this pandemic. Uh, for example, refrigerated uh, trailers uh, and other related equipment. Some of that we will hang on to so that we will uh, be able to even more quickly respond uh, should there be uh, a, another event that requires such a response. Uh, and uh, some of it uh, we will relinquish. But I think having gone through this, we've really learned how important that uh, uh, planning is and that, that is where we're going to uh, uh, continue to concentrate and working with our partners so that we can, as we did, rapidly expand if we need to. Thank you. Uh, there, there is a growing amount of assistance, financial assistance available to families um, for burial if they don't have the resources for that. And that's extremely important. Uh, but it, it seems that uh, in many cases, families are not aware of programs from FEMA and elsewhere. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about uh, the number of families who are taking advantage of either the city's programs through HRA or other sources of assistance and, and what either your agency or other uh, uh, city agencies are doing to make sure every family knows they have these resources if they need them. Uh, our uh, interaction with families uh, occurs at uh, multiple levels of investigations uh, with the medical examiners and then with our uh, people who uh, work in the identifications area where they work with families over a prolonged period of time uh, often uh, working with them to achieve the uh, final disposition of their loved one. During those conversations, if a, a need for financial assistance comes up, we routinely uh, uh, refer them uh, to HRA so that they can uh, take advantage of uh, the uh, uh, financial assistance uh, through HRA. And then in addition, as we're talking to them, there it may come up that other resources are potentially available. It's all you know, dependent upon uh, what that particular family needs. For example, if a family in, in our discussion turns out to be a veteran, there's a whole a, a slew of opportunities for them there. Uh, if uh, uh, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations. So we try to customize uh, what we recommend uh, to each family uh, as they need it. Um, but we, we work very hard to assure that they have the information that they need. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, last June there was reporting that the health department had been examining uh, officer involved deaths, police officer involved deaths, uh, looking at a more comprehensive set of criteria for classifying deaths as being uh, in some way police involved. Um, and it emerged that um, based on press reports that they were able to find that there were some instances in which um, uh, a New Yorker who died in a police related incident wasn't classified as such. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering now, uh, nine or 10 months later, whether there has been any change in the system for classifying such deaths. I understand that um, your agency uh, might, not, might not determine the protocols, 
but I, I would I'd like to understand if we're still status quo, whether uh, any changes are in the works, uh, and if you could just give us an update on this issue. Of course, yeah. Uh, so um, the medical examiner part of this is very focused uh, on determining the cause and manner of death. Uh, when the death is at the hand of a, a police officer, that uh, does in fact uh, go on the uh, death certificate. We say, uh, for example, in a police involved shooting, that the cause of death is say a gunshot wound to the head, and then we will say, call it a homicide, and then write that shot by police. So it's very obvious on the death certificate. The areas where it gets a little bit more complicated is if the death occurs uh, in say in police custody uh, or it is uh, something like that and the actual fact that they are in custody doesn't play directly into the cause of death. So if, say someone dies of a drug overdose while they are in police custody, that d would, did not, would not necessarily be recorded on the death certificate. However, that information is available in all our uh, 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 data uh, and uh, you know, can certainly be uh, um, categorized and, and followed up. So that's an area I think now that we're after the pandemic now, uh, we should uh, look at again with uh, Department of Health uh, and see if we can be even more transparent uh, with the information exists. It's just a matter of putting it into a, 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 a form that can be easily uh, uh, accessible. Okay, thank you. In, in the past, we've spoken about your challenge in retaining some staff in certain uh, categories because of um, a real salary differential. Um, people, frankly, can just earn a lot more in the private sector or, or at, at voluntary hospitals, for example. And two titles where I, I recall that this has been an issue over the years are the medical legal um, experts and your pathologists. And I wonder if you could give us an update on, on how retention is going in those areas and whether we need to increase the salaries so that we can compete with the, the private employers. Uh, so let me first speak to the um, medical examiners. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, OLR and OMB a few years ago, uh, realizing that there was going to be a crisis here in New York City. There's a nationwide shortage of medical examiners. There's only about 500 medical examiners, board certified medical examiners in the entire United States and 35 of them work here. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of them are my age or uh, older and you know, looking toward retirement. And uh, we wanted to ensure that OCME had a sufficient number of medical examiners and a pipeline to make sure that we had continued a uh, number of medical examiners uh, for the future. Uh, so we did work with, uh, as I said, with OLR and OMB uh, and DC uh, uh, and, and uh, the medical um, examiners uh, union to negotiate a, a raise uh, for them and a retention plan as well, which has worked marvelously. Uh, we ha it bought us the time. First of all, the medical examiners did not leave because we are much more competitive than we were previously. And uh, beyond that, it gave us a chance to expand further our medical examiner training program, our fellowship program, where we basically create our own medical examiners. We train young doctors, young pathologists to become medical examiners. And we uh, increased that program from a historically a number of about four per year to now five or six per year, uh, also using grant funds, I might add, uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, we have a wonderful uh, cadre of young medical examiners now who are very eager to stay on in New York City uh, and uh, serve the people uh, of uh, New York. So that problem, uh, I think for now, uh, is, is uh, in good hands. Uh, the medical legal investigators, we also a few years ago made changes to the uh, title spec exactly of the requirements for medical legal investigators. And that has really helped us. We uh, increased the number of pool of applicants by doing that. And we had some excellent, excellent applicants from all over the country with a lot of experience in death investigation. Uh, and uh, they have uh, joined us. 
unfortunately, it's uh, we have had an attrition in this area recently. You know, it's a very hard job and it's still a very specialized expertise. Uh, and, you know, we are working uh, again with OMB to, to, to try to replace uh, uh, this, this vital resource with us. Thank you. I know you had a good discussion with Chair Lewis on the 780 decedents that are being stored in your Brooklyn facility. Uh, I wonder if there's a certain point at which you will not be able to store them indefinitely and then might um, perhaps either inter them at Hart Island or look for another long-term solution? Uh, yes, the the, um, the storage uh, in Brooklyn is a part of our pandemic response, and we will keep it uh, as long as it is uh, necessary. Uh, but eventually, yes, those the decedents who are there who are unclaimed uh, will eventually go to City Barrier. Can you speculate on the timing of that? Uh, I think that would be uh, uh, very unwise given uh, what's going on in the city. You know, with the, uh, uh, I, you know, I remain eternally optimistic, but we prepare always for the worst. With the variants that have been uh, identified, you know, I'm not sure uh, um, in what direction we are going right now. The number of uh, cases, you know, has been going down. The deaths have pretty much plateaued at a, at a higher level than we saw pre-pandemic. Uh, and, and so uh, I think there's still too many variables to be able to give a timeline for that. And, and am I right, Dr. Simpson, that pre-pandemic we saw about 225 deaths on a normal day on, on average? Um, and, and would we be at about 275 or 300 today? Could you give us a... Uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, we're at about, you know, give or take anywhere. I think it's, uh, I, I don't have the latest right in front of me, but we're a, ranging between 60 to 100 COVID-related deaths or possible, uh, yeah. you know, depending on the day of the week. <laughs> and uh, and then the number of uh, out-of-hospital uh, fatalities that we're seeing is also much higher than normal. So on normal pre-pandemic, we had about 25 per day and it you know during the pandemic was much much higher than that recently it was more around 50 per day and fortunately that has been trending down but it's still higher uh than uh it was you know it's I, now I, in yeah. yes if i if i recall at the peak of the spring uh when we were just in the worst of the crisis there were well over 200 people who were passing away at home yeah. or outside of outside of a hospital setting which of course is was 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 very very disturbing um uh as compared to 25 a day normally and you're it sounds like you're you're telling us that it's about 50 a day or so now which is much uh, less much less uh and and more recently it's trending downward so in the last few days it's been you know in the, the 30s or 40s but and you know, it still hasn't come down back to baseline but would that difference still be attributed to covid deaths or maybe uh people who just couldn't access medical care because we're still in somewhat of a crisis situation, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, those they they um, any case that comes to us, uh, whether it is a medical examiner case or just for claim, you know, we're holding basically the body until the family makes their uh, decision. If there's any uh, history of a possible COVID type illness, we are testing that, so we will know about those. Uh, um, uh, if those are COVID related or not, but my sense is that there, uh, it's still, there's still a baseline of uh, deaths from other causes um, in that group. And can you tell us, Dr. Sampson, about any change in the number of deaths we're seeing out of nursing homes? One would hope that with vaccination, there's been a dramatic drop there. Do you have numbers on that or even an estimate? Uh, no, you know, we really don't because nursing home fatalities don't fall under our jurisdiction. They're in general, they are natural deaths and our role with the nursing homes during the pandemic was simply to uh, help them with uh, decedent management. Most nursing homes have no morgue space or very little morgue space because routinely they don't need it. When someone passes, a funeral director goes to the nursing home, picks it up, doesn't involve us whatsoever. Uh, during the pandemic, of course, they needed our assistance for uh, fatality management and we did uh, pick up a, an increased number of decedents uh, from uh, nursing homes, but that has, um, you know, decreased dramatically. So we have no insight into those kinds of numbers. 
And and similarly, can you offer an estimate on the change or increase in the number of overdose deaths? Uh, yes, I'm going to uh, uh, refer that to uh, Dr. Jason Graham, who is our uh, been we from the beginning of uh, since before the pandemic, we've been very concerned about overdose deaths in New York City with the uh, um, opioid epidemic. Uh, And we put into place uh, um, things that we could do to help inform our partners in real time about uh, overdose deaths, not waiting for the final toxicology reports. Uh, And Dr. Graham will speak to that. Yes, thank you for that uh, question, uh, Chairman Levine. The, um, The procedure Dr. Sampson was referring to providing real-time information is around suspected overdose deaths. Uh, To get confirmed final uh, drug overdose death data, we have to wait for toxicology results to come back to determine what drugs are involved and in what levels. And those official numbers are kept by the health department uh, when they become available. But we, again, recognize the need for this real-time data. We've been following suspected drug overdose data for going on five years now. And we've seen that our suspected overdose data follows very closely with what is ultimately confirmed drug overdose uh, death data. And so uh, while, as the commissioner mentioned, there was a, in the first quarter of 2020, uh, uh, an increase, uh, we've seen variability in the number of drug overdose deaths during the height of the pandemic with a slight decrease, but then uh, a return uh, to some level of increase toward the latter part of this year. And again, this is preliminary information. This is based on suspected overdose data, uh, suspected drug overdose uh, cases that have to be confirmed with the appropriate toxicology testing. And that's data that will come later from the health department. We'll be anxious to follow that number um, from the public health perspective. Uh, There's a lot of alarm over just the inability to deliver adequate services to people who are struggling with addiction and a lot of other factors that we think contribute to an increase in overdoses. So we'll be watching that data closely. Uh, and, and finally, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sampson on the Capitol front, you're in a very old building. I, I, I forget when it was built, but um, uh, I mean, it's gotta be, what is that from the sixties or something? Maybe even before. Yep, I think uh, so. Uh, and it may have been state of the art at that point, but I think it's, it's a real challenge for you now. What are the plans uh, and, and to what extent is it in the, the capital plan to um, modernize or replace uh, that fairly outdated building? So as you know, with the replacement of the uh, or finding a new pathology center has been very important to me. And we were working very closely with our deputy mayor uh, before the pandemic uh, in settling on a, uh, a site um, for uh, the new building. Uh, and unfortunately, the pandemic uh, prevented us from going any further at that point as we turned all our attention to that. And I look forward to uh, working again uh, on this project uh, with the deputy mayor. Uh, as far as funding uh, is concerned, I, I know uh, I've, uh, we have a commitment uh, for you know uh, a new pathology center, and I look forward to working further on that. Do, do you know how much that's budgeted for in the capital plan? Right now, the, it's, it, there's just a placeholder in there for, I think, a half, uh, half a million dollars, something like that. Half a billion, <laughs> maybe? Or half a billion? <laughs> I, I wish I could say a billion. Uh, no, that's just a placeholder. Clearly, that is Got not. Got it. Uh, okay, well, this is extremely important, uh, particularly, as I mentioned before, as we envision shoring up our system for future disasters. Uh, We'll continue to fight for you, both on the budget front and on on the siting front. Uh, I think this is really important to the future of the city uh, to get this one done. So um, thank you. That That's all my questions. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Sampson, and to your, to your leadership team and, and to the agency for the, the work that you continue to do. Thank you so much. Then I'll pass it back to our committee council. Thank you, Chair Levine. Um, And I believe Council Member Rosenthal has a question, so we'll turn to her now. Your time will begin. 
Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Um, I just realized that I have to ask you this question, um, Dr. Simpson, and I neglected to ask it before. Um, what did you think of the daily podcast about the lonely case of George Bell? Have you heard it? I... I don't, if I had it, a long, it's a while ago. How long ago did it come yeah, out? This, just this week. Just um, this week. Oh, no, I haven't had, I've been preparing oh my goodness. for this. I haven't heard it. I would love to. Yeah, you have to listen to it. It's okay. on the daily. On the daily, and, okay. And I think it makes OCME look pretty good. Oh, well, thank you for that. And I look forward to, I'll do it right after this hearing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, council member. And we'll turn back to Chair Levine to give any closing remarks for this panel. That was some tough questioning, Chair Rosenthal. Woo, my goodness. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't really have any other uh, comments to say other than um, just my commitment to continue to work with OCME uh, to get through this pandemic, which is not yet over, though we're making great progress and to stabilize and ultimately strengthen our system for managing um, those who we lose in future crisis. So thank you again um, for being here today and, and for all your work for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine. And that concludes the administration second panel. Um, everyone is, is welcome to hang around and we will turn to the public panel now. We so appreciate everyone's patience over the last few hours. Um, every member of the public will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce before you begin your testimony. And the first panel of the public will be Jeff Oceans, Emily Frankel, Laura Jean Hawkins, Michael Devoli, and Greg Mihalovich. Um, so Jeff, you can begin as soon as the host unmutes you and the sergeant cues you. Okay, great. Is it okay to begin now? Your yeah, time will yeah, begin. Okay, now. got it. Okay, great. Greetings, my name is Jeff Oceans, president of local 3005, DC 37, Ask Me. I represent around a thousand members between the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and OCME. With regards to the DOHMH budget, I see it has gone up by $51 million when compared to fiscal year 21's adopted budget. I come before you today to testify with two options slash opportunities on how we can work together to hopefully reduce the budget moving forward. Approximately nine years ago, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was relocated from various city owned properties to where it is today in Long Island City, known as To Gotham. And it happens to be a leased property. Approximately three and a half years ago, many of my members were relocated to the City Bank building, also located in Long Island City, which is a leased property. Then, over the last 18 months or so, these same members were again relocated to a leased building a few blocks away while still in Long Island City to a building or to a property more commonly known as the factory. Why is it necessary to still have my members consistently shifted from privately owned properties when we as a collective should have stayed in city owned property managed by DCAS from the get-go. Now, on the flip side, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, a majority of my members, when feasible, have been working remotely. During this one year, we proved that working remotely can be achieved and it can be done safely. Please consider, as a, please consider it an experiment that did work. If we can continue to allow our members to work remotely, this over time should continue to save the city money. I look forward to working with the agency to explore the possibilities on making this happen. Now, on the other side of the coin, we have to deal with OCME. Knowing that OCME's budget has decreased by $3.4 million as compared to fiscal year 21, 
adopted budget, I have one concern regarding the members that I represent within, which are the criminalists. With many of the courts reopening, I would appreciate assurances from OCME that the criminalists I represent there are not going to be overworked, assigned extra cases, or be given unexpected quotas to meet the high demand. After all, Dr. Sims, Dr. Sampson did say, did testify that the number of cases had increased. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the ability to testify. Please stay safe and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Emily Frankel. Starting Emily. time. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today. I'm Emily Frankel, the Government Affairs Manager for Nurse Family Partnership. NFP is an evidence-based home visiting program that partners low-income, first-time pregnant women with a registered nurse from early in pregnancy through the child's second birthday. NFP nurses help clients achieve healthier pregnancies and births, stronger child development, and a path towards economic self-sufficiency. I come before you today on behalf of 129 NFP nurses and the nearly 3,000 New York City families they serve to urge the New York City Council to maintain NFP's $4 million in baseline funding in the FY22 preliminary budget. This funding is even more critical today given the impact of the pandemic on New York City and the multitude of cuts facing NFP in the governor's executive budget. New York City is home to the largest urban implementation of NFP in the country. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene directly provides NFP services, as well as contracts with Public Health Solutions, SEO Family of Services, and the Visiting Nurse Service of New York to deliver NFP across the city. NFP's baseline funding in the city budget goes to support these programs. We thank the New York City Council, the Office of the Mayor, and DOHMH for this funding. At the height of the pandemic, many NFP nurses were unable to receive excuse me, many NFP moms were unable to receive routine prenatal and postpartum care due to the closure of medical clinics. Through regular telehealth visits, NFP nurses were able to conduct clinical screenings and assessments, identify and monitor medical complications and help their clients get the health care that they needed. Coupled with the demands of COVID-19, NFP programs were hamstrung by a 20% withhold on state government contracts, which forced our programs to institute hiring freezes for nurse positions. This occurred at a time when many NFP nurses were on the front lines of the pandemic, assisting the city with COVID testing and contact tracing, while also providing NFP to families. NFP nurses support the very populations that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Despite this fact, the governor has proposed a 20% cut to NFP state funding from three to $2.4 million, which would result in less families being served. New York City's NFP also faces an additional cut through the governor's 20% cut to the Community Optional Preventive Services Program, or COPS. The governor's combined cuts to NFP's line item and to COPS would lead to workforce reductions of at least six nurse home visitors for DOHMH and at least 150 low-income families would no lo longer receive this program. The New York City Council's help in maintaining funding for NFP is needed now more than ever. Please maintain the mayor's baseline funds of $4 million in the FY22 preliminary budget. Your ongoing support of NFP is greatly appreciated by the 3,000 families who depend on NFP nurses. I'm expired. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Laura Jean Hawkins. You may begin when the sergeant cues you. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chairs Levine and Chairs Lewis. Um, my name is Laura Jean Hawkins. I am the advisory board chair of Astoria Queen Sharing and Caring, uh, also known as Sharing and Caring. I am here on behalf of our board and on behalf of our president and founder, Anna Krill. Uh, after 27 years of survivorship, last year, Anna was diagnosed with a second primary case of breast cancer. She actually had surgery last year and underwent chemotherapy, which she just finished uh, last month. So uh, she's doing well. Uh, she sends her regret. She also sends her extreme thanks to the council for all of their support through the years. Uh, Anna and I and our board 
uh, as I said, are very thankful for the council's support. Uh, I'm here today to urge continued funding of the council's cancer services initiative and our funding under that initiative. Last year, the world shifted, especially for vulnerable populations, including people living with cancer, those undergoing treatment, their families and their caregivers. Not only was that population very fearful and filled with anxiety about what would COVID mean to their health? Would they die? How sick would they get? They also then had to deal with you know, the economic and social impact that they felt based on our city and our state's response to COVID-19. So you had people now fearful for their health, isolating at home, and in some cases now losing their job or their primary breadwinner lost their job and they had to face you know, economic uncertainty. As a result, our small community-based organization, Sharing and Caring, witnessed a 25% increase in the demand for our services, specifically the need for individual and group counseling and for emergent needs assistance. People were coming to us for help with their rent, medical bills, diagnostic testing bills, pharmaceutical bills, utilities, and even food. So with our limited resources, we have provided those emergency needs. We've also increased our outreach in uh, to vulnerable populations. We've been providing socially distant, safe, uh, peer-led support groups at our office, as well as virtual support groups led by our clinical social worker, who has also undergone one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling via the telephone or Zoom to those that need it. That need has continued to present day. While all this is happening, of course, all of our traditional fundraising efforts were on hold because we couldn't gather in person. So with that said, I would like to thank you for your support. Please urge the continued funding of the Cancer Services Initiative and please continue to support sharing and caring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Michael DeVoli. Starting time. Chair Levine, Chair Lewis, distinguished committee members, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael DeVoli. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, ACSGAN. Uh, while the COVID-19 uh, pandemic continues to grip the nation, over 40,000 new cases of cancer uh, will be uh, diagnosed here in New York City in 2021 and over 12,000 New Yorkers will lose their lives to cancer. Uh, cancer patients have long faced significant barriers to accessing care and COVID-19 has magnified those, very, uh, those barriers. To reinforce New York City's commitment to the fight against cancer, uh, ACS CAN is recommending the following be addressed in the city budget. First of all, New York City needs to maintain its current commitment of $1.6 million to the DOHMH Cancer Prevention and Control Program. Uh, this funding will allow the DOHMH uh, to focus on getting cancer prevention and early detection screenings uh, to those who need them the most, like uh, what the, the previous um, uh, um, panelists have mentioned. Uh, the city council also needs to renew its $1 million cancer initiative commitment. This critical funding goes out to community partners doing incredible work to ensure uh, that New Yorkers uh, have access to those screenings, especially in underserved communities. Uh, these programs ensure that all men and women who lack health insurance have access to free cancer screenings. These efforts have never been more important. Uh, the pandemic has led to thousands of mostly low-income New Yorkers losing their health insurance. Secondly, it is critical that New York City step up its effort to curb tobacco use. Uh, not only have uh, not only has an, there been an overall decline in smoking rates leveling off in recent years, many New Yorkers have once again picked up smoking during the pandemic. Uh, these trends are especially troubling given the connection between severe illness from COVID-19 and being a, and someone being a current or former smoker. So as part of the budget, New York City should maintain its current $7.2 million in funding for the DOHMH's tobacco control program. Uh, these funds are critical to the DOHMH's efforts to prevent kids from starting smoking in the first place and help kids quit, uh, help adults quit. Finally, 
um, we are calling upon New York City to once and for all end the sale of menthol cigarettes. Uh, ending the sale of menthol cigarettes will contribute to uh, further reducing smoking rates, especially in communities of color, and contribute to a reduction in tobacco-related health expenditures, which are paid for by taxpayers. Uh, as part of any effort to end the sale of menthol cigarettes, uh, we do call upon the City Council in New York City to reform the enforcement of all tobacco laws to ensure that they do Time not have uh, consequences. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Greg Mihalovich. Starting time. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine, uh, Chair Lewis, and the members of New York City Council. I'm Greg Mihalovich, Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Uh, at AHA, we believe that everybody deserves an opportunity for a full and healthy life, and in order to accomplish that uh, we have to identify and remove uh, social and systemic barriers uh, to good health. Uh, and the written testimony is going to go into a lot more detail, but I'm going to touch on a couple of points. Uh, food insecurity. Um, unfortunately, nearly 1.6 million New Yorkers, uh, one in five, are facing food insecurity. And while SNAP helps reduce food insecurity, SNAP Uh, healthy food incentive programs help people with a lower mortality rate and actually shopping for your own produce helps instill healthy habits that result in better long-term health outcomes. Now, New York City has a couple of SNAP incentive programs. We have health bucks at farmer's markets. We have get the good stuff at a handful of supermarkets, uh, pharmacy to farm, but they're limited and they don't reach everyone who would benefit for them. And frankly, they're underfunded. Uh, we understand how difficult the coming budget negotiation is going to be, but we ask that you find a way to significantly increase the funding for these programs because expanding the reach and the impact of these initiatives will have significant short and long-term health benefits for residents in New York City. Uh, telehealth. Because of the pandemic, many New Yorkers have turned to telehealth to meet their medical needs, but there are still barriers for many New Yorkers. Uh, obviously, there's the financial question of being able to have a device or afford internet service fees. Uh, and if you have hearing loss, impaired vision, or language barriers, you're going to struggle even more accessing the service. And these barriers underscore the importance of access to self-monitoring devices like blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, thermometers, because having those self-monitoring devices helps someone who's feeling unwell determine when they need to seek that in-person care um, if, they, if they're struggling with uh, telehealth. And by investing in self-monitoring devices, to provide to community partners, FQHCs, health systems, clinics, community uh, community uh, organizations for distribution to those in need, essential care can be provided remotely to medically under underserved populations. Uh, saying a lot of the stats, but yeah, we also support uh, increasing funding for tobacco cessation and nicotine cessation for a, a lot of the same reasons. Uh, so thank you for everything you have done and will do to protect the lives and the health of New York. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much to this panel. Um, and as a reminder to council members, you can use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions at all. Uh, we'll now turn to our next panel which will include. Can I just make a quick, a quick comment, uh, Sara? I mean, this, this was such a great panel and uh, I wish we had time for uh, a, a lot of Q&A with all of you. Um, I wanna thank President Oceans for raising up these questions about facilities and siting at DOHMH, which we will take up uh, with the agency. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, Emily, I wanna thank you for speaking up on the Nurse Family Partnership. It's such a critical program. And I'm really appalled at the prospect of cuts coming on the state. So know, know that you have my um, support in the fight to, to maintain funding for this really, really uh, critical program. And to our friends at, at the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, um, you know, I'm, I'm very worried about what the, the toll is going to be on diseases beyond COVID coming out of this pandemic. I don't think we've ad adequately grappled with that yet. 
um, because of the ways that people didn't have access to normal services, even uh, like non-COVID related, whether it's primary care, uh, cancer treatment, uh, smoking cessation programs. Um, I mean, there was a while in there where even getting a heart stent put in was difficult because uh, elective procedures were, were slowed or stopped. And, and that's real. And I don't think we've grappled with the toll yet, um, but I think we have to pivot to make up for lost time um, on all of those fronts. And I just want, want you to know that, that, that I, I see that and want to work with you to make sure that um, we repair the damage to the broader public health efforts that um, undoubtedly took a blow because of this uh, last pandemic year. So uh, thank you very much to this great panel. Really appreciate you staying and speaking out. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Chair Levine, and thank you to this panel. Our next panel will include Anthony Feliciano, San Gon Chun, Juan Pinzon, Hali Yi, Man Yuk Yu, Saba Nassim, and Yuna Yoon. Anthony Feliciano, you can begin as soon as you're ready. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. Thank you, chairs of the council members of both the Health and Mental Health and Disability in Addition Committees. Um, we're part of the one of four leads for the Access Health NYC. Uh, it's an initiative that funds community-based organizations and FQACs to provide education, outreach, and assistance to all New Yorkers about how to access healthcare and coverage. We're coming to you because we want a restoration of 2.5 million funding for this fiscal um, year, but we may be asking for more given that there is opportunities through the stimulus dollars of significant money pumping billions of dollars into the city and the state. Given the situation with COVID, we need to pull together and address um, this pandemic and programs like Access of NYC is critically important in terms of accessing care. I, I do wanna mention that we uh, also, I've heard that in the one house bills in the state that the article, there is a rejection to the article six public health funding. I'm glad that we've been advocating with 150 organizations from the Safe New York Public Health Campaign, but it does not mean we stop here. We have to continue advocating for Article 6 funding for New York City, as we know it's a discriminatory cut. Um, but also, we have this is a cut of 10% on top of the 20% we received last fiscal year. So while is a rest, while is a rejection to that cut we still lose 20%. And so we still need the city to cover that in the backfill. Um, and you, as we know, there are many organizations providing a, a set of preventive services for a set of vulnerable New Yorkers and marginalized New Yorkers. I also wanna be able to address that we need to have uh, um, a bunch of other things around the backfill. We wanna make sure that our community-based organizations are able to have the capacity to do what they do in terms of addressing the pandemic, but going beyond that. In my testimony, there's a set of contract reforms that we need to be asked, um, particularly being paid on time as community-based organizations, reducing barriers to accessing resources, a safer and friendlier environment for a community-based organization, particularly Black and Indigenous and people of color led organizations who are discouraged by the challenging discretionary funding process sometimes, but excluded because of their challenging approaches and practices of just of fighting back against racist policies and treatment. Um, we also want to see if you can develop an equity assessment in all city expenditures and spending, including discretion and city agency funding, to see how ERCO was being distributed, to have CBOs to shape the policies and the investments that are in New York. We also are thinking about a public health infrastructure fund to strengthen the pandemic recovery efforts. Um, I don't know if we are aware, but it's been very quiet. The mayor had proposed a pandemic center, and the EDC and the Department of Health released an RFI that sought input from public health experts and CBOs and stakeholders. And the deadline was January 19th. I would like a halt to that uh, as an organization because we believe public funds should not go to private sources. We have an issue with the pandemic and being located at NYU, Langone as a proposal. And then we believe this must be more led into community-led efforts to the community. And I wanna add to track this proportionality, look at language access and data as we're looking at the COVID response. And that we really need to talk about defund NYPD in a much more critical way. 
um, current funds are not being poured back in, being poured back into structures and programs that foster racism and segregation. And we want to really truly defund the NYPD for it goes back into communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be San Gun Chun. You may begin when ready. Starting time. My name is Sangin Chen, and I'm the Senior Manager of Health Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you, chairs and council members of both the health and mental health, disabilities, and addiction communities for calling this hearing and for the opportunity to testify today. I want to talk about the New York Immigration's top priority, the City Council-funded Access Health NYC initiative. It has been one year since COVID-19 has swept our nation, and we have seen the devastating impact that this pandemic has had on our low income, immigrants, people of color, and other resource limited communities in New York City. The Biden administration has begun to unravel and undo the damage of the previous administration, most recently with the public charge rule being permanently blocked nationwide. These long overdue damages underscores the critical role of the CBOs to effectively communicate rapid and ongoing changes to our communities. Access Health NYC is designed to fill this exact need. We are hearing concerning stories from our members about the growing mental health needs of immigrants in New York City, especially with the dramatic increase in anti-Asian racism. This is something I have experienced firsthand as I have been repeatedly told to go back to where I came from and when my 80 year old father was attacked by a group of teenagers blaming him for this pandemic last March he is now afraid to go to his vaccine appointment in fear of another attack. This incident reminded me yet again of, a, of the devastating impact that anti-Asian racism has on our immigrant communities and the critical role that programs like Access Health NYC play in providing support from trusted organizations during this time of heightened stress and anxiety. This year, we are advocating for an expansion of Access Health NYC to at least 2.5 million or more due, the, due to the federal stimulus bill. We need to redo, restore this funding. The, the need to restore this funding is made even more evident by this ongoing pandemic. We need to ensure the funding gets restored to programs like Access Health NYC, which empowers reliable CBOs to provide culturally competent and accurate information to ensure that all New Yorkers understand their rights to healthcare coverage and services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Juan Pinzon. Juan, you can begin when you're Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Lewis and uh, Councilman Holden for sticking around. Uh, my name is Juan Pinzon. I'm the Director of Health Campaigns and Government Engagement at the Community Service Society. CSS is a uh, a uh, nonprofit dedicated to fighting poverty and our health programs help New Yorkers enroll into health insurance and access the healthcare system through a life answer headline and a partnership with over 50 community-based organizations throughout the state. Uh, we serve about 300,000 New Yorkers every year, saving them over $60 million in healthcare costs. In this testimony, uh, merging the city council to increase funding for the New York City Man Managed Care Consumer Assistance Program which is part of the Access Health, Health NYC initiative to $750,000 in the FY22 budget. We believe that the new Federal American Recovery Act funding provides the city with um, a, a good opportunity to expand programs like MACAP and Access Health that provide a lifeline for uh, those uh, who are struggling to access the coverage and the care that they need during and beyond the pandem pandemic. Um, MACAP is a partnership of 12 community-based organizations supported by CSS. Uh, we provide services in over 15 languages and at 15 different locations across all five boroughs. Uh, we train the advocates to help people understand their insurance, resolve health insurance problems, get medical services, access affordable care for those who are uninsured, and also address social determinants of health, which has been really important during pan the pandemic. Um, the program was launched in February 2020. And since then we have served over 3000 clients who have struggled to secure uh, their coverage or access care during the pandemic, uh, obtaining a favorable outcome for them in 90% of the cases. We need a program like MACAP to address the health inequities exposed by the pandemic and help New Yorkers deal with the rising healthcare prices and uh, complex healthcare system that create 
additional barriers to care. But we also need an expanded version of MACA because there will be thousands of New Yorkers who will also need our help this year navigating and accessing enhanced financial assistance that will be available to purchase affordable care act coverage through the marketplace and cover premium support that will be available under the new stimulus bill. And in addition, the New York State Legislature is poised to provide a special one-time insurance coverage program for undocumented immigrants who uh, were affected by COVID-19. And, and these immigrants will uh, also need our help understanding eligibility for this program and accessing this program. So this is where a program like MACAP uh, can make a big uh, difference because of its community-based approach that can provide culturally and linguistically competent guidance remove barriers to care and improve access to affordable care. Um, finally, MACAP also stands ready to help the city begin its paths towards an inclusive post-pandemic recovery by serving as a trusted advocate that can provide uh, reliable information Time to expired. marginalized communities of color about COVID-19 vaccine distribution, safety, and effectiveness. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you. And committee council, if I could just, just jump in for one second. And I'm um, excited to hear the rest of the panel and to share thoughts on some of these important topics. We have a uh, very prominent labor leader who I think we're about to lose to another event, uh, Donald Nesbitt, who's the executive vice president of Local 372. Uh, if I could ask uh, just a little flexibility from this current panel, and if we'd be okay with committee council, can we ask uh, executive vice president Nesbitt to offer some testimony now? Not a problem. We can turn okay. to as soon as you're ready to testify, you can begin. Starting time. Oh, I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, committee members, uh, committee chairs, uh, Lewis and uh, Levine, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, my name is Donald Nesbitt, Executive Vice President for Local 372, New York City Board of Ed employees uh, out of DC 37, um, asked me. I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the 270 SAPIS um, who work in New York City schools um, under the leadership of this union of President Sean D. Francois I. SAPIS councils have historically received city funding um, under President uh, Francois's administration through a dollar for dollar match with the state legislature. We are here today to request that the city maintain this critical partnership with the state to support SAPIS in our schools. Our students are fa facing a mental health crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a recent CDC report, the proportion of, of children's mental health related uh, visits to emergency departments have skyrocketed since April 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic and many other aspects of students' life. The CDC report concluded that it is critical to minors, monitor children's mental health, promote coping and resilience and expand access to services to, to, to support uh, children's mental health. And the SAPIS program is just that. Since 1971, SAPIS have provided essential social emotional strategies and services to help youth remain learning ready. The SAPIS program is established certified service that is sponsored by the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports to provide evidence-based programs, presentations, groups, and individual counseling and, and positive alternatives to New York City public school students. We can honestly and proudly state that SAPIS counselors are already um, trained and ready to respond to the COVID-19 mental health crisis. SAPIS have always been proactive in providing students and their families with the tools to navigate the myriad of, uh, of personal and peer pressures that can derail healthy academic, social, and individual development. Local 372 has long testified at this panel about the devastating effects of cuts to the SAPIS program and the loss of nearly 200 SAPIS counselors since uh, 2006. Now more than ever, there's simply not enough SAPIS today to address the needs of all of our at-risk children and their families. To this end, the Department of Education is currently prioritizing our existing SAPIS assets or shrimps to meet the increased demand for more so socioeconomic learning curricula 
turning instead of less effective and more costly alternatives. The, the 2021 Mental Health and Wellbeing Plan that the mayor and the I'm chancellor You're okay, Donald. You you can continue. Okay, thank you. I'll wrap it up quickly. Um, uh, the city needs to prioritize and invest in expanding the existing SAPIS program. SAPIS make on average approximately fifty thousand a year, plus forty nine percent in fringe benefits to hire a single SAPIS. It is estimated that every individual SAPIS counselor can directly reach approximately 500 at-risk students. With this fact in mind, it simply makes no sense to not invest in SAPIS. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic shutdown um, has ravaged our communities last spring, and it appears that the city failed to include the traditional SAPIS funding in, it, in its budget. It is now our understanding that last year funded has been included though it is unclear to us where the budget, this budget line is itemized and thus whether the allocation already exists. Local 372's goal is to once again partner with the city council in making a smart investment towards the quality of life for both New York students, their families and communities at large. Even in the midst of this pandemic, it remains our shared responsibility to ensure that our students uh, meet and exceed their potential Without SAPIS, we are robbing struggling students of the opportunity to a quality, competitive education and ultimately their futures. Again, thank you for this opportunity. I appear to you on behalf of uh, all of the local 372 New York City Board of Education employees, our SAPIS counselors. Um, I, I thank you, Chairs, for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, uh, Vice President Nesbitt. And we know you have to run. I'll just say that uh, SAPIS workers are some of the most important professionals in our schools. They're going to be needed now more than ever because of all the social emotional challenges that young people are facing post pandemic. And this is the moment to, uh, to seek to restore the staffing to the level that it was before this dev devastating cuts of recent years. And uh, you have my commitment to work with you in, in that fight. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next panelist will be Hallie Yi. You can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Your time will begin now. Thanks. My name is Hallie Yi. I'm the health policy coordinator for the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. We are the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Families Advocacy Organization, leading the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support marginalized Asian Pacific American children and families. The APA population comprises over 15% of New York City, yet our needs are often overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted as we're constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth and the perpetual foreigner stereotypes that prevent our needs from being acknowledged, understood, or addressed. This means our communities, as well as the organizations that serve them, often lack the resources to provide critical services for those in need. We are also one of four leads for Access Health New York City, an initiative that funds community-based organizations and federally qualified health centers provide education, outreach, and assistance to all New Yorkers about how to access healthcare and coverage. Right now, as the city continues to face COVID-19 pandemic, we are unfortunately witnessing the shortcomings in our healthcare and other safety net systems. Already marginalized communities are disproportionately hard hit by the impacts. On top of facing job loss and poverty, many families remain underinsured or uninsured, undocumented and ineligible for unemployment or the federal, federal stimulus for individuals. The pandemic came on the back of federal changes to public charge rule that even though it has been overturned recently, had caused fears and threatened healthcare access for many immigrant families and we still see the effect today. Additionally, New York State seems on the verge of once again cutting Article 6 matching funds for critical public health programs in New York City. It is now more critical than ever that the city restore Access Health New York City to $2.5 million and continue to support community-based nonprofit organizations that fill the gap and provide critical cultural, culturally competent and linguistically accessible health outreach and education services. Last year, the city was also able to... Um, fill in the losses from Article 6 cuts at the state level, and the governor's fiscal year 2022 executive budget cuts from Article 6 go from 20% to 
while we are um, pleased that our advocacy efforts led to Article 6 being rejected from the current one house bills in the state legislature, we still need to advocate for full restoration to the, 30, the original 36% for New York City. We request that the city again provide any and all backfill necessary to make public health programs like Access Health whole again. New Yorkers must be able to continue to receive the health services and information that they need during these difficult times. Thank you for your dedication and service to the city, especially now during these times. We hope that you're staying safe and as well as possible and look forward to continuing to be a resource for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Man Yuk Yu. You can begin when you're prompted. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Manya Yu, Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, otherwise known as AMPS. Thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Lewis, for the opportunity to testify. AMPS is a not for profit healthcare organization in Sunset Park that works to bridge the health equity gap among communities of color by providing free clinical screenings and bilingual mental health therapy, integrated with individualized health education and social services to immigrant populations of New York City, free of cost regardless of immigration status. We work primarily with undocumented immigrants who suffer high risk of chronic infections and behavioral health issues due to their lack of health insurance. During COVID-19, our work has become more important than ever before, reaching over 400,000 people through our outreach and education efforts. Our community health workers offer interpretation in Spanish, Arabic, and three Chinese dialects to help community members navigate our healthcare and social assistance systems. Every month we're holding in-language workshops and distributing thousands of pieces of literature to community members throughout their our canvassing and weekly food distribution events and poster at over 700 businesses. And since March, we've distributed over 100,000 pieces of PPE. Now we're helping 300 to 350 people make appointments for COVID-19 vaccinations every single week. We would like to thank the city council for a historical support of our funding through the immigrant, um, the immigrant health initiative. And I, but I would like to urge the city council to restore and expand the immigrant health initiative and mental health services for vulnerable populations to support this work. In particular, advocate, advocating for funding to restore uh, state article six funds. The governor's budget cuts translates to uh, $35 million or more in lost funding to support essential public health programs. Other New York counties remain at 36%. So this is a New York City specific cut that we have been one of the hardest hit cities from COVID-19. And cuts to funding over the past year have been detrimental while demand for services have tripled. Many of our staff are stretched thin and unfortunately we have not been able to hire new staff to meet the demand. What has been a mental health stressor in the past, in the past has now been exacerbated by COVID-19 as well. For people who are working from home, implementing boundaries and maintaining work-life balance is difficult. Unemployment and lack of work has created financial hurdles and fear of eviction. Families with a history of domestic violence are now facing more tension. Children are feeling more isolated because of the inability to socialize and parents are bearing the responsibility of being an educator, caretaker and breadwinner. This is especially, this is especially difficult for single parents. And community members experience heightened level of anxiety and depression with the loss of loved ones and financial security. And finally, our Asian communities are feeling the stress of racism and harassment every day when they ride the subway going to work. We have a waiting list of nearly 100 individuals seeking support from our free mental health services, which we cannot beat, which we cannot meet by our current funding levels. We are one of few organizations I'm offering just... services, and the need is high. While we budgeted for two additional bilingual therapists this year, the reduced funding means that we could not hire them. It has been particularly difficult to hire therapists who speak Chinese and Arabic as a result of limited funding, not to mention the outreach we must uh, do to combat the mental health stigma. We can only afford to hire part-time therapists at this time, but many therapists are seeking full-time opportunities. And currently, the Mental Health for Vulnerable Populations Initiative only supports mental health services in one Asian serving organization. And in addition to, um, and, and we, in addition to a number of other organizations doing this work have not been funded. Furthermore, the city's vaccine outreach has been less than equitable and it is organizations like ours that are closing this gap. Immigrant communities average about 22% vaccine uptake um, to date compared to about 70% in some majority white communities. The Upper West Side community with half of Sunset Park's population density has vaccinated 30% more people than Sunset Park. 
We're working with the health and hospitals to coordinate vaccine blocks for immigrants, community members, connecting 300 to 350 people to vaccines every week. Many who tell us we are the first organization through which they have been able to get connected to vaccine in their own, vaccines in their own language. We have served at the vaccine navigation pop-up site, but we are not funded to do any of this work through test and trace, even though there, our staff spends over 60 hours per week um, conducting outreach and canvassing. And we are asked to seek subcontract opportunities with a few T2 funded organizations who do not have an obligation to partner with any other groups. We need to replicate the census funding model to sustain the work for nonprofits who are meeting community needs on the ground using a more accessible RFP and contract process. I humbly thank the city council for supporting organizations like AMS working on providing on the ground culturally competent services during this challenging time. We look forward to working together to ensure that healthcare is not a privilege, but a basic human right. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Saba Nassim. You can begin when prompted. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Saba Nassim and I am the Assistant Director of SUPNA NYC. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Since 2008, SUPNA is the only CBO in the Bronx that offers linguistically accessible and culturally attuned programming and services to the pan-South Asian community in Bangla, Saliti, Hindi, and Urdu. SUPNA has spent over a decade building trust in our community. All of our staff and management are South Asian women, many of whom are immigrants themselves. When the pandemic hit New York City and devastated our working class South Asian immigrant community, they turned to us for direction and help. From the very beginning of the pandemic, SUPNA has been creating materials in-house around COVID-19 and related policies and disseminating them to the community in ways we know will reach them immediately. When we learned that 95% of our community reported unemployment and that they were afraid they wouldn't be able to afford rent or groceries, SUPNA started a culturally appropriate food pantry that serves fresh produce and pantry staples familiar to our community. And again, now they are coming to us for questions about the vaccine, to share hesitancy or confusion, and to get help making appointments. City outreach simply hasn't effectively reached our community and the lack of English proficiency in digital literacy and access has made it difficult for many community members to get appointments on their own. This pandemic and its impact on our community have also exacerbated mental health issues. Citywide, there is a lack of culturally competent and linguistically accessible mental health services, especially for the South Asian immigrant community. SUPNA is the only CBO in the Bronx offering mental health counseling in Bengali and Hindi, free of cost and without insurance requirements. SUPNA's mental health program is designed specifically for South Asian communities, taking into account the stigma associated with mental health, historical trauma, and culture combining both traditional and non-traditional methods of healing. Imagine being a new immigrant isolated in your home with minimum social networks and suffering from depression. For many immigrant women in our community, this is a reality. They come to SUPNA to recreate networks, access classes and services, and join our women's circle where they can share their challenges and experiences in a safe place with a facilitator who can understand their struggles in a cultural, political, and historical context. We ask the state and city to invest resources in funding in trusted CBOs like SUPNA and other Asian Pacific American CBOs that are on the front line reaching the most marginalized communities. It is these CBOs that understand the daily struggle of the community and it is Time these has expired. CBOs that are running programs specifically designed for the community they serve. We also ask the city to increase funding of citywide initiatives, including digital inclusion and literacy, mental health services for vulnerable populations, enhance access health and um, emergency food. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Yuna Yoon. You can begin when prompted. The time will begin now. Thank you members of the committee, council members Levine and Lewis for this opportunity to testify. I found myself nodding throughout this hearing regarding the need to fight against cuts to funding, 
when the mental health crisis is worsening. So I'm here to urge you to support our budget priorities for restoring mental health services for vulnerable populations to 3.2 million. My name is Yuna Yoon. I'm a social worker and assistant director of an Article 31 clinic at Korean Community Services. A significant percentage have some form of Medicaid or Medicare varying monthly, but in the 90s. Over 70% of our clients receive services in Korean, many of the remaining 30% a mix of Korean and English. Language access and a sense of familiarity rooted in culture is critical, especially in light of ongoing racially motivated attacks, for instance, targeting Asian seniors. Distrust of police, fear of what could happen, and a sense of disconnect from government agencies is all too common due to limited exposure, except perhaps what is on the news. Instead, seniors have to stay in their homes and limit themselves to going to places they're familiar with to feel safe. There is a collective trauma and a global mental health crisis, but compounding that with this perpetual sense that you are seen as the one to be blamed and that to guarantee your safety, you can only stay at home takes a tremendous mental health toll. KCS offers homebound meals and staff have tried to teach seniors how to use Zoom so they can listen to mental health workshops, which we did recently, and sign up for telemental health services. But it is logistically difficult and often not sustainable. And as the city continues to open, we need to come up with better solutions, which requires funding. As mentioned earlier in this hearing, these times have also taken a special toll on young adults. And we have um, seen the impact during such a critical time in their lives when schools can only provide a certain amount of support when it comes to mental health. This incredible need is why our dedicated staff work at our clinic, which strives to uphold the policy that anyone with a mental health need must be seen with a focus on providing culturally and language accessible care in spite of the limited budget and our reliance on outside supporters such as government agencies to sustain ourselves. I therefore strongly urge you again to support the 15% and growing campaign and our budget priorities around restoring mental health services for vulnerable populations to 3.2 million to make the care provided more equitable. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. Um, I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any council member questions. Well, not really a question, but I just want to thank the organizations, which we've just heard from. When we talk about the need to tackle inequality in the wake of this pandemic, we're going to be relying on the work that all of you are doing. There is no one better positioned who's out there with cultural competency, who speaks the languages of this city, who has the trust of communities that have been marginalized. And so it would be outrageous if you sustain cuts right now, after all the lip service, everyone's paying to health equity. And uh, it's why we're standing up against Article 6 cuts, which I know uh, would impact many of you. And I'm not sure if the 340B cuts impact any on this panel, but of course, we're fighting uh, on that front as well. Um, and uh, some of the initiatives that support you out of the council, um, such as Access Health, or Juan, you mentioned the CAPS, but these really are going to be more important than ever. We just have to do everything possible to get marginalized New Yorkers into the healthcare system. And we're going to have to rely on CBOs to do it. So you definitely have my commitment as chair of the health committee to fight for these funding streams, to fight against the, these terrible cuts, and to fight to, um, to renew and, if possible, expand uh, some of the city council initiatives, which I, I think are so important to the communities that you serve. So thank you for this panel. Really appreciate you staying to speak, to get on the record. And most importantly, thanks for the work you do. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we'll now cue the next panel, which will include Nadia Kator, Chris Walzer, Ben Dorman, Doug Warren, Faith Beham, Dr. Rebecca Capasso, Paul Lee, and Reed Vreeland. Uh, we'll begin with Nadia Kator. As soon as you are prompted, you may begin. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today because this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. I am a mother of three kids and I live in Prospect Leffert's Garden. In my neighborhood, 
it's very difficult to find fresh food. My kids would walk and be confronted with junk food everywhere. This is something that always bothered me. But when COVID hit, it bothered me even more. I would not understand why the messages from the government were never, at no point we ever talked about nutrition and how to protect our immune system with fresh food. I would like to pinpoint that the links between diet and health are very well known. We know that populations that eat a so-called Western diet made of processed foods and meat, added fat and sugar, refined grains, lots of everything but fresh food, fresh vegetables, fruits and grains and whole grains. We also know that obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, all of these are connected to our diet. Now, the good news is that it could be reverted. It can be reversed by good fresh vegetables and fruits. Now, I would like you, I'm here today to support a nonprofit called Seeds in the Middle. Uh, I discovered them recently and I absolutely love the work they do with young people, young kids in school. They teach them how to eat and how to take care of their own health. Uh, this nonprofit, has a goal to open eight new farmers markets in, local, in communities uh, of low income. Uh, one of them would be in a few blocks away from my home, and that would be a great addition to our neighborhoods. Kids would finally be able to walk and have a different approach of what food means. I'm always wondering what is the message we would like to pass on to our kids? What is the message we would like to tell them about the food that we are presenting them with. Seeds in the Middle is asking for an amount of, I think, 150,000. And this will allow people to get free coupons to choose their food and not be giving a box uh, made of processed food. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Chris Walzer. You can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Good afternoon from the Bronx. I'm Dr. Chris Walzer, Executive Director of Health at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Thank you, Chairs Levine and Lewis and committee members for this opportunity to testify today. The Wildlife Conservation Society, which includes our flagship Bronx Zoo, the New York Aquarium, Central Park Zoo, Prospect Park Zoo, and Queens Zoo, saves wildlife and wild places across uh, worldwide through science, conservation, action, education, and inspiring people to value nature. COVID-19 and the resultant shutdown have taken a devastating toll on all New Yorkers, as we have seen throughout this entire hearing today. Despite the shutdown, however, WCS has provided free access to virtual programming to thousands of New Yorkers. Online programs provide a lifeline for kids stuck at home and seniors struggling with isolation. We know that neighborhoods with robust cultural centers and access to natural spaces have amongst others better outcomes across education, aging, and youth caught in the criminal justice system. In addition to the Bronx Zoo serving as a staging area for COVID response and testing, WCS has also been working to address the COVID crisis globally by extending our decades long research on the origin of zoonotic diseases and supporting decision makers and policy to help prevent future pandemics. The majority of emerging infectious diseases, as you know, are of zoonotic or origin. Two thirds of those spill over from wildlife to humans. The more often we force conditions that increase direct contact between wildlife and humans across damaged ecosystems and in industrial live wildlife markets for human consumption, the higher the likelihood of another spillover event. As the COVID-19 vaccines roll out, we mustn't fool ourselves into complacency, unfortunately. As it has been estimated that there are some 700,000 viruses with zoonotic potential as yet undiscovered. Today, urgent action must be taken to retain the essential health links between humans, wildlife, domesticated animals, plants, and all of nature. As we build back, we need to recognize and value the foundational health benefits of intact and functioning nature while my mainstreaming one health approaches across all sectors and most importantly, into all policies. As the council determines its budget priorities for FY22, 
we ask that the cultural affairs budget be maintained at FY21 levels. Funding for culture will not only help New Yorkers endure and climb out of this crisis, it will continue to support the work of cultural institutions like WCS. In addition, I hope that the City Council will consider a resolution in support of current federal pandemic prevention legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Ben Dorman. Ben, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the committee and uh, the chairs and the city council. Uh, my name is Ben Dorman. I'm the executive vice president for local 1102 of the RWDSU. Um, my uh, local union represents the workers at animal care centers of uh, New York City. Um, our employees have been considered essential throughout the pandemic from the onset of the pandemic um, and are responsible for caring for over 20,000 animals in need uh, in our city in our five boroughs uh, over the course of a year. Um, they do this work because they love uh, the animals they care for. Uh, they know that it's an essential service for the city. Um, however, uh, the work can at times be challenging and is uh, as um, we have seen throughout the pandemic, uh, an area that is sometimes under-resourced. Um, in 2019, ACC Animal Care Center signed a 34 year contract with the city. Um, and under this contract, they have the responsibility of caring for any animals they come across um, that would uh, come under their care. Uh, in doing so, they can't um, make any excuse or any uh, carve out. So they've had to ramp up infrastructure and ramp up their um, coverage across all five boroughs. Um, as I said, they were uh, our, our workers and our members have been essential employees, essential workers from the onset of the pandemic. Um, and uh, with that in mind, um, I, I think it would um, grieve everybody to hear that they have only received the cost of living adjustment increase um, over the past few years. Um, all of those factors in mind, uh, ACC has experienced um, irregularly high employee turnover. Um, and in tandem with that, uh, as you can imagine, uh, extremely low employee morale. Um, and we've seen that manifest in a variety of ways. Uh, to put it in numbers, the, the normal um, amount of employees is about 285. They're operating now at about 228 uh, with about 40 open positions. Um, and as you can imagine, the budget shortfalls are um, leading to inadequate staffing um, and, and other factors that are leading to lesser ability to provide care. Um, one other additional dynamic is during the pandemic, we all saw, saw um, heartwarming stories of increased adoptions throughout the city and people taking on the burden um, by bringing animals into their homes. We do expect that dynamic to go the other way as soon as things um, go back a little more to normal as people go back to their offices, kids go back to school and families have less opportunity to uh, do that great deed of taking in an animal. So that burden is only going to extend uh, for ACC and for our members, uh, their employees. So um, with that in mind, our ask is that the committee and the council uh, keep this essential workforce in mind uh, for budgetary reasons and make sure that they, um, uh, their essential service to the city is reflected in um, how, how we address their, their budget needs uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next panelist will be Doug Warren. Doug, you can begin when the sergeant prompts you. The time will begin now. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in today's panel. My name is Doug Warren. I am the director of clinical practice at Project Renewal, which is a New York City homeless service nonprofit agency. Each year, Project Renewal serves about 15,000 New Yorkers through our comprehensive services focused on health, homes, and jobs. In each of our shelter, housing, and workforce development programs, we offer wraparound support for those living with serious mental illness, developmental disabilities, and substance use disorders. Our mental health programs include psychiatry and telepsychiatry, substance abuse treatment, peer-led recovery, and rapid em employment program for those with serious mental illness, and our support and connection center in East Harlem, 
which provides stabilization and treatment services for homeless adults with mental health and substance use needs. We're especially grateful for the City Council and DMH for their support in our service. And I especially thank Council Member Ayala for her foundational support for our Support and Connection Center. With its proven approach to delivery, stabilizing services to New Yorkers who need them most, the center is precisely the type of program that the council should continue to support. We are honored to give members of this committee a tour so you could learn more about the services that we provide. Most of the people that we serve across our programs are clinically very complex. Nearly all of our clients have experienced some level of trauma, whether it be by homelessness, incarceration, addiction, abuse, poverty, or other adverse experiences. And this is why Project Renewal's mental health services incorporates innovative wraparound support from addiction to mental health services. We provide medication-based interventions, practical skills development through occupational therapy, and all of our programs address trauma and help people attain functional well-being for sustained independence. But the isolation and stress that the pandemic has magnified our clients' needs. And with mental health challenges on the rise across New York, we are seeing an overwhelming demand for our services. Project Renewal's mental health and substance abuse programs have long been a lifeline for New Yorkers in need, offering much needed predictability, stabilization, and safety. But the demand for our services has grown enormously and our resources are strained from the structural challenges that have diminished public behavioral health care, as well as the severe impact of the epidemic. As director of clinical practice, I see this firsthand. The time has expired. When we ask our mental health workers who are frontline and essential workers and who has soldiered on heroically to do more with less. And so I'm here to ask the city council to ensure that resources are available to meet the growing needs created by the pandemic, as well as to restore cuts in fiscal year 21 to the council's mental health initiatives. We strongly support the committee's work and we value our partnerships with the city. And we look forward to continuing to work harder to serve the most underserved of New Yorkers. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Faith Beham. You can begin when you're queued. The time will begin now. Thank you, Chairpersons Levine, Lewis, and members of the Committees on Health and Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Faith Bayham, and I am an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, UJA's network of nonprofits have worked closely with the communities they serve, connecting children, youth, families, and senior citizens with the supports and services they needed to, to live through an incredibly difficult time. UJA urges the city council and administration to make the following investments in the fiscal year 22 budget in order to support the work of UJA's network of nonprofits. First, we are asking to restore and baseline the indirect cost rate. I provide additional details about the cuts to the indirect cost rate in my testimony. But something I do wanna highlight is that across the UJA provider network alone, there is a combined fiscal year 20 loss of $2.3 million for the ICR. The ICR funds important aspects of human services provision, which are needed now more than ever to help New York City respond and recover from COVID-19. The city must restore the fiscal year 20 ICR cuts, fully fund fiscal year 21 rates, and baseline the full cost of ICR funds for fiscal year 22 and the out years. Our nonprofits also receive funding through a number of mental health initiatives. Seven of UJA's nonprofits receive funding through the Autism Awareness Initiative. This funding allows our nonprofit partners to provide wraparound services to autistic children and youth in after school, weekend, and summer programs. 
It also supports training for parents, guardians, and caregivers of children diagnosed with autism. In March 2020, providers transitioned services to virtual platforms. Those who provided trainings and support groups to parents, guardians, and caregivers saw an increased need for these groups. Due to the need to quarantine and social distance, many parents, guardians, and caregivers became totally responsible for the 24-7 care of the individuals with autism who live with them. Support groups became very popular, allowing for these individuals to virtually meet with others who were experiencing similar situations, as well as learn new skills on how to support the individuals they were caring for. During the past year, the after-school program funded by the Autism Awareness Initiative transitioned to a combination of virtual and in-person offerings, while summer programs were in-person with reduced capacity. Providers worked with the communities they served to understand if individuals were more comfortable with in-person, virtual, or a combination of both types of programming, and families appreciate the flexibility. We're urging the City Council to maintain funding for the Autism Awareness Initiative at 3.2 million, I'm thanking you for the time to testify today. Details about UJA's others, a mental health initiative ask are included in the testimony I will be submitting. Thank you very much. And our next panelist will be Dr. Rebecca Capasso. You can begin when you're ready. Good time, we'll begin now. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Lewis and Chair Ravine. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dr. Rebecca Capasso. I am the Medical Director of Psychiatry at Project Renewal, a New York, a New York City Homeless Service a nonprofit agency. Earlier, you heard from my colleague, Doug Warren, about Project Renewal's Health, Homes, and Jobs program, um, including our range of mental health services. We are really grateful to the New York City Council and the New York City Department of health and mental hygiene for their support for project renewal services. Since the onset of the pandemic, the demand for our mental health services and our substance use services have never been higher. As you've heard from multiple panel members throughout this evening, it's, it's pretty much the same story. Today, I wanted to tell you about our telepsychiatry program, which we quickly scaled up in response to the pandemic so that we could give thousands of our clients uninterrupted mental health and substance use disorder care while still remaining remote and protecting them from the risks of COVID-19. We trained all of our psychiatric providers to deliver, to, to deliver care via telepsychiatry. Um, we installed telehealth stations in our transitional housing programs and in our shelter-based Article 28 clinics. Um, and we ensured that all of our clients had access to computers, iPads, and Wi-Fi so they could continue receiving care while, while maintaining social distancing. Um, as a result, uh, our clients, especially those in the shelter, uh, noted that they had better access to their psychiatric services than even before the pandemic. We've seen a 5% increase total in our access to mental health care since, since the pandemic started. In addition, we are keeping clients out of the emergency room for their mental health crises at an even better rate than before the pandemic. Um, so during the pandemic, our shelter and housing programs have reported 36 fewer ER visits and 12% uh, fewer hospitalizations compared to the 12 month period prior to the pandemic. Um, so as we work to provide mental health care for a population whose need for our services is swiftly rising, telepsychiatry is gonna remain a critical tool and we will need the support from the city council to continue implementing this efficient and effective method of care in the future. Um, much like others, the city council, we're asking that you ensure that the New York, Sardi, New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene has the resources it needs to meet the growing need created by the pandemic and restore the cuts made to the fiscal year 21 to the council's mental health initiatives. Um, Project Renewal strongly supports the Committee on Health and Mental Health and values our role in partnering with their mission. And we really look forward to working with you more with the committees and welcome suggestions for how we can partner more in the future. I really appreciate the time to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next panelist will be Paul Lee. You can begin when you're prompted. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. Uh, first off, thank you to the members of the Committee on Health and other committees gathered here today for allowing us to testify. 
Uh, I also wanted to thank and acknowledge you for all the hard work you've done on behalf of the entire city during this pandemic. Uh, my name is Paul Lee. I'm a project coordinator from Korean Community Services in Metropolitan New York. Um, as you know, the importance of organizations like KCS and others at this meeting have increased due to the unprecedented challenge and impact of COVID-19. In addition to the shocking and increasing number of hate crimes against members of the Asian American community, many of those we serve have also been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. Uh, despite the model minority myth of Asian Americans is largely successful and not in need of support, almost 26% of our community lives in poverty, 78% are foreign born, and many are impacted by high rates of lim limited English proficiency. Uh, Asian Americans are also the fastest growing ethnic group in New York City. Uh, I'd just like to share one story involving a patient of ours who has chronic hepatitis B and was able to receive life-saving care through the viral hepatitis initiative. Uh, while this patient was aware of their condition, he did not seek care due to his lack of insurance for almost three years. Uh, as you may or may not know, chronic hepatitis B is a lifelong disease that attacks the liver. Uh, without regular medication and follow-up, hep B can lead to cirrhosis or liver cancer. After approaching KCS for assistance, we were promptly able to link this individual to critical care and also enroll them into health insurance. Uh, he was subsequently diagnosed with liver cancer and most fortunately was able to receive a liver transplant. Uh, this patient is now reg regularly taking medication and receiving regular follow-up. This was only made possible through the City Council's Viral Hepatitis Initiative, which helped KCS to save this man's life. Uh, we are here to advocate today on behalf of patients like whose story I just shared and for the over 330,000 individuals in the city who are estimated to have hepatitis B and C, uh, the vast majority of whom are unaware of their condition. Uh, accordingly, for FY22, we are asking the mayor to increase his commitment to eliminate hep B and C in NYC, and we encourage the administration and the DOHMH to work with the community providers to create and implement a plan to eliminate hepatitis B and C in New York City. We are also asking council to sustain level funding to the viral hepatitis initiative, which is one of the most innovative and effective treatment prevention and education initiatives for hep B and C in the nation. We are also grateful to the council for its inspiring national leadership with its viral hepatitis initiative. Uh, lastly, we also urge the members of the council to contact your counterparts in the state assembly and Senate to not allow Ge Governor Como to cut Article 6 funding, uh, funding rates in New York City. The governor's budget proposes single out New York City and cut our public health matching funds from 20 to 10%, as you know. For every other locality, the public health funds matching rate is 36%. The proposed cut will take more than 38 million out of the New York City public health programs. Please sound the alarm for if your st state counterparts and try to get this funding restored or help backfill this vital funding uh, if these cuts are pushed through by the governor. Once again, thank you for your time and allowing me to share this testimony with you all. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to Reed Freeland for his testimony. Reed. The time will begin. Hello, thank you so much to council member, uh, to chair uh, Levine and chair Lewis today. It's been quite an, an endurance uh, test. Um, my name is Reed Vreeland. Um, I'm director of New York City Community Mobilization at Housing Works. Um, I was very struck by something that um, commissioner uh, Chalk, she said um, at the beginning, which is you don't turn off the water on a fire truck w during a blazing inferno. So what's happening right now in our city is truly a blazing inferno. And at the state level, the governor Cuomo is trying to cut health funding, um, both through the Medicaid pharmacy carve out to 340B providers like Housing Works and FQHCs. Um, and through Article 6 um, and other, other ways. So I urge, urge, urge the council um, to take serious action on Article 6 and um, on uh, Council Member Levine's Resolution 1529 um, to oppose the Medicaid pharmacy carve out. In addition, I want to uh, really emphasize the need for continuing to fund uh, the New York City plan to end the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, this uh, initiative, the city council initiative um, and the mayor's uh, funding toward ending the epidemic have been extremely successful in decreasing new HIV infections by 25% um, since 2015. Um, we are now encountering, you know, coming out of COVID when people are going to be vaccinated, what I think will likely be a summer of love and contact 
and a lot of, of uh, people wanting to be with each other. And it's essential for the city right now to have to support uh, public health programs, especially um, sexual health and, and wellness programs um, to make sure that the city's sexual health clinics are operational this spring and summer and people are getting access to HIV prevention um, and other, other prevention tools. Um, I also want to emphasize the need to continue level funding for the city's viral hepatitis initiative. Um, the city council um, and your um, viral hepatitis, uh, you know, hepatitis B and C initiative are truly a model for the whole nation, as, as Paul Lee said. Um, and this program um, will be, would even be better if we have a citywide um, viral hepatitis elimination plan, which I think we should try to get in the next year. But level funding is, is essential. Um, in addition, we need to uh, increase funding for overdose prevention in the city, as, as we heard about earlier. Um, I also want to bring attention to something um, that is happening in this year's uh, administrative budget, which is the, the merger of several um, different bureaus within DOHMH into one syndemic mega bureau. So it's the merger of division of HIV, viral hepatitis, and STIs into one single bureau. So we want to make sure the council has oversight into that process, what's getting cut, what's happening, and make sure it's really communicated to the community as well, because um, we need to, to really be in contact on this. So I urge um, the council's action and, and continuing to fund these vital initiatives, and I thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. Uh, and I'll once again, just pause briefly for any council member questions. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Committee Council, am I coming through okay? My computer is glitching a little bit. You sound great, thank you. Okay, great. When this was another incredible panel, um, Reed, I just wanna thank what you for what you have done personally and what Housing Works has done to stand up for vulnerable people in this pandemic and uh, just add my voice to yours in denouncing any threat of a funding cut to the organizations which are out there saving lives amongst vulnerable people in New York City right now. I also really like the commissioner's analogy and I'm gonna be using it uh, and we're gonna fight really hard on that front. And I do also appreciate you mentioning some of the council initiatives, what we're doing on viral hepatitis, which I didn't actually know is considered a national model. So that's great, um, but we're gonna be fighting for it. I also fear that we've taken a step backwards after the past year because um, a lot of the systems to support um, people struggling or vulnerable to hepatitis have been disrupted. And so we have a lot of work to make up and this would be a moment to double down on that investment. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether our representative from uh, RWDSU 1102, Mr. Foreman is still here, but I just wanna validate what he said about how tough it's been to work at ACC over the past year. These have been very tight conditions essential jobs, and a lot of people have gotten sick. In fact, they had to close down the Manhattan Animal Shelter because the entire staff, this was only a few weeks ago, was either out sick with COVID or out uh, quarantining. Uh, thank goodness they now have uh, eligibility for the vaccination, but there needs to be more resources for adequate pay for that workforce. Um, and, and to... Uh, want to make sure I get the name right, uh, Chris Walzer, I think, who spoke from the New York Wildlife Fund. I don't know if you're still on, but I did really appreciate your comments about the need to uh, invest more in understanding how disease is transmitted between humans and animals. It would be really naive to think that that will never happen again. Um, so we need to understand that mechanism and the funding for research needs to be there. So, um, and finally, to our friends at UJA, um, UJA uh, Faith is just such an incredible force in the city uh, for communities of all backgrounds and has always particularly shown up in the health and mental health uh, arenas. And so you know, we're grateful for what UJA does and thank you for speaking out on those budget priorities today. 
Uh, thanks again to this whole panel, another great discussion. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Chair Levine. Uh, and we'll next call up the next panel, which will be Ju Han, Jane Wong, Arlene Cruz, Mia Soto, Nadia Chait, Alan Ross, and Cal Hedigan. Uh, and Ju Han, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Starting time. Thank you, uh, Chairs Lewis and Levine, and all the committee members for holding this hearing. Um, I'm Ju Han, the Deputy Director uh, at the Asian American Federation. You represent the collective voice of 70 member nonprofits, some of uh, whom you heard from earlier, uh, serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. Uh, under COVID, the Asian community's mental health needs has dramatically increased due to the loss of loved ones, which have been underreported, the surge in anti Asian violence that some um, uh, groups have reported or already referenced high unemployment rates and the severe isolation of our seniors. In 2020, there were at least 500 anti-Asian bias incidents against the community that's already experienced the greatest increase in unemployment, all of which have compounded the trauma of low-income Asian New Yorkers. And even before COVID, Asians were the only racial group in the city for which suicide was one of the top 10 leading causes of death. Uh, Asians also have the lowest utilization of mental health services across all racial groups, a challenge that's further exacerbated by the fact that 25% of Asian New Yorkers live in poverty and 50% have limited English proficiency. And we know that at least 36 languages are spoken across the Pan-Asian community. Next year's budget must address systemic inequities by supporting community-based mental health solutions provided by Asian nonprofits who um, have been historically underfunded, having received just 0.2% of DOHMH contract dollars from fiscal year 2002 to 2014, despite being the fastest growing population in the city. We're asking the city council to make an initial investment of at least $2 million in Asian nonprofits to provide culturally competent programs. And again, some of our mental health partners and our, um, who are also our member agencies testify to some of the needs that they were seeing during COVID, um, as well as um, just, we know that that's gonna continue um, beyond COVID. The current uh, models of service that the city offers, like New York City Well, they do not work for the Asian community. Uh, so this investment is critical if you want to prevent a bigger health crisis. With this investment, the Federation plans to expand and sustain a citywide effort to build mental health service capacity. This is in partnership with many of our, uh, a number of our mental health partners. Um, specifically, expand a community education program to reduce deep stigma relating to mental health services, as well as create and disseminate culturally competent resources, which we've done in the past year. Develop the capacity of Asian serving nonprofits to identify mental health needs and provide non clinical interventions, which is where a lot of people in our community get access versus Western models like counseling and therapy. Um, provide culturally competence uh, trainings to mainstream mental health providers to increase their knowledge of how to address the mental health needs of Asian New Yorkers. There's only on, you know, I can count on one hand the number of Asian mental health clinics in New York City. So there's no way that the needs of all Asian New Yorkers can be met only by uh, Asian uh, mental health clinics. So we need everyone to be able to increase their cultural competency, which includes hiring staff and being um, responsive to the, fast, the needs of the fastest growing population in New York City. Um, convene the Asian American Mental Health Roundtable to share resources and knowledge and best practices to serve the varied mental health needs of the community, which we've been doing in the past year and have had over 20 Asian nonprofits um, join us on a quarterly basis to address the COVID specific mental health needs that have arose. Um, and also replicate su successful program models and provide training to Asian serving organizations in order to build their internal capacity to provide non-clinical mental health services to the Asian community. Thank you for allowing me to testify, and we look forward to working with all of you to make sure that our communities get the mental health support that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next turn to Jane Wong. You can begin when you're prompted. Your time will begin now. Hello, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Jane Wong, and I'm the Hepatitis B Program Associate at Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. We are a FQHC uh, with locations in Chinatown, Manhattan and Flushing, Queens. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about our health center and the Check Hep B program, which is under City Council's Viral Hepatitis Initiative. Approximately one in eight adult patients at our health center live with chronic hepatitis B. And it's estimated that there are 241,000 people with hepatitis B in New York City. However, many people living with hepatitis B aren't even aware of their infection because this condition often doesn't have symptoms. 
And if it's left unmonitored or untreated, one in four individuals with chronic hepatitis B go on to de develop serious liver problems, including liver cancer. Um, the Check Up B program under City Council's Viral Hepatitis Initiative provides essential patient navigation and care management services for New Yorkers identified to have chronic hepatitis B. Um, and of those linked to care through our, the Check Up B program, 96% completed a hepatitis B medical evaluation. And we're, you know, with continued funding and resources, Check Up B programs throughout the city can continue to address the burden of hepatitis B among our communities. However, uh, with the prioritization of New York City's limited resources toward COVID-19 efforts, um, that has impacted our ability to offer program services at full capacity. And the proposed further cuts um, to Article, uh, Article 6 state reimbursement to 10% would exacerbate the issue. Um, and so we are asking um, City Council to su sustain funding at fiscal year 2020 levels uh, to the City Council Viral Hepatitis, uh, hep viral hepatitis Initiative uh, in light of uh, all the budget cuts and um, prioritization of efforts towards COVID-19. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. I hope everyone is staying safe and well. Um, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our testimony. Thank you very much. We'll next turn to Arlene Cruz. You can begin when you're prompted. Time will begin. Good evening, my name is Arlene Cruz and I'm the Associate Director of Health Programs at Make the Road New York. We thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Make the Road New York and our 24,000 plus members and staff. As you probably know, our communities have been some of the hardest hit by COVID-19, our largest base in central Queens, the epicenter of the pandemic. Across all our sites, our members and participants are dying, have been sick, and struggle to access care, testing, and now vaccinations. Despite these obstacles, we continue to provide essential health, legal, and educational services. Our health teams continue all core services while providing an array of emergency provisions with a mixture of remote, telework, and in-person services. Based on the experiences, we are making the following recommendations for the fiscal year 2022 budget. We first asked the city council to maintain 2.5 million in funding for the Access Health Initiative and restore and increase funding for MACAP to 7, uh, 750,000. We reach over 8,000 low income immigrants a year with our health access services. And in 2020, our team provided services online and by phone and responded to new needs. We assist with health insurance enrollment, food stamps enrollment and health navigation. MACAP is a city funded project, a part of this initiative. We utilize it to help folks understand how to use their health services, resolve billing issues and coverage denials and maximize their coverage. During the height of the pandemic, we even helped clients locate the remains of loved ones in hospitals and remove deceased loved ones remains from their homes. An increase in funding is crucial for our communities where individuals are not eligible for insurance and need help finding low cost care and lowering their medical debt. Secondly, we ask council to maintain its 2 million allocation to the Immigrant Health Initiative and request continued funding for our org in the amount of 80,000. Throughout the initiative, Make the Road tackles health disparities amongst low income and immigrant New Yorkers. With continued funding, we will reach at least 900 new participants through the project. Third, we asked the city council to maintain $7 million in funding and request $75,000 specifically for our org under the initiative. This funding supports prevention, education, and outreach. Renewed funding will ensure individuals will attend virtual HIV prevention sessions and screenings for at least 400 individuals. That includes referrals to HIV prevention services with hundreds of referrals to social services such as SNAP enrollment. Fourth, we request $50,000 from the Brooklyn delegation to support Make the Road and fellow coalition partners in the Bridge to Health Equity Community Health Worker Project. Through the project, Make the Road and coalition partners will provide a home-based asthma intervention program to Time families has with asthma in targeted Brooklyn neighborhoods. We work in Bushwick and our community health workers visit families served up to three times per year virtually or in person. 
Finally, the city should increase funding to 22 million for emergency food assistance programs to support this critical source of food for more than 500 pantries and soup kitchens in the city. We thank the health committee and the entire city council for your consideration and look forward to working together in fiscal year 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to Mia Soto. You can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Levy and the community members for giving me the opportunity to present testimony today and for this tremendous assistance. My name is Mia Soto and I'm the community organizer in the Health Justice Program at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, where we work to ensure that undocumented immigrants have access to healthcare services. During this unprecedented public health crisis, I urge the council to support new funding uh, for this vital community health work, which has saved lives and improved the health of thousands of New Yorkers across the city. New York Lawyers with Public Interest is privileged to work with you and are thankful for your support in continuing your work. At a time when access to medical care and information is crucial and this information can endanger our communities, this support has also allowed us to expand our work in educating immigrant New Yorkers with serious healthcare conditions um, and their healthcare providers and legal service providers and advocates across the city um, to learn about how to access healthcare services and to stay safe during the times of pandemic. Your funding support really supports NLP's work to provide comprehensive screening and legal representations to individuals, particularly those who are in health emergencies. And it has also allowed us to support eligible immigrants enrolling in state funded Medicaid. And for example, one of our clients um, was diagnosed with heart failure shortly after he entered the United States. And he was just 16 years old at that time. He was denied a heart transplant in part because of his undocumented status. And our team actually met with him uh, in the hospital after he was operated on and given a left uh, ventricle assist device to ensure that his heart continued pumping. While advocating for his uh, heart transplant, we ensured that he was represented in immigration court and before the asylum office and advocated fiercely for an expedited process because of his heart condition. After we passed his case and we pressed his case, um, the individual was actually granted asylum in March 2020 and was reunited with his mother after being separated from her for the past 12 years. We are proud to actually share with you all that the last month he actually received a heart transplant and is recovering well. And today I ask the funding, the funding of City Council continue for year 2022 for both NLP and our partners um, and to support this really vital and important work to serve our community, to serve those in need. Um, and you know, improve immigrant New Yorkers access to healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we call on Nadia Chait. And Nadia, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Nadia Chait, the Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. You've heard from some of our members already today, but we have over 100 members who provide community-based behavioral health services throughout New York City to about 600,000 New Yorkers every year. Um, our members are in every community in the city and provide services uh, in literally dozens of languages. They are embedded in their communities and truly understand the needs on the ground um, for services. And what they are seeing at this time is horrific. We are seeing a massive mental health and substance use crisis that the council needs to take strong action to address. The long-term impacts of COVID on the physical health side may be ending, but on the mental health and substance use side, the impact of COVID is just beginning. We're seeing three times the number of New Yorkers reporting depression and anxiety. We're hearing from our members that when children are coming into their programs, they're coming in at a much more serious level of need and experiencing much more destabilizing events, including the loss of parents and caregivers, um, as well as unemployment and other challenges in the home. We know that substance use is up. Um, unfortunately, as some of the council members were questioning the city on before, our data at this point on overdose is a year old, which we think is really unacceptable. 
Um, but even from that data, we know that overdoses were up over 28% from quarter one of 2020 compared to quarter one of 2019. And we've heard from all of our providers anecdotes that lead us to think that tragically this number is going to get much higher um, over the course of the rest of the year as the data comes in. We also know that our members have had to reverse far more overdoses than they normally have to. Um, and so all of this leads us to one very clear conclusion, which is that we need to substantially increase um, investment in mental health and behavioral health services and provide a robust response to the mental health and substance use crisis that our city is facing right now. Last year, um, the council unfortunately had to cut the mental health initiatives by 15% and eliminated one initiative completely. As a result of those cuts, 40% of funded providers serve fewer people, 20% had to lay off staff, 30% cut staff hours, and 13% cut staff salaries. Of course, all of these cuts came at a time when the, increase, the demand for services was increasing and when providers were investing substantial amounts of money to transition programs to telehealth and to make their physical spaces safer. I do wanna note that while many programs transition to telehealth and that's been effective for a lot of the folks that we serve, our doors also never closed and providers continue to provide services in person, in residences and on the street. Um, and so invested in, tele, in um, PPE and, and other costs to make that safe. Um, we would strongly encourage the council to increase funding, um, to restore funding on the initiatives to the FY21 20 levels and to increase funding on the geriatric mental expired. health initiative, the mental health services for vulnerable populations initiative, um, the children under five initiative and the opioid prevention and treatment initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, we'll next turn to Alan Ross and Alan, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Oh, Alan, you're still on mute. Just a moment while we work to unmute you. There you okay. go. My name is Alan Ross, and I'm director of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center, part of the world's largest suicide prevention network with centers in 40 countries. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Samaritan is the only community-based organization in New York City whose sole mission is preventing suicide, wants to thank the city council for its continued support of our 24-hour suicide hotline, the only completely confidential crisis response service in the city staffed entirely by volunteers. We would literally not be here without you. And that's the focus of my comments today. We all know that suicide and self-harming behavior were major public health problems before COVID and that the number of New Yorkers at risk has in some cases doubled and tripled during the pandemic. Being on the front lines of New York City suicide prevention efforts since 1984, I have seen firsthand the results of the city's development of new mental health programs. I've seen the state create new initiatives and research projects. I've seen more new training programs for our city schools and health agencies than I can even count. And while some of these have improved the city's response to those at risk, many have not. And most have been duplicative or failed to build on what was already established. And almost without exception, every time something new was created, it came at the expense of existing programs with established track records that were already embedded in New York City's diverse cultural communities. Thrive, as you know, is the best example. With its launch, dozens of highly respected community-based programs that serve New York City immigrants, people of color, those with substance abuse, the chronic mentally ill, people living in poverty, and so many others saw our budget slashed, if not eliminated. Take Samaritans operating New York City's 24-hour suicide hotline for 30 years, answering over 1.3 million calls, our DOMH hotline contract was reduced by 85%, reducing instead of increasing our ability to help people in need. We were credited with bringing suicide professional development training to tens of thousands of New York City frontline student support personnel. But when funding became available, Samaritans was ignored and this is a process that goes on for many community-based organizations. Instead of utilizing the knowledge and experience of community-based groups, of which Samaritans is just one, groups that have proved effective in providing to support to those who are underserved, who research shows frequently eschew government programs and clinical services, funds continually go to new programs that by definition are unproven and will take considerable time to develop. It's the law of physics to continue to expand and add on without reinforcing the foundation 
undermine system integrity. Instead of strengthening the city's mental health safety net, it ends up compromised, which is the opposite of what any of us want. So as you determine next year's funding priorities, we hope the council will please remember, one size does not fit all, bigger is not always better, and new is not necessarily improved. New York City's diverse community-based organizations have always been in the best position to help underserved New Yorkers who are not getting the help and support they need. At a minimum, Samaritans and other frontline community crisis response services should have our pre-COVID budgets cut and restored, and we hope the council will act for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alan. We'll next turn to Cal Hedigan. And Cal, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. You may begin. Thank you, Chairs Lewis and Levine and committee members. My name is Cal Hedigan. I'm the CEO of Community Access, an organization that has been supporting the self-determination of people living with mental health concerns since 1974. Our 350 person staff work daily to support thousands of New Yorkers through supportive housing, mobile treatment teams, training, supported education, advocacy, and other healing focused services. I direct your attention to my written testimony, which goes into greater detail on a number of budget issues. I will focus on just a few. The mental health toll of the, these last 13 months cannot be overstated. The city must increase its investment in community-based services so that access to trauma-informed, culturally competent services will be available to the growing number of New Yorkers in need. The human services sector employs over 600,000 New Yorkers, the majority of whom are women who identify as BIPOC. Yet city contracts are funded in such a way that providers cannot pay frontline workers a living wage. These are the very workers who have been showing up every day throughout this pandemic, providing essential services to some of our city's most vulnerable people. City contracted human services workers on average earn less than half the wages of those outside the sector. City funding levels must increase to address the inequitable salary structure in this sector. The fiscal year 22 budget must, at a bare minimum, include the restoration of a 3% COLA on personnel services and contracts, as well as emergency pay for frontline workers retroactive to the beginning of New York's lockdown order. Attention also needs to be paid to the true cost of community-based providers. At Community Access, we need to privately raise almost 10% of our budget every year just to break even. Last year, through the indirect cost rate initiative, the city took an important step towards reimbursing nonprofits for the administrative cost of doing business. But now the city is reneging on that commitment by retroactively cutting the ICR funding by 40% in fiscal year 20 and up to 70% in fiscal year 21. This simply must not happen. The budget must include $171 million to honor the ICR funding commitments for fiscal years 20, 21, and 22. Lastly, there are record numbers of people experiencing homelessness in our city. We must move on from the idea of a right to shelter to the understanding of expired. housing as a fundamental human right and a vital determinant of individual health and mental health. Mission-driven nonprofit housing providers like Community Access are ready to partner with the city to address this need. I look forward to working with you to advance budget priorities that will support the health and mental health of New Yorkers and create a model of pandemic recovery for other cities to follow. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. And please stay tuned for testimony from my colleagues with CCIT, NYC, and NILPI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cal. Uh, and thank you to this entire panel. I'll pause briefly for any council member questions or comments. 
Well, I want to thank all of you for uh, speaking out today, for staying. It's, it's so important that you go on the record on these points. I know it's been a long hearing. Um, but I, I think you'll agree with me when I say that we are in for a real reckoning on the mental health implications of this crisis. I don't think the city has really yet come to terms with this. And that we can't wait for six or 12 months from now to wake up to that and to start to respond. Really, the work has to happen now. We've, we've lost a year in addressing a lot of these issues. Um, in some ways it was unavoidable, but, um, but we really need to have the resources in place now to respond. It's gonna be a long fight. Um, this is bigger than 9-11 and its impact, its, its disruption and its impact on the mental health of the city. And we know it's gonna be a years long fight. Um, I appreciate Nadia and all of you who brought up the particular challenge in responding to addiction and overdose. I am alarmed at what I believe uh, is real backsliding on that front. And so certainly uh, you have my support in trying to make sure that, my goodness, there's no cuts to these, any of these services, but that we can fully fund and if possible enhance the council initiatives that support your work and uh, mayoral initiatives as well. So thank you all for speaking out and uh, let's work together on behalf of this important sector in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine, and thank you to this entire panel. Our next panel will be Sam Miller, Michelle Gadot, Shane Correa, Phoenix, Courtney Hawk, Ruth Lowenkron, and Steve Coe. Sam Miller, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, early evening, uh, Chairperson Levine Lewis and members of the committees on health and mental health disability. It's almost tomorrow, Sam. It's <laughs> not quite. <laughs> it's getting there though, right? It's a good thing it's still light out. Um, it's good to see you. My name is Sam Miller. I'm the Chief External Relations Officer at the Institute for Community Living, or ICL, a nonprofit behavioral health organization that serves 10,000 New Yorkers a year across the five boroughs with a wide range of mental health disorders, developmental disabilities, and substance misuse issues. And I wanna thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of ICL's president and CEO, David Woodlock. Um, ICL is a leader in providing truly integrated whole person care that is designed to help people get better based on their individual needs, not just their diagnosis or what government programs they may be eligible for. We provide shelter and supported housing to more than 2,500 New Yorkers each night. And we offer a range of services from intense care coordination to clinical services, to mobile treatment teams, to family support. Our East New York Health Hub, which opened in 2018 with our primary care partner, Community Healthcare Network, has gained national recognition for offering comprehensive mental and physical health services under one roof. And we have applied this integrated data approach to all the people we serve. Um, we were focused relentlessly on data, as uh, some other folks have uh, mentioned on this um, uh, in previous panels. Um, we really do uh, take a lot of time to measure uh, the progress uh, uh, and improvement of our clients. And we have um, been able to, um, over the last several years, reduce hospitalizations, uh, both for mental health reasons and physical health reasons. Um, and so we're really proud of what we've been able to do. Um, like other healthcare providers, we've had to come overcome enormous challenges posed by the COVID epidemic. And I think um, Nadia really described that well. So I will um, leave that part for the written testimony and um, get to a couple of points that I just wanna make uh, in my three minutes of time here. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the first thing is the, the council's uh, mental health discretionary funding. Um, it's really important that um, uh, that, that funding be uh, <clears throat> that be, be restored to the uh, fiscal year 20 funding levels. Um, that discretionary funding has really been helpful for us. It's allowed us to provide supported housing to 39 residents in the Bronx. Uh, last year, we were able to maintain housing for these residents despite the 15% reduction. But um, as you know, um, any money that we, uh, that we have to cut from one program, we, that means just we have to fill it um, from something else. Um, so we'd like that to be restored. We'd also like the council uh, to insist that the city fully fund the indirect cost rate initiative um, for fiscal years 20, 21, and 22, something that was promised uh, to nonprofits years ago. Uh, the pandemic has put even more financial pressure on us and other nonprofits. 
uh, in areas such as technology and workforce development, um, given the need to offer telehealth services and attract and retain quality uh, qualified, excuse me, employees. Um, at ICL, we estimate uh, we spent probably more than 200,000 a year on these kinds of costs that should have been reimbursed uh, by the city. And finally, um, <clears throat> I want to mention uh, something uh, that's very, uh, 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 very important in terms of the impact of the pandemic on vulnerable children and families. Um, we uh, have a family, ICL runs a family resource center in East New York, um, which is a somewhat unique, well, not totally unique, but um, a really successful program that's set to be defunded by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on June 30th. Uh, the Family Resource Center, which provides individual and group-based services to parents and caregivers of kids who have or are at risk of developing emotional, behavioral, and mental health challenges, has been a lifeline for families in East New York. In fact, uh, the FRC provided 3,844 discrete services in 2020, which is more than three times the 1,155 we had in 2019, which really gets to, again, what Nadia and others have said, that the, we've all seen this gigantic increase in the need for the services that we provide. Um, FRC is unique in that we serve anyone who requests help, regardless of whether there's a diagnosis or what insurance the person may have. In our Family Resource Center, peers offer help on parenting, skills development, wraparound services, and care coordination. But most important, the FRC offers easy access to clinical and other services offered under the one roof allowing families with multiple needs to avoid having to waste time and energy navigating our fragmented healthcare system. Offering this kind of access is critical to family wellness, especially given the strain on families caused by the pandemic. And unfortunately, the families we serve stand to lose this access on June 30th. Uh, we know that there are other capable providers in Brooklyn, but the, the health department has suggested that we can continue to meet our clients' needs through a model that relies on a state program that builds Medicaid. The problem, however, is that this model, known as Children and Family Treatment and Support Services, or CFTSS, has not been very successful to date, and it doesn't reimburse for the kinds of services that the Family Resource Center provides. Medicaid simply doesn't cover much of what our clients so desperately need. In the face of the pandemic, when we know the needs of vulnerable families are growing, now is not the time to transition to a new model that limits the kind of services families need. In fact, no transition has begun, and at this point, there really isn't time enough to transition before the end of the fiscal year. So we've asked the DOHMH uh, to extend our contract on an emergency basis for a year so we can continue to serve our clients and work on a better path for the future. And, and Sam, uh, I'm sorry, only if you could maybe just uh, summarize, because we have so many people. So yep, and that's it, and I'm done. Okay, awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You, sorry Thank if I went over. Thank you very, very much. Um, and again, yeah, thank you everyone so much for your patience. And in case anyone wants to submit written testimony, we read every word of it, but we really appreciate you all hanging around and we will get to everybody. Um, our next panelist will be Michelle Gadot. Michelle, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. And Tom will begin now. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Michelle Gadot and I'm the Senior Director of Planning and External Affairs at the Center for Comprehensive Health Practice also known as CCHP. Uh, thank you committee chair Levine for calling this hearing and for the opportunity to testify before the joint committees. CCHP has provided services in the East Harlem community for over 60 years. And our mission is to integrate high quality primary care, substance use treatment, behavioral health and supportive services all under one roof. And in the spring of 2017, we added opioid overdose prevention to our long list of services that we offer to our patients and the greater New York community. Uh, first, I'd like to say that opiate addiction is not a new phenomenon to many new communities in New York City, particularly in East Harlem. Uh, we were established six, de six decades ago to combat the heroin epidemic that was taking over northern Manhattan at the time. And in the 70s, we became one of the first programs in the country to offer methadone treatment to pregnant women. And we still remain one of only two providers in all of New York State to offer specialized treatment for pregnant women with opiate use disorders. And I say all this to remind the committee members that for many residents of New York City, they've been waiting for the day when resources finally funneled into their community to fight this battle. Um, and the reality is that these resources only became available once the nation finally woke up to an epidemic that had been around for nearly three quarters of a century, uh, once the color of people's skin who were dying became lighter. In 2019, the number of overdose deaths increased once again in New York City to 1400, uh, over 1400, and that's basically one New Yorker dying from an overdose every seven minutes. And while the rate of overdose deaths continue to decline amongst white New Yorkers, the rate of overdose deaths continue to rise for black and Latino New Yorkers. 
And every year, the same five neighborhoods have been hit the hardest by these deaths, um, and that includes neighborhoods in the South Bronx and East Harlem. From 2017 to 2020, our overdose prevention trainers distributed over 2,500 naloxone kits to New Yorkers. With the growing number of overdose kits being distributed, a focus on expanding treatment for addiction and a citywide campaign that emphasized on reducing the stigma associated with substance use and getting treatment, we were starting to see it all come together and the number of overdoses while still increased were doing so at a slower rate. And then in March of last year, COVID hit. And while the entire city began to shut down, we at CCHP stayed open. We had to respond to new stay at home measures while ensuring our patients still had access to care and our staff stayed in constant contact with their clients through text messaging, email, phone calls, whatever we had to do. We teamed up with the Department of Health and their methadone delivery program and provided them with the methadone and naloxone kits they needed to distribute to opioid treatment participants who were in quarantine, isolation, or experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. And historically, big events have had negative effects on the health and health-related behaviors and have led to increases in substance use. And a growing fear amongst harm reduction and health providers is what lasting effect will COVID-19 have on opiate users. The COVID-19 crisis has increased the risk of homelessness, overdoses, and unsafe injecting and sexual practices. And concern that many of our patients and general members of the community may deal with the sudden isolation and loss in jobs, family, home, and social supports with increased substance use, we came up with innovative ways to distribute overdose prevention supplies online. And in the summer, we launched a new program on our website to mail naloxone kits out to anyone who lived in New York and mailed out nearly 400 kits to date. And unfortunately, we have yet to know what impact the trauma of COVID-19 has had and will continue to have on the mental health and substance use for New Yorkers. And early data from the CDC shows that emergency room visits for opiate overdose increased by nearly 30% from March to October compared to the previous year. And while there's no data from New York released yet, I can tell you that at CCHP, we have seen an increased need for our prevention and treatment services. So we asked the committee to increase its funding to battle the opioid epidemic and also to support small, smaller community-based organizations such as CCHP in your budget for this year. I uh, thank you, Chair Levine, and to the Joint Committee for your time. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, we'll next turn to Shane Correa. And Shane, you can begin when you're prompted. The time will begin now. Great. Uh, good evening, and thank you, members of City Council, for hearing our testimony. Uh, my name is Shane Karaya, and I work at the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, I'm here to testify about the intersection of the mental health system and responsibly reforming our public safety system. Prior to the pandemic, the jail population had trended down toward the goal needed to responsibly close Rikers Island and achieve the targeted bed numbers for borough-based jails. However, of the jail population reduction, the vast, vast majority of those uh, who had been uh, diverted were without the Brad H. mental health flag. Accordingly, the demographics of those held in jail with mental health issues are increasing, with 52%, a first-time majority, now having the Brad H. mental health flag on Rikers Island. As the city navigates implementing the points of agreement to build the community infrastructure to responsibly close Rikers, I want to speak of some programs that we operate that are helping divert people from jail who screen for mental health needs. First, our alternatives to incarceration programs. With the support of the Public Safety Committee and these committees, we operate two separate pilots that keep people with mental health or substance abuse diagnoses out of jail and serve with clinical support in community. For our Brooklyn Mental Health Vulnerable Populations Program, it's in its second year serving 16 to 24 year olds with serious mental health diagnoses such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and the majority have co-occurring substance abuse issues. Rather than confinement, these youth are engaged in therapy and services in community, and even during the pandemic, continue to be in compliance with their mandates. For our felony alternatives to jail program, over 90% of participants are screening for mental health issues, and 11% are flagging as homeless. Despite this, our clients are 89% in compliance with their long-term mandates that help stabilize them in community rather than a revolving door in and out of the jail for serious crimes. Next, Council's Innovative Criminal Justice Initiative partially supports our Midtown Community Court Pilot that connects mental health support to individuals who are arrested for low-level crimes but are high-frequency repeat offenders. 
Instead of starting from scratch for each successive low level arrest, these individuals are paired with the team that includes a therapist and a social worker that stay with the individual for every successive arrest, providing them with continuity of care. In fiscal year 21, this initiative was cut in half due to the pandemic, and we ask council to restore it so that we can continue to serve our communities flexibly since public safety is not siloed from mental health. As the city grapples with the impact of COVID and reforming its justice system, we hope to continue to be a partner with council to tackle these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, we'll next hear from Phoenix. And Phoenix, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Good time, we'll begin now. Okay. Good evening. Hi, my name is Phoenix. My pronoun is Phoenix. I'm representing the New York City Anti-Violence Project as an organizer with the TGNC Leadership Academy cohort. AVP empowers lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV affect the communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, counseling, and advocacy. As a person who experienced violence at a young age, it impacted how I navigate through the world. Community violence has impacted me on so many levels, both as a queer non-binary person of color, as well as a neurodiverse person. I've had to deal with homophobic, transphobic, and ableist slurs since I was a kid. Even then, it has been extremely difficult for me to access services that should be available for me through city-funded social and educational services. In the media, there has been a rise in violence on public transportation. And I remember having a session with my medical provider about an incident that happened to me on the subway where my life was threatened and I was called a fucking faggot. As I was sharing that experience with my provider, they were dismissive and invalidating my experience as a queer non-binary person of color. The whole situation made me feel unsafe in my own city. And the night that happened, I was coming from an event on the celebration of gender being passed. One of the very few legislative friends we have as a community. I know what it's like to seek support and services and be discriminated on because of my identity as a queer, non-binary, disabled person of color. Many individuals who look like me don't feel safe in their community. I'm advocating for more resources to address the violence that has directly impacted my community. This includes restoring funding for organizations doing anti-violence work with LGBTQ people of color, as well as hate violence prevention initiative that the council cut last year. We are still lacking accessible services and yet systems that criminalize us are receiving greater funding. Any initiative from the city has to look into the broken mental health system and offer deep investments in culturally competent mental health services based in black and brown communities. We know that the NYPD does not keep us safe and one of the solutions is removing cops as first responders for mental health emergencies. What keeps us safe is increasing mental health services, especially in marginalized communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Phoenix. Our next panelist will be Courtney Hawk. Courtney, you can begin when you're prompted. Your time will begin. Good evening. My name is Courtney Hawk, and I'm a pro bono scholar in the Disability Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, or NILPI. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the life or death issue of providing a non-police response to mental health crises in New York. When a loved one might harm themselves because of a mental health crisis, the options in New York are to call 911 or do nothing. Police are meant to investigate crime, yet year after year we ask them to perform a task that should be done by healthcare providers and peers with lived mental health experience. Since 2015 alone, Police in New York City have killed at least 23 people experiencing mental health crises or who had a history of mental illness. Most of those people were people of color. Each response to a mental health crisis starts that individual down a path, either towards recovery or towards forced commitments, incarceration, homelessness, or even death. City Council has the power to choose recovery. For over 30 years, a program in Eugene, Oregon called CAHOOTS, Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets, has sent medical specialists and peers to de-escalate mental health crises without police involvement. 
And in those 30 plus years, not one worker or person experiencing a mental health crisis has ever been seriously injured. Their model can and will work here. Already a coalition of more than 80 organizations called Correct Crisis Intervention Today NYC has developed a plan to adapt CAHOOTS for New York. Using peers from low-income communities of color, EMTs, and a dedicated crisis line. Further, program outcomes will be tracked and evaluated by an advisory board composed of 51% or more peers from low-income Black, Latinx, and other communities of color. This can easily be added to City Council's newly proposed Initiative 2210, which NILPI urges the Council not to adopt as written, since it will authorize far greater police involvement than the Council intends. Since police should play a minimal role, if any, in mental health crisis response, we urge City Council to redirect less than 1% of the city's annual NYPD spending to fund this program and provide adequate crisis care for people experiencing mental health crises in all five boroughs at no additional cost to the city. At the same time, the city can conserve vast resources by lessening the burden on law enforcement, inpatient psychiatric services, and other de facto first responders, and avoiding claim payments related to police encounters with people experiencing mental health crises. Please take action today. Please provide funding to protect the 1.7 million city residents living with mental illness. Thank you and we welcome any questions from the council. Thank you, Courtney. And I believe Ruth Lowenkron is just here for Q&A, but I'll just give a moment um, and unmute her just to be sure. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I'm here just for questions. Thank you, though, for asking. Thank you very much. And we'll turn to our next panelist, Steve Coe. And Steve, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Council Member Levine for his attention over the last six hours. Um, um, it's, I, I respect that. Um, my name is Steve Coe. I was the co-founder of the Correct Crisis Intervention today, um, which was formed in 2012 after decades of, of violence against people during a mental health crisis, um, starting with Eleanor Bumpers back in 1984. Um, our thought uh, eight years ago was that if we train the police, then um, the violence would end. Um, and we adopted a, a, a program and got the, the city to train 15,000 police officers. Um, but as you just heard, um, almost two dozen people were killed after the, the training began. And we, we pivoted and part of the pivot was based on a planning sessions that we had with peers and asked them to design a system, a crisis system that they would um, prefer and came up with a whole list of recommendations two years ago which included cahoots um, and we brought them here, we introduced them to the city, um, but it, um, now two years later, the city is gonna launch a, a, a pilot um, that doesn't include peers. Uh, the cahoots staff, almost 70% of the people that do the outreach have identifies a pe person with a lived experience. Um, and you don't have to look very far to find a model. Um, in Queens, uh, Transitional Services uh, teamed up with uh, Long Island Hospital and actually created a program um, to relieve the 105th precinct of 3,000 calls a year that were coming from the campus of Creedmoor Hospital, um, where there's also housing programs and outpatient programs. And they had two-person team operated from 10 to 6. They responded within five minutes. Um, and 85% of the people they encountered just wanted to talk to somebody or they had an immediate concern. Prior to their interventions, the police were transporting these people to the emergency room um, at Long Island Jewish Hospital, where they were, 90% uh, of them were uh, released um, after um, being uh, seen in the emergency room. So not only are the police being used, but the hospital staff is being overburdened by a very simple fix. Um, so this represents a program that was developed in the community by providers um, uh, to to re, um, respond to a local need. Which brings me to 2210, which was just mentioned. The city council has proposed creating an office of community mental health. The people that are actually know how to do this have been testifying all day, are out in the communities, and they are never 
asked to help design these programs, we're asked to respond to RFPs that have been created after the fact that have inadequate funding and, and programs that aren't truly um, based on what people need. Um, Council Member Levine, I'm sorry, I went over a second here. The Neighborhood Health Action Center- Time has expired. Three action centers were set up in uh, communities. Uh, the staff from the Department of Health did not wanna leave the Long Island City office and go work in these places um, because they were felt they were being demoted. Um, and in fact, over time, they hired local people to work in these health centers. We need a lot more places like that. Otherwise, and I wanna just shout out to Sarah Liss, um, the report that you drafted, I think you were involved for the council on the uh, 2210 states very clearly that the problem is the neighborhoods where these crises occur are characterized by uh, violence and poverty and racism. And that if you want to stop the calls from coming, you have to go into these neighborhoods and provide services that people want to use and are appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and thank you to this entire panel. I'm going to pause very briefly here if there are any questions or comments. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. And we'll next turn to our, our following panel, which will be Javier Osario, Deidre DeLeo, Anel Williams, Tamara Morgan, Dr. Catherine Messinio, Christopher Baez, and Nancy Katz. Uh, Javier, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Good time, we'll begin now. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to Javier at the end. Um, let's turn to Deidre DeLeo. And Deidre, while we work to unmute you, you can begin after the sergeant prompts you. Time will begin. Good evening, Chair Lewis, Chair Levine, members of the NYC Committee of Mental Health, Disabilities, Addiction, and Committee on Health. My name is Deirdre DeLeo, and I am with the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. I appreciate the opportunity to testify about our geriatric mental health initiative program focused on providing, sorry, <laughs> mental health services to Bronx seniors in their homes. VNSNY touches the lives of more than 44,000 individuals each day through in-home and community programs. We have been there during many of the biggest public health and natural emergencies, including COVID-19. Since March, 2020, VNSNY has cared for more than 5,000 COVID positive New Yorkers. Our services address mental health and substance misuse issues. Programs including mobile crisis for adults and children, assertive community treatment programs and intensive mobile treatment teams, as well as children's home and school-based crisis intervention services. 67% of the adults and 90% of the children we serve in our mental health programs are of racial or ethnic minorities, many of whom are uninsured or have Medicaid. In FY 2021, the city cut mental health program budgets by 15%. We are asking to restore the geriatric mental health initiative to its original funding. When COVID hit, the geriatric mental health initiative program quickly pivoted from providing traditional in-person based services to telehealth services. We provided services to 381 people in the last fiscal year. In addition, we worked with all clients weekly to address more concrete needs such as food, medication delivery, medication, or medical services, and COVID testing. For example, we were working with an older married male prior to COVID who was very ill and homebound. In March 2020, he was diagnosed with COVID and hospitalized. He was in and out of the hospital for several months and was told he might die. Our staff provided calls to him and also provided supportive counseling to his wife. He's home now and recovers, recovered from COVID and credits GMHI services for giving him the strength to survive COVID. As COVID has impacted the emotional health of all New Yorkers, we're asking for the council to protect and make whole the funding for the GMHI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deidre. Uh, we'll next turn to Anel Williams. And Anel, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Your time will begin now.
Um, Anel, we're having a little difficulty hearing you. No, okay, we'll come back to you. We'll work with you to, to fix that. Um, let's turn to Tamara Morgan next. And Anel, we'll come back to you right afterward. Tamara, as soon as you're unmuted, you can begin. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the committee chairs, uh, Lewis and Mabine, and all of the wonderful organizations here today presenting. My name is Tamara Morgan, and I'm the Community Partnerships Coordinator of an amazing, innovative nonprofit organization called the Adaptive Design Association, where we provide custom adaptive equipment and educational programs through cardboard carpentry and adaptive design practices to people with disabilities and their communities. Um, we have uh, we have added or presented several uh, initiatives to the city council that we are asking for funding for, for our Adapt for Access program, which supports about 80 to 100 individuals with custom adaptive equipment so that they can fully thrive at home, in school, and in their community. And now with remote learning and remote therapies being something that uh, our clients are largely involved in. We are asking that our initiatives are considered so that we can continue to support these individuals where they are. In addition to that program, we have also uh, asked for support through the Autism Awareness uh, Initiative to support our educational high school programs for youth with autism, where we are working with their staff and paraprofessionals to teach them how to create custom adaptations for their peers. And we hope that uh, all of these requests and appeals will be considered in the fiscal 2022 budget. Um, thank you so much for your time and absolutely happy to answer any questions that you might have and here or uh, with the written testimony. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Dr. Catherine Messinio uh, and you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Good time, we'll begin. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Catherine Messinio, and I'm here representing the Developmental Disabilities Division of the New York Family, one of New York City's oldest and largest nonprofit providers of human services. I'd like to thank Chairman Levine and the committee members for allowing me to testify and for your unwavering commitment to building well being among our neighbors. I come before you today to speak about the mental health impact of COVID 19 on people with developmental disabilities. The family has been doing this work for decades and the emotional toll that the pandemic has taken with the grief, anxiety, and depression is like nothing my colleagues and I have seen before. It is for this reason that we have requested $100,000 in city council discretionary funding to support mental health services for adults with developmental disabilities. On a daily basis, our agency helps adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities live their best lives. This population is disproportionately impacted by co-occurring mental health diagnoses, and many have extensive histories of trauma resulting from abuse, abandonment, isolation, and institutionalization in restrictive and unsafe facilities like the Willowbrook State School. These traumas have been amplified by the isolation, restrictions, and grief caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In one such case, a gentleman who was a former resident of the Brooklyn Developmental Center and diagnosed with bipolar disorder lost his best friend to COVID-19. He was having a difficult time coping with the loss and was re-triggered by the feeling of isolation during the quarantine. Our team provided him with grief counseling to meet his cognitive abilities, taught him effective coping strategies, and showed him how to use the internet to connect with his friends and his treatment team. I am proud to lead a team that provides vital behavioral and mental health services that help people cope through these extraordinary circumstances. 
including evidence-based approaches that are proven effective in helping people through trauma and crisis. Without our team of professionals, many of the people we work with would have nowhere to turn, as mental health clinics in the community are rarely equipped to manage their unique needs. We hope you will join us to work to ensure that New Yorkers of all abilities are equipped with the resources and support that they need to thrive. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist is Christopher Baez. Christopher, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Yes, yes. Hello, my name is Christopher Baez, and I'm a member of the New York City anti violence Project. The reason why I am speaking today is because I want to demonstrate the relevance of um, um, why accessibility for disabled people is relevant, um, is very important in our communities. I myself thoroughly understand the, the need um, for, um, you know, like for the budget to be allocated to resources for, for people like me to provide services and to provide um, uh, ways for me to get around. Um, and, um, and I'm a constituent of my, of my uh, community. Um, I identify as queer and um, Latino and brown of color. And um, it's, it's, it's hard for us, for people in my community to, um, to gain access to these resources. So when I heard about this meeting, I, I, I um, jumped on it and um, in hopes that um, my voice will be heard um, as a re representation of exactly um, the issues that the people in my community face. Um, and um, so like um, the money can be at um, uh, the money that is from the budget in, in hopes that the money from the budget can be allocated to create programs, to create jobs, to create resources and or services um, to provide food programs and or clothing, anything for the people in my community. Um, and that's the reason why why um, I'm I'm in this meeting, um, and also so I can learn more about um, how um, the operations are handled in the city and um, how the money is dispersed. Um, and my my passion is public health because I you know my dedication is tr trying to make a difference in my community and just helping people out. Um, and um, so. Um, my community members um, in a position have had to deal with um, uh, circumstances such as hate violence and discriminatory systems of um, that target them, and it's more so with disabled people, um, such as myself. I'm here today because I believe in putting a, um, a stop to violence. In order to do so, we need your support. And I believe that together we can we can do this. And I um, want to repeal laws that um, that make it hard for people in my community and people in general to access spaces where they feel safe and gain the resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, and we'll next turn to Nancy Katz, and then we're going to try to go back and see if we worked out the technical issues with Javier and Anel. So Nancy, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. The time will begin now. Wait a minute. Thank you. Did you call Nancy Katz? Yes, Nancy, you can begin. Oh, okay. I'm sorry because I'm outside. I was waiting so long. So I'm going to go and tell you everything in one minute if you give me one minute. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Nancy, you can go ahead when you're ready. Okay. So I'm the director of a very small organization called Seas in the Middle. So like some of the other people who testified today, um, we're not widely represented. And, um, but I'm deeply grateful to Councilmember Lewis and for Councilmember Levine for 
Wow, listening to people for hours and also including us in that. So we're very concerned about fresh food access, as you heard from Nadia earlier. We have Seeds in the Middle and then we have an organization we started by voters in central Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Food Health Council. And our idea is that there are not enough access to fresh food. And we're worried that the health department is not putting in enough investment in developing community run farm stands. I think the American Heart Association actually referred to it at one point in their testimony about the fact that there's not enough money put into the incentive programs around health bucks and good stuff and prescription. In fact, none of those programs have a central Brooklyn pharmacy or supermarket in them, even though they're bragging about the fact that they have that available. So we believe that the key to changing health in the city is by giving people an opportunity to eat healthy. And we know that when people have the coupons in their hands, they're going to buy fresh because they care about their children, they care about their grandparents. And yet that's a very limited resource by the city council, the mayor's office and the health department. So we have proposed, one of our proposals is $150,000 ask to the New York City Council, Health Council to, I mean the New York City, I'm sorry, City Council to redirect some of the funds you're doing for low income farmers markets to seeds in the middle. And we're going to set up at least eight farm stands run by local people, meaning local voters, meaning local constituents who are going to run those markets because we know that they can run them. We know they're capable, but there's no investment there's no using fresh money, I mean, uh, city money to do economic development through healthy businesses, even though it's been professed many times, our experience is that it's just not there. So we are really asking you to relook at this thing because, because the key to health is eating healthy. And that is a systemic discriminatory racist pro problem in the city that I unfortunately am saying that after 10 years of fighting very hard to get policies that would give more time has expired. for people to eat healthy. So it's number 110752. I hope you'll look at it and you'll look at our, our petition is change.org slash fresh coupons for all which really talks about funding coupons like health bucks so that people can shop for fresh produce. I'm past my number, right? My three minutes. Oh, Chair Levine, you're on, you're hard to hear again. It's okay. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next panelist. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, and we're gonna uh, try to come back to Javier and then Anel. So Javier, uh, please accept the, the prompt to unmute from the host and you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Your time will begin. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Good evening. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, this opportunity Hello. to offer my testimony. Uh, my name is Javier Osorio. I'm the GMHI program for Sunnyside Community Services in Queens. I would like to take this opportunity to especially thank uh, my city council delegation from Queens uh, for their support and always uh, uh, making sure that we get, get all the assistance uh, needed. As we all know, none of us were really prepared for this uh, uh, crisis, which was extremely difficult and challenging in the beginning especially for the population that we serve, the older adults. Um, Sunnyside Community Services transition uh, off-site work uh, in March of last year in 2020. Um, and it was extremely difficult to be able to offer the services that I usually use or that I usually offer at the uh, senior center where I was able to provide supportive counseling in person, groups, uh, telephone counseling, as well as home visits for the homebound uh, clients in the community. Um, a year later, I'm able to say that 
even though in despite the fact that it was very challenging in the beginning, I'm able to offer uh, supportive groups uh, through conference calls, um, supportive counseling individually through telephone calls, uh, Zoom calls, and also uh, I'm able to um, provide or facilitate um, groups through Zoom. Um, it's been extremely challenging, but I understand that there is a tremendous need for my program to continue to be funded, especially because uh, if, especially because uh, uh, this population has been extremely affected by this pandemic. And I know that in a couple of months, we're gonna see more people needing my services. Something that I wanted to share with you all is that uh, last year in the beginning of the pandemic, there was uh, one of my clients who actually needed to have access to um, psychotherapy. Unfortunately, the system works sometimes a little slowly and just it might take a couple of uh, weeks, a couple of months in order for someone to receive services. Through my program, this person was able to receive supportive counseling because prior to the pandemic, he had just uh, lost his wife and he was uh, in tremendous need of someone to talk to. I was able to talk to this person throughout uh, maybe three weeks uh, weekly. And a year later, I can say that this person is feeling much better and therefore I know and understand why the GMHI program is so important. So I really like to thank all of you for listening and I would like to ask the city council to restore our funding. It was cut from uh, 86,000 to 73,000. So I really hope that with this, this testimony that you can all understand that this GMHI program is extremely needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Uh, and we'll next turn back to Anel Williams. Um, and Anel, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Awesome, thank you. Hi, good evening, distinguished council members of New York City. My name is Anel Williams. I am the program director for Hanek Substance Abuse Outpatient Treatment Program. Our program has been around for at least 28 years, whereas we provide individual services, counseling services, group services, as well as psychotherapy services. As you are aware, mental health and substance use disorder is a really big um, concern, not just in New York City, but it's just all over the world pretty much. But as the start of the pandemic last year, the first quarter, of the pandemic, you had uh, overdose deaths of at least a spike up to 380 deaths. That was just for the first quarter. That's not including from the rest of the year. Whereas if you discuss October, May to October, 2020, you had an increase of low income New Yorkers who experienced the highest rates of poor mental health, reporting symptoms of anxiety and or disorder. 42% of Hispanics and 39% of African Americans reported anxiety and or depression in which 50% to 75% of those numbers mentioned, actually those individuals contact my program, at least four to five phone calls I received requesting substance use disorders, recovery assistance. People maybe, maybe do not understand or maybe might miss the point of the fact that Mental health and substance use disorder coincide with each other. Sometimes it just takes something as simple as someone, a loved one passing away, whereas the individual may not just, they, get, they become depressed or may want to use to um, numb their actual feelings of emotions surrounding just death. Also, as you know, individuals lost their jobs during COVID and that put another strain on individuals uh, mental health as well as substance use disorders increased. Lastly, one of the things I would like to discuss is Keep in mind that you have children that are actually working, learning, um, conducting remote learning, where they are around individual loved ones, parents, grandparents, et cetera, that are suffering from mental health disorders and substance use disorders, which can cause trauma to the children, can cause uh, child abuse. As you see in the recent weeks, you've had domestic violence that have increased and child abuse has increased as well. So it's super important to maintain services and maintain these services surrounding mental health and substance use disorder. It's a much needed, not just for just low income, just overall for the city of New York. As you said, we were the one that was most impacted throughout the entire pandemic. 
And I think that we need to pay attention to our children of the future because they're one, they're gonna be sitting in the seats and they can be traumatized and we don't want them to be traumatized. We want them to be able to speak upon services as well. So I hope I made an impact. I hope that you've listened to me and thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm honored. Thank you very much, Anel. Um, and thank you to this entire panel. I'll now pause briefly if there are any council member questions or comments. Well, I just want to thank all of you for what you're doing for New Yorkers with disabilities and others who need support from us right now more than ever because of the impact of the pandemic on this community, uh, because of the economic shock on this community. And uh, we really support you in your efforts. Uh, and I know you need funding from the city uh, and this is a tough budget year and um, we have to make sure that the people you serve are not harmed by um, budget cuts that would curtail the services that you're providing them. So um, thank you. Thank you for your work and you have my commitment to advocate for you for the funding that your organizations need. Thank you very much, Chair Levine, and thank you to this entire panel. Our next panel will include John Santigar, Marilis Castellanos, Scott Daly, Liz De Imperio, Alice Bufkin, and Christina Alario. John Santigar, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Your time will begin now. John, we can hear you. I'm not sure if you're having issues with unmuting. Okay, we're gonna circle back to John at the end of this panel. Okay, um, we're gonna turn to Marilis Castellanos. So Marilis, you can begin as soon as you're prompted. Your time will begin. Good evening, Chair Lewis, Chair Levine, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Mariluz Castellano, Senior Program Director of Early Childhood Mental Health and Family Wellness at University Settlement. For 135 years, University Settlement has provided holistic community and family programming from pregnancy to our elders across Manhattan and Brooklyn. For our very youngest, University Settlements Butterflies Program provides a continuum of supportive mental health services to children under five, their families, teachers, and childcare staff in our early childhood centers, as well as clinical treatment to families in our community. We are grateful for the Council's Children Under Five Initiative, which supports butterflies. Last year, we received a 15% cut to our funding. This year, we call on the council at minimum to restore the CU5 mental health initiative budget in full, and we urge the council to increase funding to meet the increased need of family and children's mental health services across the city. Through the COVID pandemic, we never stopped offering services, always finding a way to reach the families that we knew needed us. In the fall, our early childhood division moved to a blended in-person and virtual model. Clinicians continue to provide mental health services virtually and one-on-one -on -one consultations to see if families and teaching staff could benefit from additional support. But for so many, access to stable Wi-Fi and working technology remains a challenge and yet another sign of the social inequities that COVID has exposed. So often we hear that children are resilient, but children are not immune from stress and trauma. Our babies and children are much more perceptive than we often give them credit for and certainly absorb and even carry the weight of the anxieties, fear, and sadness of the adults and caregivers around them. Over the last year, our teachers have noticed how our littlest New Yorkers have been impacted by the stress and changes related to the pandemic. Because COVID safety protocols require mask wearing and additional social distancing in classrooms, children are limited to the types of nurturing social interactions they can have with their teachers or peers. Put simply, some of our children have forgotten how to play. At our center in Park Slope, teachers have observed four-year-olds, some of whom have been with our center since they were two, forget how to interact in developmentally appropriate ways. 
Typical behaviors one might expect like cooperative play have been impacted by the collective anxieties and traumas we have all experienced over the past year. We know that COVID-19 will have a lasting impact on all of us, including our youngest. We need more mental health supports in our early childhood centers as our teachers have been bearing the brunt of the emotional work to support themselves, their families, and so many others through this difficult time. We need to increase and continue to support children under five and their families with the appropriate coping strategies to handle this difficult transition and develop creative ways to continue offering virtual programming in the future. To do all of this, we need the city to prioritize and fund CU5 mental health initiative. Thank you for your time and I'll answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we'll next turn to Scott Daly. Scott, you can be in as soon as you're prompted. Starting time. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for sticking around this long. It's been a long day for everybody, council members, council member staff, and fellow CBOs. My name is Scott Daly, and I'm the senior director of the New York Junior Tennis and Learning, NYJTL. We provide free tennis for kids between the ages of five and 18 years of age throughout the five boroughs. You might say to yourself, why am I testifying at the health and mental wellness hearing? Kids have been locked in for too long. We know that they have to get out. We know, we saw it last summer when we were able to open up at numerous locations in the parks late summer. We put in a brand new set of protocols. We've been running since the end of July, but we were allowed up to and including this very day. We've had over 26 programs. We have, we service in a traditional year over 85,000 kids of the city of New York. They're low income, most of them. We spread across the demographics of 25% Asian, 25% Latino, 25% African American. Demographic extends to the 10 years old and younger. They make up two thirds of what we do. We get the kids when, we're, when they're young. We give them a physical activity. Tennis was one of the first programs that was acknowledged to be safe to reopen. And we went after it. And the minute we were able to get a permit, we were out there. The aerobic exercise, the cardio, the coordination on the health end, the psychological effect, the work ethic, the discipline, the sportsmanship, teamwork, I could go on and on, but we all realize the value of sport and what a kid learns. In addition, NYJTL is an outlet for these kids. It's something to relieve the stress and anxiety. We let the kids be kids by going out and play. We have implemented, we follow all state and city rules. We follow the USTA, the industry guidelines. I sat and I met with 25 of my senior staff members and we put together a separate set of protocols. We have extra staff members. Everybody is out there with PPEs. The program can be safely run. I just wanna say thank you to the city council for funding us under the initiative, physical education and fitness. We're seeking $1.2 million, and hopefully we're going to be able to maintain what we've received in the past $800,000. If I don't ask for more, we're not going to get it. If I can get more, we're going to put it on. Costs have gone up across the board. We used to get $1.2. We were cut back in 20, 2008. I'm inspired. Time, minimum wage was $6.50. We have additional staff. We have members there. Continued funding for in the 22 budget will help us meet our vision. Arthur Ashe believed tennis could transform the lives of poor children of color just like him. With your support, we continue to change the lives of thousands of kids in the city of New York. We can't do this without your support. On behalf of all the youngsters, parents, I want to thank you all for your time, attention, and the funding you give us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, and it looks like we've been rejoined by John Santigar. So um, John, when you're ready and the Sergeant cues you, you can begin. Starting time. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Switch to my phone. <clears throat> All right. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is John Suntagar, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at Covenant House New York, where we serve youth experiencing homelessness ages 16 to 24. I want to thank the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, CHNY is the city's largest nonprofit adolescent care agency serving homeless, runaway, and trafficked youth. On a nightly basis, we provide shelter to approximately 300 young people experiencing homelessness. Our youth are primarily people of color, and over a third of them have spent time in the foster care system. Many have experienced abuse or neglect at the hands of parents or other caregivers, and a disproportionately high percentage of our youth struggle with the pervasive impacts of trauma, mental health issues, and substance abuse. We provide young people with food, shelter, clothing, medical care, mental health and substance use services, legal services, high school equivalency classes, and much more. And all of these services help young people overcome the trauma of homelessness and move towards stability. During the past year, I don't think I need to tell anyone, but uh, due to the pandemic, our mental health team has received an increase in reports of depression and anxiety from our young people, and we've seen an increase in reports of substance use. We've worked with young people who have lost jobs and loved ones in the past year and who have reported increased feelings of hopelessness about their future. We've worked with many young people who experienced job loss in March and April of last year, uh, and people are still tr struggling to find jobs. Uh, and just a couple of examples of young people that we've worked with this past year due to COVID-19. Uh, in April of last year, our mental health team worked with a young mother in our mother child shelter program who came to CHNY after the death of her partner who had died from COVID. She was overwhelmed with grief and unsure of how to explain this death to her child. In December of 2020, the mental health team worked with a young person who was struggling with depression and feelings of hopelessness. She identified the loss of in-person school as one of the causes of these feelings and reported that she would schedule to graduate high school in June of 21, but she had stopped attending her remote classes. And just two of these examples are examples, um, we have many, but they speak directly to the need for more funding for comprehensive services for youth experiencing mental health difficulties. And these examples also lie parallel to the concerns expressed earlier today by Council Member Lewis in her request that funding be reallocated to programs that address these issues, as well as their intersections with racial inequity. CHNY is doing everything we can to meet this increased need for mental health services for our young people. However, we cannot do it alone, and we need the city's support to help us fund our mental health services, which includes currently a part-time psychiatrist and a team of social workers. While this programming is partially funded through DOHMH, we have not seen an increase in that funding in several years, despite the fact that we continue to innovate and serve more youth each year. Additionally, we do not receive any city council funding for our mental health care programming. Assistance from the council could go a long way in shoring up additional programming and staffing needs. And we are asking for from the council for $100,000 this I'm expired. Uh, funding cycle for help from the council to fund the critical work of our dedicated mental health team. Infusion of this additional money through the council will not only support the work we currently do, but will also allow us to expand to more youth and support the enhancement of our services. I thank the New York City Council for consideration of this request. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we'll next turn to Liz de Imperio. Liz, you can begin as soon as you're prompted by the sergeant. Starting time. Okay. Thank you so much, Chairpersons Levine and Lewis, um, and all council members for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Liz Dean Perio. I'm the Director of Health Promotions for the American Lung Association in the New York City office. The American Lung Association is the nation's longest standing voluntary public health association with a mission to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. In New York State, over 400,000 children live with asthma, a chronic disease of the lungs that causes wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and coughing. If not well controlled, even under normal circumstances, asthma can greatly limit a person's quality of life and even cause um, death. Asthma is the leading cause of school absenteeism. The burden of asthma in New York remains highest in New York City. According to the New York City Environmental Health Data portal from 2017, 158,000 children ages 0 to 13, or 11.2 percent, have been diagnosed with asthma. Some of the highest burden is found in the Bronx, East and Central Harlem, North and Central Brooklyn, South Jamaica, and Rockaway. 
These numbers, the numbers in these areas reflect almost twice the national average. The Open Airways for Schools program educates and empowers children through a fun and interactive approach to asthma self-management. The program teaches children with asthma ages 8 to 11 how to detect warning signs of asthma, avoid their triggers, make decisions about their health. The curriculum is six 30-minute lessons taught by a school nurse during the school day. OAS is taught in all elementary schools across the five boroughs, and New York City is the leader in school asthma education programs. The OAS curriculum is grounded on the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's evidence-based guidelines for diagnosing and managing asthma. The Lung Association has provided the program in New York City Elementary School since 1996. In that time, we've trained over 3,000 facilitators who have helped 75,000 children with asthma successfully complete the program. The American Lung Association has dedicated staff working in partnership with the New York City Department of Health Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness and the Office of School Health to train and certified OAS facilitators. A vital component of the success of the, pro success of the program is our ability to pro provide the facilitators with program materials needed to teach the curriculum. The school nurses are expected to teach two groups of up to 10 children in each school year. They would not be able to accomplish this without the support that we provide. The partnership has led to, on average, every school year, 3,000 to 3,500 children graduating from, the, from as asthma experts. The funding for this year was cut by 30% from 121,000 to 8718. The funding has remained at 121,875 since 2010. If it's not reinstated, we will be unable to deliver the full day training, including intensive asthma pathophysiology to the nurses and to provide the curriculum material. This will have a direct impact on almost 3,500 children with asthma in New York City. Today, we've heard about the responsibilities of the school nurse have increased to meet the demands of COVID-19. We cannot also expect them to make photocopies of an open airways curriculum that the American Lung Association is prepared to do. The OAS program needs to have the full funding reinstated to continue the critical work of guidelines-based asthma self-management education to the children with asthma in New York City. Asthma, is a key, asthma education is a key priority to the expert panel guidelines for achieving and maintaining asthma control. And so with that, I thank you for your continued commitment to the health of New York City children and for your continued efforts to fund the Open Airways for Schools program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll next turn to Alex Bufkin. Alex, you, uh, Alice, I'm sorry, you can go as soon as you're ready. Starting time. Good evening, my name is Alice Bufkin and I am the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health at Citizens Committee for Children, a multi-issue children's advocacy organization committed to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Um, thank you to the chairs and the committee members for this opportunity to testify today. In the time I have, I want to flag a few key issues impacting the health and mental health of New York's children. I first wanna address the City Council's Health and Human Services initiatives, which received an average of 15 to 20% cut in last year's budget. As you've already heard about repeatedly today, these cuts affected community-based organizations across a broad spectrum of services, ranging from maternal and child health to mental health to services designed to connect New Yorkers to the healthcare safety net. We believe these services are essential to recovery and urge the administration and the city council to fully restore cuts from last year's budget. I also wanna echo so many before me in highlighting the enormous toll this pandemic is having on the mental health of young people. Children have faced a year of loss, illness, economic insecurity, disrupted learning, isolation, and anxiety. Mental health needs are rising, access to care has declined, and the result has been a surge of children in psychiatric distress, hospitalizations, and families left on wait lists, desperate for care. In the face of this, we urge the city to restore cuts to community schools and Sonic. Programs like Sonic and community schools provide children with vital connections to their peers and a wide range of youth and community services, which can help prevent children's behavioral health needs from escalating. Community schools suffered a $3 million loss in last year's adopted budget, and Sonic is looking at an elimination for services for 24,000 children. Additionally, we join many other advocates in urging the city to make significant additional investments for behavioral health in schools, including in direct clinical supports for students, investments in a mental health continuum, and investments in whole school restorative practices. 
In, addi in addition, we join other advocates you've heard from today in urging city leaders to restore and enhance funding for the city's mental health initiatives, which saw a 15% cut in last year's budget. As a result of these cuts, 40% of providers report serving fewer people, 20% had to lay off staff, and 30% had to cut staff hours. Programs like Children Under Five and Mental Health Services for Vulnerable Populations are a bedrock for supporting children and families who've experienced trauma or are in need of mental health services. It's imperative that these funds be protected. In our written testimony, we lay out the amounts we and our partners believe should be restored or enhanced for each of these initiatives. Finally, we urge city leaders to develop a comprehensive plan to address the secondary health impacts of COVID-19 on young people. National data shows a precipitous decline in preventive and primary care rates since a state of emergency was declared, including a 22% decline in vaccinations and a 44% decline in physical, cognitive, and developmental child screening services. During the height of in New York City, there's an 82% decline in early intervention referrals, a 67% decline in evaluations, and a 15% decline in EI services. We urge city leaders to commit additional investments to connect and reconnect children to the preventive and primary care they lost as a result of the pandemic. Our written testimony provides more detailed recommendations. Thank you for your time today, for all your work on behalf of children and families in the, in the city. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And our next panelist will be Christina Ulerio. Christina, you can go as soon as the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Starting time. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you um, for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, I am here talking on behalf of the organization I work for as director of operations, Tech Kids Unlimited. Um, Tech Kids Unlimited is an NYC-based nonprofit organization that teaches computer science thinking and technology skills to neurodiverse youth, teens, and young adults. Our mission is to open up the field of technology to students with disabilities, especially those with autism spectrum disorders, to help them um, become the techies of tomorrow by creating, developing, and sharing the tools of technology in a supportive and nurturing individualized environment, we are working to change the paradigm for education and employment for young people with disabilities. We have programs throughout the year, including after school weekends, holidays, and summer, and serve hundreds of students ages seven to 21 a year throughout all of New York and, serve five, and have served 500 students virtually during the pandemic. We hope to receive funding through the Autism Awareness Initiative, which has had such a large impact on helping people with autism. Our organization exists because young people with ASD are chronically underemployed despite their heightened interest in computers and in STEM fields and the growing need for professionals who specialize in computing. This gap between the potential people with ASD have to contribute meaningfully to society and the difficulty they face attaining opportunities to do so is particularly striking given the large number of people affected by ASD. ASD affects people of all socioeconomic backgrounds. One in 54 children in the U.S. is diagnosed with diagnosed with ASD. Our hope and the hope of the organizations trying to receive funding through the Autism Awareness Initiative is to address the staggering statistic, which has only been exacerbated by the pandemic, provide meaningful programming that will enrich their lives and create opportunities that would otherwise they would have otherwise not had. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Christina. And our next panelist will be James Meager. James, you can testify, uh, begin to your testimony as soon as you're prompted. Great, thank Starting you so time. much. Um, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the health and mental health portions of the preliminary budget. My name is Jimmy Marr and I am policy director at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using an anti-racist lens to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in developing the public positions we hold. Whether we are called on to provide expert testimony at an oversight hearing or to assist a constituent in crisis, we are proud to partner with the city council in a collective effort to make our city safer for all. We look forward to helping you and your staff learn how best to support survivors and connect them to the resources available in your borough and community. Over many years, the city council has been a key supporter of our programs, helping adult, adolescent, and child victims of violence and abuse. City Council funding fills in gaps where no other financial supports exist and allow us to draw down critical dollars from other sources. Moreover, this funding demonstrates the value that you and your colleagues place in helping survivors of all ages access desperately needed shelter, support services, legal assistance, and counseling. Um, my written testimony will be more detailed, but for the sake of time, I'll provide an abridged update on several key initiatives that are funded by the City Council and contact contracted through DOHMH. 
these initiatives, uh, the court involved youth mental health initiative, children under five mental health initiative, and viral hep uh, hepatitis prevention initiative provide critical funding to Safe Horizon that allows us to provide trauma-informed healing, healthcare, and mental health care to our clients and their families. The City Council's Court Involved Youth Mental Health Initiative allows our counseling center to share our unique vision, expertise, and network of services by focusing on the unaddressed trauma that is so often at the root of behaviors that precipitate the involvement in family court um, of children and youth. Um, specifically, um, our project focuses on training providers who work with youth to recognize the signs of trauma, intervene, intervene with traumatized youth who are engaging in attempts at coping that take an extreme form, such as actions or thoughts of harm to self or others. Uh, the City Council's Children Under Five Mental Health Initiative helps support our work with the youngest victims of crime. Without trauma-informed intervention, there may be lifelong developmental consequences. And the City Council's Viral Hepatitis Prevention Initiative helps Safe Rise and Street Work Project increase our capacity to connect potentially hepatitis C affected clients to testing, medical care, treatment, and infection control services. This funding helps increase our capacity to identify youth at risk. Um, although these initiatives are health and mental health focused, they're connected to public safety as well. Um, uh, health and mental health treatment means individual safety and public safety. Trauma healing means individual safety and public safety. Um, and in keeping with that sentiment, we're here to testify as well that the city needs greater and equitable investments in robust trauma-informed health and mental health programming, including for better, um, safer, more just anti-violence responses to health and mental health crises. Uh, we know that the NYPD budgets can, uh, budget continue to grow even as crime rates drop dramatically um, in New York. Um, and that officers were asked to respond to an ever-increasing number of societal fly. issues. Uh, we must invest in crisis response systems that honor and prioritize power sharing, de-escalation, and community. We must invest in systems that emphasize peer response and that include folks with lived experience in their design. And we must invest in systems and response that are trauma-informed and reduce harm. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and that concludes that panel. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you to testify. Otherwise, that concludes the public portion of our, of our hearing. So I'm just gonna wait one moment to see if anyone, we've inadvertently missed anyone. Okay, seeing no one, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Levine, for any concluding remarks. My goodness, what an incredible hearing this has been, thanks to your testimony this final panel closing us so strong. I wanna thank everyone who, who toughed it out over seven hours. Every single bit of testimony is now recorded. The video is publicly available and actually your remarks are transcribed for the record. And if you submit written testimony that enters into the record. So this is an incredibly important document of what I think are smart, compassionate, compelling priorities for our city's health and mental health budget, which require that as we come out of this pandemic, we invest in the communities that have been hit hardest, that we fight cuts at all cost, and that we begin to build for the long haul new systems that will tackle the deep inequality that has been revealed in this pandemic. So I'm just so grateful to everyone who spoke today, who spent these seven hours with us. Uh, I want to thank you, committee council, Sara Liss, for your seven hours. Can we do a, uh, folks who are still here, a virtual applause for Sara, and also um, other committee staff in Balkan, um, as well as our, our co-committee council, Arbani Ahuja, and our finance expert who has been pulling double duty to prep for this hearing, Lauren Hunt. Um, we have such incredible staff. You're lucky as a community of health advocates that you have such good staff in the City Council Health Committee, and um, I'm grateful to them as well. So this is going to conclude our hearing. I think, uh, Madam Committee Council, are we done at this point? Yes, that concludes, and you could call the official time. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I actually read out the time? Is that how this works? At 7.54? We are ready to conclude. Thanks so much. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye.